This is Audible. Blackstone Publishing presents The Breaking by Daniel Green. This book is read by Keith Sarabica. To all the men and women who risk their lives every day so that we may live in relative peace, without them we descend into darkness. Steel, West Virginia A cool wind buffeted him. His body shook, muscles spasming involuntarily. He forced open his crusted eyes. The pale blue sky was outlined by a hundred shades of green, red, and yellow leaves. Former counterterrorism agent Mark Steele blinked slowly. His eyelashes beat away the crust. His head screamed in pain. Gingerly, he shifted his weight to his elbows, the rocks digging into his arms. The dull pain paled compared to the battle raging in his skull. The world spun around him. Dizziness enveloped him, shrouding him inside a fog of pain. He leaned over on his side, dead leaves and gravel crunching under his body as he puked. Each small movement sent shooting pains throughout his muscles, enlightening spasms as if electrodes were strapped to his body. He finished retching and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, trying to remember something. His eyes floated from trees to the roadway, back to the trees. Where am I? Steele eyed his surroundings suspiciously, knowing that they could betray him at any moment. The trees buddied up on one another, crowding the mountain parkway and conspiring to take it over, limb by root. The road itself was in need of serious repair. Divots decorated the asphalt, and it was chipped and broken along the edges. Steele's memory was clouded, like a thick fog had fallen upon him yet wouldn't let go. Faint thoughts danced on the outskirts of his mind. His mind wouldn't relinquish any of the secrets of why or how he found himself in a ditch on the side of a mountain. It was the worst kind of betrayal. It was a betrayal of the soul. It stole all purpose and value from its victim. His mind only allowed him to have crumbling pieces of consciousness that he could feel and touch. He knew it was cold because of his hair standing up on end. His mind was a begrudging enemy of oneself. It's late September. A rough fall crept upon the land a thief stalking his rich summer victim. Where he grew up in Michigan, it was fall. Where he lived in Virginia, it was the end of summer. Here, on this mountain road, it was cold. The wind stung his skin, pricking goosebumps to pop up all over his exposed arms. Where are my clothes? Only a grungy tank top covered his torso and boxer briefs on his lower half. Steele crossed his arms over his chest. His skin was cool to the touch, and his tank top was filthy. He ran his fingers over a small piece of metal that lay on his chest, stuck to his chest hair. It was in the rough shape of a hammer, an old necklace with a long history. He rubbed the metal and felt stickiness in between his fingers. Blood? He lifted his head. No shirt, no pants. Wait, no gun, my duty weapon. Where is my sig? Footsteps padded on the cement. Feet scraped along the gravelly surface, dragging along. Hazy figures in his vision became clear. Small forms grew larger. Despite Steele's throbbing brain, memories came back to him in a mad rush. He groaned as severe pain threatened to split his skull. The world had taken a 180-degree dive for the worse only weeks prior. The government had drawn a 2-7 offsuit and had played everyone like it had a royal flush. The virus had called their bluff— the government failed to halt the unknown disease, and it spread rampantly among the human population. The virus, some sort of variant of monkeypox, killed everyone infected, and in turn brought the dead back to life with only one purpose, to infect and feed on the living. Steele rose a hand to his head. His heart punished his cranium with every beat. His fingertips ran across crusted blood that had dried into his matted-down blonde hair. Ow! He growled. Panic welled inside him as he gingerly felt the long gash that ran across his scalp, starting from his widow's peak to the back of his skull. Oh my God, I am fucked up. How did this happen? He mumbled to himself. His refuge, the Mount Eden Emergency Operations Facility, had fallen under a horde of dead flesh from the District of Columbia. His group had escaped on a Macon Airport mobile lounge west into West Virginia. Appalachian Mountains. Poor Gwen, Mauser, and Joseph. Heavy moaning drew his dazed attention. The calls of the infected were followed by footsteps that grew louder. 
Their footsteps were the sound of bare feet dragging behind broken bodies. He sat upright. The world around him spun faster, causing his stomach to turn like an all-night bender. His head demanded he lay back down, but he forced himself to sit. Concussion. An infected woman walked down the shoulder of the road, stumbling with the slope. The woman, now a monster, had been a relatively good-looking thirty-year-old woman when she was alive. Now pale gray skin stretched over her face, and her hair hung in an unkempt, stringy, damp mess stuck to her neck. Her lips and the skin around her mouth were gone, exposing bloody black gums and teeth. Her ripped, long sleeve shirt revealed a bare breast and stomach, and her jeans were stained and torn. Her stench was horrid, forcing him to retreat backwards on his elbows like a crab. Unable to keep her feet in the rough terrain, she tumbled down the shoulder face first into the ditch. Falling did not stop her, and she ripped off her fingernails as she clawed the rugged gravel, hauling her lifeless body behind her. Her tenacity was an inhuman desire for flesh. His hands grasped desperately for anything to fight the fiend, a stick or a rock to fight with, but dead leaves crinkled in his hopeless hands and turned to dust between his fingers. Ah, she moaned as she clawed through the rock-filled grass. Fuck! He threw a kick at her face. His uncoordinated sock-clad foot slid off the side of her head. Her head turned with his foot, and her teeth chomped viciously near his toes. Get back, he tried to say. His words came out jumbled and thick, like his mouth was full of wool. The weight was there. He hadn't noticed it at first. It was a pressure near his hip. Metal pushed down into his skin as if it tried to brand him. The grating weight of his spring-operated blade was wedged inside the waistband of his boxer briefs. The knife twanged as he ripped it free, the clip releasing its hold on the waistband. He frantically pressed the silver button, and the blade reluctantly slung out. A mere fraction of a second passed in slow motion. Her ruined, dirt-caked hands clawed up his body. The woman's teeth clacked closed, and she opened her mouth wide. With his free hand, he pulled her hair up, his grasp slipping with grease and grime. Her jaw worked, spit flying from mouth, death for him her only desire. Punching his arm out, he thrust the knife into the infected woman's eye. Black blood spurted from her milky white eye and ran down her face like gooey mascara. Her body quivered a bit, then relaxed, all fight gone from her. He pulled his knife free and lay back down, exhausted. His lungs burnt like he sucked in fire instead of air. Heavy-laden footsteps thumped across the pavement. More infected. A pack or more was on their way. They were honed in on his living presence. Gritting his teeth, he willed himself upward, using a nearby white pine to bear his weight. They moaned as they marched past. From his view below the roadway, the heads and shoulders of the infected bobbed unnaturally as they walked. I can't fight. Too many. He moved behind the tree and let the living dead pass. Where are my friends? He waited, and seconds turned to minutes as he tried to hold his breath. Peering from behind his thin tree, he made sure they were gone and stepped up onto the two-laner. He gripped his knife, shoulders hunkering down in a fighting stance. His steps were short and calculated, as if he navigated ice. A big circular bloodstain smeared the center of the two lanes. Before the outbreak, Steele would have thought someone hit a deer, but in the world's current state, he knew someone had died there. Steele looked for the victim, fearing whom he might find. Please let it not be them. Scanning the surroundings warily, the trees shuddered. The wind howled through rocks and branches alike. Trees, blood, and the infected were the only clues he had about his comrades. He bent down shakily, his muscles only working in fits and starts. He ran his bloodied fingers over the stain. Anybody except her. The blood stain streaked to the other side of the concrete. He wobbled upright. Dizziness enveloped him. What is wrong with me? His vision caught something abnormal in the ditch. He rubbed the back of his hand over his eyes, trying to straighten himself out. A bone-white hand stuck out of the ditch, a ghostly hitchhiker, flagging him down for a ride. Steele unsteadily walked his way over to the body. The man wore the Army's standard combat camouflage ACU and was sprawled out face down. A quarter-dollar-sized entrance wound leaked blood, indenting the back of his skull. God damn it, Steele whispered. 
He knelt next to the body and strained as he rolled over the remains of the soldier. The man's head seesawed around, devoid of life. The exit wound had decimated the man's face, leaving him unrecognizable. Steele padded up and down the soldier's torso, looking for anything of value. A bloody name tag was stuck to his breast. Hans, he whispered. Hans, he repeated. He repeated the name in his mind. Each time, nothing rang any bells or sounded any alarms. None of the bits of the dead man was distinguishable. It was as if his brain had exploded outward from his nose. Pieces of bone and flesh hung loosely from his head. Horrific. Grisly. But no other signs of violence were apparent in the former soldier. You were executed, he said to the body. Bonds didn't respond. He lay as motionless as a passed-out drunk. It was possible he had been infected and executed before he turned into the undead. Bonds. 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 The memory floated on the outskirts of his mind. His inability to think mocked him. Then the memory flew into the electric bug zapper of his conscience. Nelson Bonds. The army mechanic they had saved from Mount Eden. Poor bastard. Steele had only known him for a short time. He was still a good kid. Now he's dead because someone put a bullet through his brain in the middle of a goddamn street. Mm. Cut through the trees, riding the wind. He adjusted his grip on his knife. More infected were coming. Gray-skinned, lymph nodes, black with pus, soulless, infected, and impervious to pain. The undead had only one thought in their minds, to devour the living. No fear, no restraint. Steele quickly unlaced Nelson's combat boots. If he could take one thing from the man, it would be his boots. He slipped the boots off his feet. At least I'll be able to run. Rest in peace, kid. Same size, thank you. He dropped to his rear on the ground, only major gross movements available to him, and he shoved his feet inside them. Disheveled bodies crested the road. Time to run. Steele took off at a jog, wishing he had thirty more seconds to lift Nelson's pants and jacket. Ignoring his belly and head that screamed in protest, he wanted to faint. Do not stop. They followed behind him. They weaved through the trees, never resting, never slowing while on his tail. He passed a sign. Durbin, WV-11. He sprinted into the woods, trying to lose the dead trailing behind him. All he could hear in the back of his mind over the pounding of blood was the high-pitched laughter of a woman. Joseph, Mountains of West Virginia The dark sky pressed down upon his small coop. The car's mild yellow headlights were the only light in the dark of the mountain night, the darkness a mass beyond the reach of his high beams, holding all the terrors of his mind and more. He pushed his glasses up on his nose. Cold sweat dotted his skin. His eyes were wide and dried out from staring at the endless road. Rows of trees rolled by, and he waited for someone or something to pop out, confirming all his fears. The villain that cares not that my quest is pure that I have a vehicle that works in a small cache of food? He shrank down a bit further beneath the steering wheel. In the past day, it seemed that men were making a living out of trying to kill him, something that Joseph was having trouble getting used to. I handle the deadliest viruses known to man, and it's a bunch of hillbillies that almost kill me. His mouth twisted as he relived the attack. When the bullets started flying, Joseph had been paralyzed with fear. The true grit of a warrior didn't lie within his genes. The double helices of the ancient phalanx hadn't been passed down through his ancestors. Only the double helix of a scientist. Damn it, he swore. He crushed the steering wheel in his hands, only causing himself discomfort in his thin arms. Nothing happened like it was supposed to. We were only trying to help. Tears welled in the corners of his eyes. It's only frustration, he told himself. He wiped his nose. Steel's dead. They just fucking shot him down. He shook his head angrily, remembering. Who knows what happened to Mauser and Gwen, he said aloud to the empty car interior. I mean, what is the probability that those monsters let them live? Zero, he kept telling himself. I would have saved them if I could have. He didn't have the skills, abilities, or balls to do it. He'd never had balls to take a chance. He snuck a finger beneath his glasses and smeared a tear out of his eye. 
Why couldn't I have stood and fought like the others? If you were worth a damn, you would have done something. The empty seat next to him was enough of a reminder of how alone he actually was. He shook his head, clenching his jaw. The heart of a lion wasn't inside him. Only the ounce of hope that he could come up with something to fight the vicious mutation of a virus that plagued the planet. No, I would have just died. His logic and reasoning hauled him above the waves of despair. Yes, he would have died, but as a man, he muttered to no one. So instead, while his friends lived and died on a mountain road in West Virginia, he had hid in the bushes, shaking with each blast of gunfire. The only thing worse being death by the infected. You are a coward. The bitterly sour taste of fear was left in his mouth as he recalled his crawl away from the gunfire like a sniveling rat. He slammed his fist into the fading leather steering wheel of his coupe. Pain was the only response. How could they expect me to fight? My fight isn't on a battlefield, it's under a microscope, and my subject is across the country in Michigan. But what then? Even if I had patient zero in my back seat, what could I possibly do with him? Talk? How are you today, patient zero? Did you sleep well last night, knowing that you have killed millions? The empty seat said nothing in return. No, no, of course you did. I am sure you slept fine. It's not truly your fault. Say, would you by any chance know the genetic makeup of your viral RNA? Oh, you do? Thanks, pal. You are the best, he said to the empty passenger seat. A figure emerged from the trees, almost as if he were trying to wave Joseph down. He didn't cover his eyes from the bright high beams, an indication of infection. He wore a torn red and black checkered long sleeve shirt, and gore oozed from his mouth. Joseph adjusted the wheel, giving the infected man a wide berth. They were here in the mountains of West Virginia, too. Not as thick as in Virginia, but the infected were mobile, at least as fast as a walking man. A man walking who never took a breath a man driven by the need to infect all others who still lived. It was impossible to tell the origin of the infected person, but he knew if there was one, more would soon be coming. Joseph grabbed up a worn travel atlas, which was resting on the seat next to him. The page was already earmarked to the West Virginia map. He scanned the center of the state. It has to be somewhere in here. Dark green mountains covered the map, circles of elevation getting smaller at the peaks. No road markers... How the hell am I supposed to figure out where I'm going? North and west of here was Michigan. Logic told him that. He tossed the atlas back on the seat, ignoring his tire iron, now his only defense against the dead. He knuckled the steering wheel. Anger bubbled inside him, simmering beneath the surface at his own inaction. It had been around noon when Mauser rolled the airport mobile lounge to a stop. The lounge was a train car that sat upon five-foot-tall tractor tires with a hydraulic system and formerly had been used to transport people from airport tarmacs to the terminals. It was big and high enough that the infected humans couldn't reach the passenger cabin. The people inside the mobile lounge stared out at a semi and a dump truck blocking all but the very center of the mountain highway. Other vehicles dotted the road, abandoned and collecting dust. Steel, come up here and take a look at this, Mauser hollered back. Steele, ever vigilant, was there quickly. He wore a tan tactical vest with a carbine across his chest and had arms that looked like they were forged iron. What's going on? His beard moved as he spoke, making him look like a young King Leonidas. Mauser looked back at him. I don't like the look of these trucks. Seems a little too coincidental out here to have them bottleneck like that. His anchor tattooed hand rested on the steering wheel. Steele's bluish-gray eyes debated the scene, and his brow furrowed. I don't like it. Any way around? Not unless we want to backtrack about fifteen miles the other way, Gwen said from her seat near the front. The blonde ran a finger over a map. Steele's girlfriend was sharp, pretty, and a fighter. Joseph was glad to have her as a friend. And our fuel situation isn't favorable, Steele said. He tapped the gas gauge with a finger. The red needle hovered timidly over a capital red E. No, it isn't. Mauser rested his chin atop his forearm draped on the wheel. Joseph stood behind them, trying to see the obstructions in the road. Movement caught Joseph's eye. Pushing his glasses up from the tip of his nose, he wondered for a moment if he was seeing things. A woman waved her hands over her head in the international symbol for required attention. She stood next to a car with its hood up. Look, somebody's out there. 
Joseph said. Steele and Mauser squinted out. Joseph moved up and pointed. See, right there, it looks like a woman waving her arms. Steele and Mauser gave each other a look and made their weapons ready. I don't like it. We should see if she needs help, Steele said. A gleaming gold shield hung off his chest. The sun glinted off its surface. Agent Steele still thought that he was a lawman. It'd be a trap. Once we get past those two vehicles there, we'll have a hard time reversing if things go south, Mauser said. She could just have car trouble, Joseph said hopefully. Or she could be waiting to put a bullet in us, Steele said. He gave Joseph a sidelong glance, his beard twitching as he thought. He stood a good three inches taller than Joseph, and his long, dark blonde beard was speckled with flecks of brown and even a gray hair or two. Mauser gave Joseph a dismissive look coated in violence from the driver's seat. Joseph was scared of the agent. He looked menacing with all his tattoos covering his shoulders down to his wrists, engines, anchors, an eight ball, flames, and a star on his elbow. His M4 carbine sat casually in the driver's compartment next to him, as if he were an old western coach driver on the Pony Express. Mauser, like Steele, had also played a role in saving Joseph's life, and it seemed he wouldn't forgive Joseph for the deaths of his teammates. He saw it in the man's eyes. You killed them, Mauser's thundercloud-colored eyes said. Joseph held that guilt in. The deaths of the other agents stung him, not in the same way, but watching Jarl's final moments made his heart hurt. How many people will die for me to live so I can try to save the world? What if I fail and it was all in vain? But he also drew inspiration from their sacrifice. Jarl had fought to his last breath knowing he would lose, and so must I. Joseph wanted to spit, and look where it got him. Jarl's no more than stinking meat and infected bellies. Forward, Steele said to Mauser. Mauser nodded, and under Steele's direction they navigated through the stalled vehicles, the mobile lounge narrowly finding clearance between the two large vehicles, like Odysseus through Scylla and Charybdis. Nice and easy, lunchbox, Mauser said, egging the mobile lounge along. He stuck his head out the window as they drew near the angled vehicles. The lounge inched and rocked. How are we looking, Mauser? Steele said. Got about a tick's dick on this side. He squeezed the mobile lounge through the gap. Joseph gazed at the vehicles. They seemed to close the gap in behind the lounge. Joseph rubbed his eyes. Well, looky here, Steele said. Joseph looked ahead at the woman in distress. I think she likes you, Steele teased. She leaned against the car with the hood up. Her blue tank top was dirty and her jeans were torn. She wiped strands of shoulder-length dishwater blonde hair back behind her ear impatiently as she waited. I wouldn't jump to conclusions, Agent Steele. <laughs> Jesus, you got to loosen up. He turned to the rest of the group. I need Mauser to stay with the vehicle. Ahmed. He dismissed the women in the group. Clouds darkened in Gwen's eyes. Steele rose his eyebrows at the Middle Eastern member of their crew. The two did not like each other. Ahmed leaned back in his seat, silent. I'll go, Joseph piped up. No can do, Doc. You are much too valuable. He turned back to Ahmed, expecting a response. Let me go with you. I'm a doctor. Joseph crossed his arms over his chest. Steele shook his head no, a terse maneuver controlled by the muscle in his neck. You said yourself you aren't that kind of doctor. Joseph pushed his glasses up his nose. That's correct. I'm a virologist, but I know enough to be of use if there is a medical situation. The man weighed his words and exchanged a look with Mauser. Mauser shrugged his shoulders. If he wants to go, I say let him, Mauser said. Steele slapped Joseph on the back and grinned through his bushy beard. She must have really made an impression on you. Besides, you spotted her. No good deed goes unpunished. He flipped a switch on the door and punched open the folding glass doors. Probably a good idea to stay close, Steele said to Joseph. He shouldered his carbine and slung down a rope ladder. He pulled on the ladder, ensuring it was secure. Gwen stopped them before they could climb down. They had told Joseph that Steele had fought through a horde of the walking dead to reach her, and Joseph knew why. A woman worth fighting for. Be careful. She straightened Steele's tactical harness a bit. I don't like the looks of her, she said, gazing up at him. Why's that? 
Don't want to make new friends? Called a woman's intuition. She squeezed his arm. Everything will be fine. We'll make sure she's okay and leave, Steele said. She gave him a look that said he'd better be right. He turned away and moved to the ladder. Steele went ahead of Joseph down the rope ladder. They walked together, Steele's feet moving in sync with slow, calculated steps as if he was a boot-clad dancer. He held his black AR-15 in the low ready, eyes scrutinizing the surrounding mountain forest. The closer they got to the woman, the more hairs on Joseph's neck stood up one by one. The forest went silent. Even the chill mountain breeze through the trees settled down. Steele stuck an arm out, stopping Joseph. Let me stay in front, Steele said with a wink. He checked the corners around the car while the woman, in her twenties, gushed at them. Oh, Lord, thanks be God that these brave men found me when they did, she called out. Her Appalachian accent was thick. She grinned, showing yellowish teeth, and wrapped her arms around steel. A perplexed look crossed his face, and he shrugged his shoulders gently, creating space between them. Okay there. She clasped her hands together. Please be pray. Steele gave Joseph a look. What seems to be the problem? Steele asked. Joseph crossed his arms. She sat down in the driver's side seat, door open and crossed her legs. She sparked up a cigarette with a flick of her lighter. I've been hearing all sorts of craziness in the cities. It'd be scary on your own, she said. Steele took a step back from her. What seems to be the problem, Miz? Steele said. Miz, she tittered. Miz, oh, Neil, you big bag of muscles. She gave him a playful wave. And you see, there is something wrong with my car here, she said, gesturing at the engine. I think I'm out of gas, but I just don't know. She exhaled cigarette smoke from the side of her mouth. Are you alone? Steele asked, looking inside a nearby car. Alone as alone can be. A couple of my girls and I are about five miles down the road in a cabin, Wait until this thing blows on by. I was out searching for some food, so if we get this car going, you guys are more than welcome to spend the night. She giggled at the word night. Joseph's jaw dropped a bit. She took a long drag from her cigarette. Her foot bounced up and down. Was she propositioning sex for assistance, or just a good time? I guess there is a first time for everything. The idea made him uncomfortable. She let smoke exhale through her slightly open mouth. She smiled a bit as she blew smoke down her breasts. Joseph found himself staring. After a moment, he looked at Steele, who appeared amused. Well, at least he's enjoying himself. We could sure use some big, strong men to keep us company, at least not so lonely, she said, bending low to show some cleavage through her loose, low-cut tank top. Normally, Joseph would look away, but he didn't. I'm a doctor. Joseph mumbled. She glanced his way. We could use a doctor. Her last statement confused Joseph. Steele gave a backward glance toward the mobile lounge. It sat rumbling on idle. From behind the windshield, Mauser raised his hands in the air, unsure, and Gwen stood next to him, arms crossed, clearly unamused by the interaction from afar. Steele turned back. Joseph nervously shifted the weight of his body from leg to leg. So... How's about it, boys? Will you help this little damsel in distress? She cooed. Her eyelashes batted together. Steele gave her another look and nodded. Okay, just give me... He was silenced mid-sentence. A loud crack of a rifle bellowed from the trees. Warm wetness sprayed across Joseph's face, and Steele's body dropped like a sack of potatoes, clanking into a heap of tactical gear. The gunshot continued to reverberate from mountain to mountain. Joseph's legs carried him into the woods, fear pushing his body into a sprint. Those horrible memories were etched in his mind, never to be forgotten. The gunshot, Steele's head rocketing backward, his blood on Joseph's face. The thoughts consumed him as he drove his car through the winding back roads of West Virginia. The loss of his friends weighed heavily upon the lonely doctor's soul. Gwen Mountains of West Virginia Gwen struggled awake from a nightmare only to find her arms were pinned behind her back. Opening her eyes, she found the darkness was real. Her hands fumbled behind her. She was tightly bound with thick, coarse rope. 
Thin threads of stiff, frayed twine stuck into her skin, and the knot was heavy. She moaned in frustration through an old rag stuffed in her mouth. The rag, covered with metallic machine oil, stung her tongue. Her stomach burnt, trying to keep its contents in. There was no light except for that seeping in through a fine crack that pierced the door and the quarter inch beneath the frame. A cellar? A high-pitched chirping came from outside. She strained her ears, trying to hear over the wailing of the baby. The twitter was cheerful and gay, mocking her imprisonment. It has to be a bird. The outside was close. Someone sobbed nearby, muffled by her gag. All they do is cry. Her fingers scratched the ground behind her, searching for anything she could use to saw the rope. Instead, her fingers wrapped around a thin, worn piece of paper. She pressed her filthy fingers together, gripping the rolled-up document, the only solace she had. An earthy smell prevailed over anything else. That and piss. No one had let them out to pee, so they had gone where they sat and lay. The slumped, defeated figures around her were the other women. Escape was the only option from this awful place. Escape before they came back again. She frantically worked her wrists together, trying to wriggle them free. But she was only rewarded with the stickiness of blood flowing onto her hands. Frustrated and exhausted, her shoulder muscles cramping, she stopped. Lindsay stared at her from across the small confines, her eyes wide, her brown, snarled hair outlining her face. Gwen remembered meeting her at the Dunloring Metro stop just outside D.C. after the outbreak struck. She looked worse now. Her eyes and skin had the wear of a woman ten years older than she was. Next to her sat a smaller woman with her head hung low. Lucia. She had barely escaped Mount Eden with them. Her husband was dead or gone. Lucia's hands were bound in front of her, and she held tightly to her baby, Maria. She cooed to the baby, but nothing seemed to help the baby's wails. Mama cried and cried, little lungs piercing the air, begging for something to eat. Gwen watched the woman rocking with her child. Gwen's maternal instinct screamed with them. How could anyone do this to us? How could people lack any sort of empathy for a baby? Rough shouts seemed to answer her. Loud, jovial shouts of drunken men. No, not them again. Lucia, she mumbled through her gag. Shh. She tried. Please be quiet. Please be quiet or they will come in again. Mi niña tiene hambre, Lucia murmured. Her eyes teared up, pleading with Gwen for help. They begged Gwen to do something, anything. Please keep her quiet. Gwen tried to say, but instead everything came out as an incoherent slur. Metal jangled on the door. They're here. Gwen's swollen cheek was a reminder of the last time their captors came into their prison. That was when they took their clothes and watched them change into tattered, dirty lingerie in some perverted male fantasy. The shed door imploded inward. A narrow shadow took shape in the light. No, not the slender man. Lindsay started bawling. Her whole body shook as she sobbed. Gwen yelled through her horrible, bitter gag. The thin shadow glided inside. Ladies, ladies, what is the problem? He wagged his head from side to side, disapproving of their behavior. His scrawny frame was clad in the same cut-off T-shirt and filthy overalls he always wore. He glanced over at Gwen as if she were to blame. His eyes ran over her skin. A smile crept over his features as he gazed at her thinly covered breasts. The smile faded as Lucia's baby continued to scream with every quivering breath she had. You made me come all the way over here because this Mexican dog can't keep her mangy pup quiet? He marched over to Lucia, who shied away, doing her best to shield her baby with her body and arms. Maria screamed bloody murder. He swatted Lucia in the back of the head like a bad dog. She yelped, terrified of the man. Can't you understand me? I speak American to you. Jesus, I feel like I'm living in a goddamn foreign country. He stepped back and forth in the middle of the shed, hands stroking his chin. Now, what am I to do with you? He said. Por favor, no entiendo. Lucia whimpered, damp eyes imploring to be understood. The fuck did you say? Slenderman stuck a boot into her side. Lucia cried out. Maria continued her nonverbal barrage in everyone's eardrums. Casey! A voice came from outside. 
Puck says to shut that baby up. It's drawing him in. Casey crouched down in front of Lucia. He gripped her jaw in between his fingers. Shut it up, he growled into her face. Maria didn't care about what he said. She only had tears for him. He stood upright, contemplating his next move. Puck is pissed. Make it stop, the voice yelled. I heard you, dick, Casey said over his shoulder. He scowled down at Lucia. Give it over, he said finally, grabbing at Maria. Lucia dodged him, clinging to her child. I said, give it over, he shouted, grabbing Lucia by the hair. She shrieked as Casey ripped her child from her. She dove for his leg, wrapping tiny bound hands around his ankle. Por favor, mi bebe, she called out. Casey shook her off and kicked her in the stomach. Lucia tried to suck in air. She curled up in a ball. Shh, you be quiet now, he cooed at the baby, bouncing it. He put his pinky near its mouth, and Maria greedily latched on. You don't even know what to do with the baby, some mother you are, he said with a vengeful look at Lucia, who wept on the floor. Gwen's blood boiled. These pieces of trash had ambushed them and now treated them worse than animals. I must do something. She stood on weak legs, hands bound behind her back. Put that baby down, you bastard. She tried to look tough, puffing her chest out a bit. Now, what do we have here? A brave little missy, aren't we? He smiled like the devil. She held the paper in her hands behind her back, crushing it between her fingers for strength. He rotated the baby in his arms as if to challenge her. Maria started bawling again. Casey gave Maria a nasty look. Look at what you've done. I've just got this thing. He stopped as Gwen lunged at him, throwing a knee at his groin. Moments later, she awoke in the dirt, eyes smarting and her head foggy. Stupid bitch, that'll serve you. Casey sneered, pulling Maria loosely in the crook of his arm. He put a work boot into her stomach, and the wind was driven from her lungs. Lucia cried out, hands reaching for her child. You'd shut your mouth if you knew what was good for you. Casey slammed the door, disappearing with the baby. Dios mío, ayúdame. Lucia sobbed. Lucia cried out the same phrase for hours until it turned into a mere whimper. Mi Maria, mi Maria. Hours later, Casey returned with a fat man and others. They filed in, laughing and carousing with one another as they passed around an unlabeled bottle. The men, who could only be described as hillbilly trash, took turns raping Lucia on the mud floor while Gwen and the other woman were forced to watch in horror. Gwen tried to scream, yell, and curse the monsters, and all she got for her trouble was the back of a hand, a pinprick of pain compared to Lucia's torture. When Casey was finished, he sat down next to Gwen, holding a six-inch-long hunting knife casually in his hand. Ooh, that was fun, huh? He exhaled a deep breath. Glancing at her sideways, he gave her a half-grin filled with stained brown teeth. That could have been you, sweetheart, he whispered. He ran a hand through his dirty hair that was held in place only by grease, letting his hand fall on her knee. His hand became a poisonous snake slithering up her thigh. I wanted to believe me, I did. Those legs, that ass. His hand stopped but his eyes confirmed what he said. But the big guy wants you untouched, so I guess she'll have to do. She turned away from him in revulsion. Got the long face. He pushed her head away playfully with his free hand and laughed. Who knows? Maybe he won't like you. Then we'll get our chance. He gripped her thigh, fingertips pressing painfully into the meat of her leg. Then he stood up, stretched, and walked outside latching the door behind him. The clank of chains on wood sounded out as he locked them in. An emptiness filled the room, an eerie quiet only punctuated by the sobs of the prisoners. Lucia lay in the dirt, eyes staring vacantly at nothing. She looked dead. Gwen knew that she was probably in shock and had internal injuries, made all the worse because Lucia's child was most likely dead too. Lindsay squeezed her eyes closed and cried. Gwyn tipped herself over and shouldered her way across the mud to be close to the other women. They huddled around Lucia, 
using each other's body heat for warmth. Gwen closed her eyes, salty tears running down her face. Her fingers ran over the photograph, trying to feel the place in time. It was the farthest place from here. The cold, glossy finish only made her heart sink lower. How could things have gone so wrong? Steel, Wilderness of West Virginia The land was damp under the canopy of trees, a coolness trapped between greenish leaves above and wet earth below. Green ferns and brown dead leaves were the only living things that thrived along the forest floor. Near a soft-needled pine, he stopped his pained progress. Leaning on its trunk for support, he surveyed the area. Folding his arms across his chest, he hugged himself, trying to retain what little body heat he had left. He pushed down the constant ache inside his skull. Must keep moving. Must find shelter. The land seemed to be a never-ending loop of itself. Round pillars of wood worshipped the sky as far as he could see in either direction. Branchy arms decorated by leaves and needles hid steel from any warmth from the distant sun. The ground curved upward, making it appear that he was surrounded by mountains. Below him, down a gradual decline, the trees dipped in close to the road as if they wanted to reclaim their lost land. He followed the road from a distance, keeping it close enough to know it was there, but far enough away to avoid discovery from anyone watching it or infected wandering upon it. He didn't know the terrain well enough to veer far from it. Glimpses of asphalt beckoned him, but the dead repulsed him, forcing him to follow in the trees. Keeping the road on his left, he mindlessly walked. Keep moving. He used trees to help himself along. Don't stop. As a wounded animal, he saw the threat in everything. See, don't look. He found it impossible to track his progress, minutes turning to hours and hours to minutes. He didn't know if he'd been out there for days or an hour. He racked his brain as he trudged, trying to pull some sort of explanation of his present situation from the depths of his memory. They left Nelson untouched, but I was stripped. Steele's feet would have been chewed up into a bloody mess without the boots, cut, torn, and bruised by the underbrush, twigs, and rocks from the terrain. He would never have been able to run quickly through the uneven land without them. Maybe someone was watching out for him. He took a cautious glance upward at a dusky sky through the leaves. The trees were in the beginning stages of changing colors here, and when they did, they would turn beautiful shades of red, yellow, orange, and brown over the next month. As a young man, he always loved seeing the forest turn in the fall. The season had always been special to him. His birthday was in the fall, football season was in the fall, and his family would always build fires in their family cabin, the warm, smoky scent filling the air. The thought of fire did nothing to warm him. It only left him with a deep sadness. All those things were gone now. No birthdays, no football, no family. You are alone. He took a deep breath, trying to calm himself. Why have I lived when so many others have perished? Do I even deserve to live? Better not question why you are here. There is a plan, but you may not know it yet. Hopefully. Let's not tempt the gods, huh, Jarl? He said to the ghost of his sacrificial friend. He drove the ghosts from his mind with a farewell. One day we will meet again, brother. Uncountable chilled hours faded away beneath the sun until it began its gradual downward arc, and the temperature tumbled swiftly behind it. I must find shelter. His blood-soaked tank top, along with his boxer briefs, were no match against the plummeting temperatures. He rubbed his arms as he walked, trying to gain warmth in his limbs through friction. Prospects were grim. With every passing minute, his survivability went down with the temperature. Any survival guru would say the same thing. Shelter was a necessity. Not only did he need shelter against the cold, he needed shelter against the dead. Grimacing, he looked down at himself and let out a bitter laugh. I am the dead. Stripped down to his underwear, his head bloody, wandering the forest. Even if he found someone friendly, they would probably try and put a bullet in his head, thinking they were doing him a favor. As he plodded onward, all he could think was how he wished it was summer. A hot, steamy summer. But the summer also meant mosquitoes. Damn it all. But maybe I should be grateful there are no mosquitoes. What if the virus was spread by mosquitoes like malaria? 
six one way, a half dozen the other. He continued his mental anguish as he lumbered forward. He tried to recall what had happened. They had been riding in the McCone Mobile Lounge. They'd stopped for some reason, but everything after that was a blur. Everyone was there. Gwen, Mauser, Joseph, Eddie, and Lucia with her baby, and the now deceased Nelson. Someone put a bullet in Nelson's head. Why? His brain throbbed as he remembered. Joseph had been there. The skinny doctor with glasses had glanced nervously around, but no memory followed that. Steele's ears picked up the sound of the forest floor rustling. His heart rate spiked up and his head spun. Buddying up behind a tree, he steadied himself. The world leveled out around him. It sounded like he had walked into a nest of squirrels. From around the tree, he peered out and looked hard. He let his vision focus on movement in an attempt to locate the thing that clearly did not care if it was found. Near the edge of the road, inside the forest, over twenty infected crouched around something on the ground. On their knees, the infected humans ripped and tore at their food like a pack of ravenous wolves. Could it be one of my friends? Could it be Gwen? He wanted to be sick again. Steele watched them for a minute, studying their feeding behavior. As one, they crowded around the corpse. They ripped and pulled whatever they could reach. There was no hierarchy to their feeding like other pack animals, such as wolves or lions, who had an alpha that ate first. No tact. Only the singular need to consume. Best to keep moving before they start looking for more. He gingerly ran a hand across the top of his head. An indentation ran along his scalp like God himself had taken a divine pencil to his skull in an attempt to redraw him. It reminded him that someone knew what had happened to him. This was no mistake. As silently as he could, he moved away from them, heading farther up the forest road. Another hour of hiking, the sun crested the nearest mountain peak. Nighttime is coming. Do or die time. Steele's teeth chattered. His hands were a pale shade of blue. This is bad. He contemplated climbing a tree to sleep for the night. Fuck, it's cold out here. I'm going to freeze to death. I survived the outbreak of the deadliest virus known to man only to freeze to death in the fucking woods. If his luck got any better, he would probably wake up looking down at a pack of infected waiting patiently for him to climb down, starving and weak. A grisly end, indeed. He flicked open his spring-loaded knife. His frozen hand curled around the handle involuntarily. No easy meals. Shadows grew into dusk, and darkness rapidly overtook him. He found himself willing his feet one over the other. One, two. One, two. One, two. When? Where are you? He called out. Coughing, he could hardly pick up his feet. His feet weren't even there. They were numb and cold like he walked on a bed of ice nails. A woman in white appeared ahead through the trees. He stopped, staring at her. He rubbed his eyes. Her hair shone gold. The curve of her body was hazy in the night. She almost glowed in the dark. Gwen! <coughs> he coughed. Wait! He reached a hand for her. She turned and smiled. An angel. She looked through him, though. He was of minor concern in her divine eyes. Gliding away, she floated into the night. He ran after her, but she was faster, and he fell behind. Moments later, she stopped, bringing a finger to her ghostly lips. Her white dress flickered and disappeared, leaving him alone again. Wait! He mumbled, voice croaking in dehydration. He stopped, half standing, half bending over. His muscles teetered on the edge of collapse. This is as good a spot as any. Quit. You've gone far enough. He wobbled and fell to the ground. Exhaustion had won. He couldn't go on. Get up, you fool. He crawled up onto his hands and knees. The ground felt funny beneath his fingertips. Packed tight earth. Odd. Trees had been cleared away. A dirt road stretched below him. The path ran perpendicular to the two-lane road he was following. Grass sprouted up in the middle of two tracks. The path was used with some regularity. Something deep within him pulled him upright. Too cold to care, he followed the dirt driveway. If it led him to a horde of infected, at least a fight would warm him up. Brazenly, he walked down the middle. A quarter mile down the path he stopped, a smile creeping over his cracked lips. A small house sat in the dark. 
No lights illuminated the night. No infected wandered nearby. The place looked abandoned, and Steele had never seen a finer sight. Gwen, Moonshiner Camp, West Virginia The unwashed women stank. The shed itself smelled worse. A combination of bodily fluids mixed together with mud created the overall odor of a swamp. Gwen had grown used to putrid smells, finding it impossible to get away from. She nestled in closer to Lindsay, holding her shoulder over hers. They were all wedged against the wall, away from the middle of the shed, where it was less muddy. Lindsay stirred, adjusting her arms. The woman would shake herself awake crying, and Gwen would soothe her until she fell back asleep. Gwen lay there exhausted, but her mind stood in the way. Not that she wanted to sleep. When she slept, she dreamt only of horrid things. Blood. The shrill sound of bullets screaming past. People shrieking. The dead. When she was awake, she couldn't escape the nightmares either, as her mind replayed the traumatic events over and over. They had shot Mark from the bushes. It happened in a blink of an eye. One second he was standing, the next he had collapsed on the ground. A second later, the mobile lounge's front windows exploded, a million shards of sparkling glass covering them. Her breath was forced from her body as Mauser's shoulder drove into her. She hit the ground with a whomp as he landed on top of her. His weight protected her body, elbows shielding their faces as glass continued to rain down on them. She rolled onto her elbows and crawled down the blood-stained aisle to the rear. The mobile lounge had a driver's compartment on either side like a tiller fire truck, except it faced the other direction, allowing the driver to navigate from either the front or back. If Mauser could reach the other driving compartment, maybe they had a chance to escape. Glass dug into her arms and knees like tiny knives. They sliced open her clothes and cut her skin. Bullets tinged and ricocheted off the metal sides, making it sound like they hid in a tin can. Mauser bowled her forward and shoved her bottom with his free arm. We gotta move! We gotta move! He kept yelling over the din. She stopped halfway and grabbed one of her packs. No time! Mauser shouted at her. What about Mark? She cried out. She turned back to get a better look at Mauser. He's fine. Keep moving. He pushed her further ahead, self-preservation driving them. Gwen knew Mauser had just lied through his teeth, but took him at his word anyway. When they reached the back of the mobile lounge, the others had already congregated. Ahmed knelt down, ducking his head as rounds whizzed over him. Lindsay had her arms around Lucia. Both women were terrified. Gwen leaned back on a seat, hands covering her ears. Mauser sat low in the mobile lounge's swivel driver's seat, messing with the steering wheel. Cars that were stalled now roared to life and blocked their only escape. They were penned in. We've got to fight our way out, Mauser yelled, bringing his carbine to his shoulder. He pushed open the folding back doors and fired a few rounds into a man in camouflage running for them. The man collapsed and didn't get up. Make for the woods, it's our only shot, Mauser said. A man emerged from the timber and Mauser tracked him with his carbine. Pop, pop. He went down, holding his leg. Mauser flinched as a bullet thudded into the door frame next to him, bending the metal. Now! He screamed. Gwen crawled to the edge of the vehicle and, using the ledge, hung for a moment before she jumped down. She landed in a crouch. Gunfire boomed from the woods. She shouldered her pack and looked up, seeing Lucia stare at her with Maria in her arms. Give me the baby, Gwen shouted. She waved at Lucia to drop the child. Fear etched Lucia's face, indecision consuming her. Drop her, I'll catch her, Gwen screamed. Lucia bent down, tentatively releasing the vulnerable small human into Gwen's waiting arms. Catching the child like the most fragile punt return, Gwen sprinted for the trees. More men pointed guns at the mover, using cars and trees as cover. She ducked behind a big maple, shushing the baby. Pudgy tan cheeks shook as the baby wailed in fright, her dark eyes squinting while she cried. Gwen watched in suspense as Ahmed helped the others down. Run! Ahmed yelled. Each survivor took their turn at making a break for the forest. Shh! Gwen said to the squalling babe. She bounced the child in her arms and searched for somewhere safer to hide. She poked her head out from behind the tree. Her vision tunneled with fear. Be quiet, Maria, she whispered. The baby stopped crying for a moment and gazed up at Gwen, the babe mesmerized by Gwen's voice. That's a good girl, Gwen said. 
A brief smile crossed her shaking lips. A skinny arm wrapped around Gwen's neck, and the cold steel of a handgun pressed against the side of her head. Hello, precious, a woman said behind her. Rough men encircled them, shotguns, carbines, and hunting rifles all pointed in their direction. The survivors were driven into a small group in the center. Ahmed and Nelson's hands were up. Mauser was the only one in a standoff with the ambushers. Gwen was driven forward with a gun to her head. Drop the gun, city born, she won't die, the voice behind her shouted. Mauser squinted at them and took turns aiming his gun from person to person. A standoff with no way out. Don't be dumb, boy, shouted one of the ambushers. Mauser finished his rotation of targets and lowered his carbine. He let the weapon point upright and rose a free hand. It was either that or he turned into minced meat. He made eye contact with Gwen. All right, all right, you got us, he said, tossing down his M4. The woman laughed. Of course we do, sweetie pie. She shoved Gwen in the back and reunited her with her friends. Round him up, fellas. The mountain folk stripped every one of their weapons and tied and bound the survivors. Gwen rocked on the ground and screamed at them in agony as they stripped Mark of all his possessions. Weapons, ammo, vest, clothes, even his boots, pushing and pulling at him like a pack of dogs while he laid there, limp as a rag doll. His eyes rolled lifelessly into the back of his head, only the white showing. A fat man in a t-shirt that was too small for him ripped Mark's badge from his neck. Mark's head tumbled to the side and lay still. Look what I got, boys. Looks like we bagged ourselves a c counter, the man stammered, trying to read the badge. A thinner man with a light beer ball cap and a filthy mustache snatched the badge from him. Give me that. It says here, retard, that he is a count -er counter-terrorism division, the thin man said. What's the division? the fat man asked. He scratched his head with dirty fingers. I don't know, the opposite of multiplication, you idiot. It's a badge. He's a fucking cop, Chuck. He turned to another ambusher. The only good pig is a dead pig, right, Henry? The thin man said, kicking Mark with a tan boot. He sneered at his fat friend. Stupid cops. Give it back, Casey. I found it. It's mine, fat Chuck said, grasping for the badge. Casey held it out of his reach and threw the badge back to him. Never heard of him anyway. Two gunshots rang out in the forest. Bunch of devil spawn coming this way, called out another man in Hunter's camouflage. Get our new friends into the cars. Bobby, hop up in the mover. Puck is going to be real pleased with this take. They were herded into the back of a smelly minivan. Bloodstains soiled the off-blue seats. Casey pushed Nelson in the back. Steele's 40 Sig P226 pointed at the soldier's spine. Hey, Ash. We got one too many prisoners from the van. What do you want to do? Ash shrugged her shoulders. Eh, hey, shoot that army guy. You know they're always trouble. Nineteen-year-old Private Nelson Bonds grimly eyed Casey. Casey pointed Steele's handgun at Nelson. Tears formed in the corners of Nelson's eyes. One fell down his smooth cheek, but he looked defiantly ahead. Turn away, soldier boy, Casey said. Nelson held his gaze. I said, turn away. Nelson refused his command. Are you some kind of stupid? Casey put the gun to Nelson's forehead. <laughs> Look how dumb he is. Fat Chuck giggled, jowls trembling. Nelson looked at him. I'm Private First Class Nelson Bonds. I'm a soldier of the United States Army. I'm sworn to protect this nation from enemies both foreign and domestic. With a disgusted look, Casey moved around behind Nelson, leveling the gun with the back of his skull. His thumb drew back the hammer on his gun. That's cute. Sounds like somebody who really loves their country. But do you love your country, boy? Casey mocked. Nelson was quiet. Casey punched Nelson's back with the gun. Nelson flinched, more fear than force scaring him. I said, who loves their country? Casey screeched, spittle flying. I love my country. Nelson croaked, his voice breaking at the end. His eyes darted back and forth, pleading for someone, anyone, to do something. The forest was quiet in its complacency. 
How many times do we have to go over this? Which country do you love? Nelson's mouth shook. Stop! Gwen screamed from the back of the van. Nelson's eyes skipped her way. Fear oozed with every blink. You would shut your mouth if you knew it was good for you, Ashley said. She slapped Gwen in the mouth. Which country do you love, Private? Casey asked. I love America. You love America what? Is that the proper way to speak to your superiors? I'll tell you something, the military just ain't what it used to be. I love America, sir, Nelson said. His voice was soft. Casey looked impatient. I didn't hear you again. I love America, sir, Nelson said louder. I still can't hear you, Casey said. He swept a hand back and cupped his ear. I love America, sir, Nelson screamed. Thank you. Now, why is it so hard to get people to say they love their country nowadays? <laughs> Casey laughed. He looked back at the van and shook his head in disbelief. A fraction of a second passed, and with a quick move of his arm, the gun was back at Nelson's head. Boom! Nelson's brains burst through his nose into the ditch. Another casualty of the end time. Gwen relived the same scene every night, where Mark's head kicked backward and he fell lifelessly onto the pavement. Her mind played it on repeat like a scratch CD. Every night she awoke in terror. She rested her head on Lindsay's shoulder. They hadn't done anything to deserve this. All they had done was try to help someone. The sun rises on good and evil alike. She lifted her head a touch as the shed door creaked open a bit. A gnarled old hand wrapped around the wood and pushed it open. It creaked. A slightly warped figure crept inside. Gwen could smell him as he got close. The thick body odor of someone who hadn't bathed in weeks. It was almost pleasant compared to the filth surrounding her. As he inched nearer Gwen, she feared he was infected. But she had a brief moment of relief when she smelled the alcohol on his breath. She vaguely recognized the man as one of the bushwhackers. He was older probably in his seventies. He wore overalls and a wide-brimmed hat. His mouth puckered permanently inward because he had no teeth. He reached an old arthritic hand for her and she tried to scoot backward. She sat upright, awakening the others. Her back pressed firmly against the wall. He wheezed a breathy laugh. But <laughs> it says, old Bartle won't ever get himself no cunny. But look at what we have here. Firm tits on this one. Yes, she do. <laughs> he coughed a bit and twisted her nipple hard. Ow! She breathed, revolted by the unwanted stimulus. There we go, he said. His rancid hot breath smelled like stale fish and whiskey. Gwen turned away. She wanted to be anywhere but here. Her body knew it. She would rather face legions of the dead than this. Let's see what some of them panties of yours, he said. He licked his lips. An old sandpapery hand grabbed for her underwear. With a loud bang, the flimsy wood door flew all the way open, and Ash stepped in. Get away from her, Barnum, you old pervert. What did I tell you about touching the pretty one? That is Puck's old girl. You get on out of here, Ash said. She swatted at the old fiend as if he were a bad dog, and the old man left, muttering to himself. Ash squatted down in front of Gwen. Gwen couldn't contain her tears. They streamed down her face. She tried to say thank you over and over to the woman who had saved her. Ash bent down close to Gwen, an ugly smirk settling on her pretty face. She swept dirty, snarled hair behind her ears, judging Gwen with her eyes. Gwen was beginning to feel that Ash hadn't done her a favor at all. Ash gave her a crooked toothed smile and wiped Gwen's tears away. There, there, pretty birdie. No one's gonna hurt you. Gwen nodded thanks to her gag. Ash laughed loudly with a shrill, high-pitched note. I mean, no one except Puck. His last girl didn't make it through the week. He dresses them all pretty, makes them feel safe, and then rips them up real good. Her eyebrows rose as she saw the fear in Gwen's eyes. Then when they wishes they was dead, he puts them in the pit. <laughs> so don't think I did you any favors, you uppity bitch, by stopping old Barnum from having his way with you. His shriveled cock would have been a blessing. 
The only reason I stopped him was because Puck likes him fresh. At this moment, Gwen prayed to God that somehow Mark was still alive and coming to rescue her. But she knew her hopes were in vain. Ash gripped Gwen's cheeks with firm fingers that dug into her skin. Gwen clenched the photograph the same way in her sweating hands and averted her eyes. You hear me, bitch? You wish yous was dead. She shoved Gwen's head backward and stood. You wish yous was dead. Mauser, Moonshiner Camp, West Virginia. Ben Mauser ground his teeth and pulled hard on his chains above his head. They rattled, but he gained no advantage. In order to rest his arms, he let them hang. His muscles were stiff and sore throughout his shoulders and down through his back. The metal from the shackles chafed his hands painfully. His exhaustion was only aggravated by his mind. Those motherfuckers will pay for what they've done. Steel and Nelson, gone. He looked over his shoulder. And I'm chained to a post in the middle of some goddamn hillbilly paradise. They had shackled both his wrists together over his head, in a position that left his face and midsection perpetually exposed. How do we get out of this mess? The chains were a problem, but not insurmountable. However, it was unwise to get free without a plan. First, he had to determine who he was up against. He watched two mountain folk laugh as they walked into one of the sheds housing some sort of distilling equipment. Where do these people come from? It was as if he had been placed smack dab into a scene from a movie. He seriously couldn't make these people up. If he had, no one would believe him. Over the course of a day, he counted a dozen men and three women who inhabited the camp. A few fire pits smoldered and twice as many small wood cabins filled in the camp. No sign of Gwen, Lucia, or Lindsay. They have to be in one of those sheds. Hopefully not the one those men went into. Another issue hindered any sort of escape plan. Where the hell are we? Thick forests surrounded the camp, a naturally secluded hideaway for people avoiding the law. Someone looking in from thirty yards out would never know there were people there between the trees and the camouflage tarps. A tall peak rose high behind Mauser, a mountain staring down at the camp. He couldn't get a good view of it because of the way he was chained, but it would be the only point of reference when he escaped. If he could break free... He would make for the top and look for any depressions or other landmarks to help navigate the foreign land. A deep moan came from the forest. He recognized the depressive sound anywhere. Infected. Mauser struggled against his chains. These chains like a fucking dinner bell. Ahmed, you hear that? Mauser called behind him. The Arab-American man, in his late twenties, had been worked over pretty good by the mountain folk when they first brought them into the camp. Yeah, Ahmed rasped. The man had been in and out of consciousness over a day. It seemed that just when Ahmed would start coming around, some hillbilly would punch his face in again. As much as Mazar didn't like Ahmed, he felt for the man. Ahmed was still part of their group. Just like Nelson, poor kid. The moans grew louder, and Mazar didn't appreciate being sacrificed to the monsters. All that stood between the camp and the outside was a thin line of barbed wire draped around the trees. Haphazard wire ran from tree trunk to tree trunk as if the person putting it up had been intoxicated. A couple of his captors stood nearby, shooting the breeze. Hey, you! Mauser shouted at the nearest captor. The only thing worse than being a prisoner was being eaten alive while being a prisoner. He felt like a goat tied to a post left out for the lions. A skinny hillbilly in a cutoff glared at him. Shut the fuck up, he shouted at Mauser. The infected are coming, Mauser screamed at him. Over there. He nodded in the direction of the trees. A skinny man with the light beer hat approached Mauser. He pushed his hat up high onto his forehead as if he wanted to wear it, but didn't want it to block any sunlight. He was taller than the average Joe, and he had the look of someone who had a very linear family tree. What of it, city boy? A man said. Aren't you going to do something? Mauser asked worriedly. It sounds like infected in the woods. The man peered into the forest. Nah, he said. As if remembering he was mad at Mauser, he gave him a sidelong glance from the corner of a beady eye. Didn't I tell you to shut up? 
He turned his head as he tried to recall. I believe I did. He walked for Mauser, wound his fist back, and punched Mauser in the gut. The pain in his stomach made him want to piss himself. The hillbilly shook his hand out. Shut up and watch. Mauser coughed and regained his breath. The infected emerged from the trees and stumbled down the hill, disappearing into the earth. Where did he go? Now don't make me come back over here, the man said. Chuck, go grab the black guy and clean that up, he yelled with a vengeful look at Mauser. Sure thing, Casey, Chuck said. So light beer hat was Casey, fat t-shirt was Chuck. They were his two main keepers. He had heard about another character, Puck, but hadn't seen him. Most others in the camp, when they weren't spitting on them, let them be. He watched Chuck march Eddie out through a removable gap in the barbed wire. Chuck poked Eddie with a stick as they walked, furthering the man's humiliation. Mauser watched them go into the woods. Must be some sort of trap. Great. If we get out of here, we'll need to be careful of traps in the woods. He regained his breath not comforted by the camp defenses. Fifteen minutes later, Chuck and Eddie came back, blood dripping from the shovel. Eddie slinked along, head down. Chuck, we need the outhouses clean. Get our black friend on it. Chuck grinned like an idiot, a basic man at best, and shoved Eddie in the direction of the little brown single-person shacks near the cabins. You got it, Casey. Come on, Fudgy. We got lots of work for you. I messed up one real good last night. Eddie was literally their slave worker. Any manual labor the hillbillies needed done, they sat by and watched Eddie do it. They all would mock and spit at him as he did their basic chores. It left a sour taste in Mauser's mouth. It was one thing to put Eddie to work. It was another to mock and beat the man while he did it. Chuck led Eddie away, tugging his chains like a dog. Eddie's leg shackles clanked along, hindering his ability to move. Eddie might make it exactly a hundred yards before he was killed by an infected outside the camp. We either need a vehicle or we are going to have to break Eddie's shackles when we flee. We need a key. Or we need the keys to a car. After midday, Casey returned, his beady eyes looking over Mauser and Ahmed. Mauser could see the evil gears grinding away inside his mind. Casey, in Mauser's eyes, was the lowest scum America had to offer. Casey was ignorant, uneducated, mean-spirited, and racist. Mauser was pretty sure that this man would shove his grandmother under a bus for a couple of bucks and a laugh. Hey, Chuck, that raghead is waking up again. Go holler at Henry. Tell him to get the sticks. I got an idea. Henry arrived with the sticks. He was a spitting image of Casey, and Mauser assumed they were brothers or cousins. He handed out the sticks. They were oaken branches three feet long and one inch thick, which had been smoothed down, giving them the appearance of a riot police baton. Casey held his stick in his armpit and unchained Ahmed. Chuck and Casey forced Ahmed to stand up. He wobbled, putting a hand on the post to steady himself. There you go, fella. Stand up now, Casey said. He leaned in close to Ahmed's face. Now go ahead and tell me how long you've been a terrorist. Ahmed knew that these people had no interest in showing him any sort of kindness. He rose his hands up in front of his body. Casey raised his stick behind his head. Ahmed flinched and covered his face with his arm. How long you been a terrorist? Casey bellowed. I'm not a terrorist, Ahmed growled. He coughed a bit, his eyes never leaving Casey's. He lying, Casey. He's lying. Look at his eyes. Chuck squealed, his fat cheeks jiggling like a human pig. Please, I swear to you, I'm an American, Ahmed pled, a hand extended to his captors. I said how long? Casey cried out. He struck Ahmed's upper arm. A crack cut through the air as it impacted the meat of his tricep. Oh, please, Ahmed cried. He grabbed his arm with his hand. Casey circled him. Ahmed turned with the man, keeping him in front. We're just going to have to beat it out of you until you fess up. I was born in Virginia. Homegrown extremist, huh? <laughs> Henry laughed, pacing with his stick. He took a swing at Ahmed, catching him on the back of the knees, 
knocking him to the ground. Fat Chuck stepped in and swatted Ahmed repeatedly. Ahmed shrunk low and covered his face with his arms. Then it was Casey's turn again. Stop, please, Ahmed said. He held his hands out, palms first at them. Not until you tell us the truth, Casey said. He baseball swung into Ahmed's side. Ahmed toppled over into the mud. Casey and his cronies took turns hitting Ahmed in the stomach, arms, legs, ass, shoulders, head. Each time, Ahmed would try and stand. Each time, he would end up on the ground. How's that feel, Haji? Casey sneered. That one's for 9-11, America! Henry shouted out as he landed a crushing blow across Ahmed's stomach. Ahmed collapsed, doubled over in pain. I'm not a terrorist. My family has lived here for 30 years, Ahmed mumbled. What's that, boy? Your family's been terrorists for generations? Casey said, raising the back of his hand to his ear. Whack! He brought his stick down across Ahmed's shoulders as he crawled in the mud. Mauser couldn't handle it. He wanted in the fight. He was ready to rage on these ignorant fuckers. Casey helped Ahmed back up. Here, here. Lay off of him, you two. I think he's had enough. He is repentant of his evil ways. You want some water, little buddy? He said. Ahmed's head barely bobbed up and down, blood running down his swollen, split lip. What do you say, boy? Please, sir, Ahmed said timidly. Chuck, bring us a ladle from the pot over there. Casey called back over his shoulder. Chuck did as he was told and quickly returned to Casey's side, giggling. There you go, boss, he said, lips quivering with excitement. Now, here you go, Mr. Towelhead. Drink up, Casey said. He forced the ladle near Ahmed's mouth, and Ahmed took the ladle in his hands. He drank it greedily. A second later, Ahmed spit out the substance. The liquid sprayed all over Casey. Casey closed his eyes and wiped his face off with the back of his hand. That wasn't smart. He lunged for Ahmed with his stick in hand. What? Our piss ain't good enough for you? In seconds, he had hit Ahmed a dozen times. Ahmed rolled in the mud, unable to get away from Casey's fury. Mauser couldn't take it anymore. This is going to hurt. A case, he shouted. Casey stopped and looked at him. Rage still scrawled over his face. What in the hell do you want? He kicked at Ahmed with his foot. Mauser was silent for a moment as he gathered his courage. Casey wound up to give Ahmed another swing. Mauser licked his cracked lips and took a deep breath. I thought I saw your sister the other day. Casey stopped mid-swing, stick wavering in the air. He hastily turned toward Mauser, his eyes narrowing. Must have struck a chord. His stick dropped to his side. Where? Where was that? Casey said, anger turning to confusion. He strode over to where Mauser was chained. He slapped the stick in the palm of his hand as he walked, squatting down in front of Mauser. Where was that? Mauser outfaced him never letting his eyes leave Casey's chinless face. Funny thing about that case, not only was she dead, but everyone was still having their way with her. I thought I might get... Mauser didn't even finish his insult before the man came upon him. Mauser couldn't block, only turn his head away as Casey's stick connected with his ribs over and over. Casey struck him as if he were a tree he was trying to cut down. Say it again! Casey screamed. He swung the stick like a major league hitter, whipping his hips into each strike. I'm back, Mauser managed. The stick crushed into his abs. Give it to him, Chuck yelled. Crack. The stick whipped through the air. Crack. Whoa, nice one, Henry yelled with a smile. Casey wound up again. Crack. And again. Mauser felt a rib snap as Casey's stick snapped against his midsection. Casey dropped the pieces and went with his fists. The last thing Mauser remembered was a fist crashing into his eye socket. Unconscious, he entered a whole new nightmare. His best friend's blood spraying all over the doctor's face as Steele took a sniper round to the head. Stopping had been a huge mistake. Mauser only had an instant to comprehend what happened as Steele's head rocketed backward. Steele collapsed like a sack of rocks. 
Seconds later, bullets whizzed through the lunchbox, turning it into a piece of Swiss cheese. He'd seen the warning signs, and they ignored it. All the indicators of an ambush were there. The cars in a funneled shape allowing them in, but hindering their retreat. The damsel in distress. The nicely sloped land for elevated shooting. He wanted to play savior to the public just as much as Steele did, but they had guessed wrong. Now they were paying the price. Steele had paid the ultimate price for his bleeding heart. The world was a mean place. Now even more so. Mauser would never again be caught on the wrong side of that dilemma. Mauser slowly came back too, vision blurred, still alive, in a living hell, still chained to a fucking pole. To breathe was painful, thanks to his freshly broken ribs. The hillbillies laughed as they drank, pleased with their current round of torture. Ahmed whispered on the other side, Are you okay? Mauser moaned that he still continued to live. Pain covered his body. Thank you. Mauser gave him another moan to say, You're welcome. I'd rather be outside with the crazies than in here with these animals. Mauser spit out some copper-tasting phlegm from his mouth. The red glob settled on the ground in front of him. Don't make me laugh. It hurts. Mauser spat again. His chest throbbed, as if his rib jabbed his lung on every breath. At least the infected kill you and get it over with. He grimaced in pain. Ahmed sighed heavily, chains rattling above him. Why do they hate me? I never did anything to them. Ahmed whimpered in self-pity. The toll of being the most hated prisoner weighed on him. Mauser slowly twisted his head. It felt like he had been in a car accident like all the muscles in his neck had been torn in half by whiplash. You're just different, and they hate themselves. Fuck, I hate you, but not because you're an Arab. Or do you hate me? Because you're a cocky asshole. It was Ahmed's turn to laugh. Don't make me laugh. It hurts so bad. Ahmed sounded off in a coughing fit. Mauser dipped his head as the hillbillies realized they were awake. Casey snorted when he looked at them. I can't wait till Puck gets back and we can get some fun out of these two. Casey said. Chuck laughed like a piglet. Casey sneered. Enough of these losers. Let's see if old Barnum is done stealing up that hooch. Casey spat at the two captives. Ahmed, Mauser whispered. Yeah? Ahmed whispered back. What are they talking about? I don't know and I don't want to find out. Two pickups rumbled into the camp. The pickups were rusted out and old. Doors slammed shut, and a man that rivaled Mauser's old teammate, Jarl, in stature, exited the truck. He stretched and grabbed a wood-stocked AK-47 and an axe from the passenger side of his truck. He gave them a glance and walked to his cabin, axe laid across his shoulders. Oh, great, Mauser thought. That big bastard must be Puck. Kinnick, Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. Former Undersecretary for Political and Military Affairs Michael Kinnick surveyed the mass of bodies accumulating around the monolithic United States Armed Forces headquarters, the Pentagon. From the rooftop seven stories up, it looked like a teeming ant pile as they clambered on top of the dead in an attempt to reach them. Eighteen-inch thick bulletproof windows and massive two-foot-thick walls prevented a breach on the lower levels. They keep coming, O'Sullivan said, shading his eyes. He was an IT defense contractor working his second private career out of the military. He was balding and out of shape. Not that Kinnick was in particularly great shape and feeling every bit his age. The Zulus flooded in from the district. They navigated the parking lot of the 14th Street Bridge and crossed into Arlington, Virginia, amassing in the tens of thousands right against the Pentagon's nuclear blast-proof front door. Early on, those who had tried to flee to their homes were killed in their cars by the flood of the dead in the parking lot. It had become a maze of twisted metal and death. They don't seem to end, Kinnick said. Sweat ran down his back, staining the same clothes he had worn for weeks. If only the Apaches were still running, O'Sullivan said. If only. We should have used them earlier, Kinnick said, 
tossing a roof tile to O'Sullivan. O'Sullivan caught the tile, bending his back and absorbing the toss with his arms. If we'd listened to General Travis, we would have. Too little, too late. O'Sullivan handed the square tile off to another sweat-streak defense contractor. The military had tried to stem the flow of infected, but their efforts had been overrun by mass hysteria and panic as people retreated ahead of the undead. The soldiers had struggled to tell the difference between infected and uninfected and were pushed back. That was during the first days of the outbreak. It wasn't until weeks later that they sent the attack helicopters to strafe the bridges, no longer caring about the loss of living human life. No matter how many times they rained rockets and minigun fire on the infected below, they still came. Any side of the supply helos? O'Sullivan asked, but the man already knew the answer. Kinnick was silent. Kinnick covered his eyes and searched west anyway. No helicopters. The helos had stopped making runs of weapons and supplies almost seven days ago. They had tried desperately to reach the Mount Eden FEMA facility turned military base by radio, but nobody picked up. They only had a finite amount of time they could survive without outside reinforcements, and Kinnick thought that even if they were well supplied, the place was unsalvageable. Kinnick nodded to a master sergeant leading the mix of military and civilians. Unsalvageable, but all we got. Keep tossing desks, chairs, anything hard enough to crack a skull at these things. A smile split the master sergeant's face, despite the dark circles underneath his eyes. There's plenty of that shit, and not enough bullets to waste on all these Zulus, Master Sergeant Massey said. Massey was pretty tall and had wiry, endless strength to him. Kinnick thought he would make a good farmer. Not one of the men was under forty. Kinnick knew he wasn't the one giving orders as a retired colonel. Old habits die hard. You heard the full bird. Let's say hello to our friends down below, Master Sergeant Massey yelled out. He picked up a piece of roofing tile and dumped it over the edge with a twist of his body. The Pentagon's survival rested on the sheer determination and willpower of the people residing within the building, supplemented by an adequate amount of supplies. Kinnick was proud of the men and women who fought here. They were an eroding symbol of a collapsing military force. Shit, a collapsing government. Collapsing, but still in the fight. If you aren't knocked out, you're still in the fight. And we aren't done yet. A modern-day Alamo. He hoped after they fell they would be a rallying cry for the rest of the nation, as opposed to the giant final domino in the death throes of a state. Remember the Pentagon. Didn't have the same ring to it. Or maybe it would be the turning point in the war against the infected where all knew it was lost. That was what he couldn't let happen. He couldn't lose this fight. He couldn't let it become a Tet Offensive. He couldn't let the building collapse and risk destroying the public's will to continue the war. No, not the same. This war was different. It would be won by the American public at large, not only through their support, but through their strength of arms. This fight wasn't about glory or a mission accomplished. This was a fight for survival, a fight against annihilation. People needed all the hope they could get in a time like this. The rooftop crew worked methodically. One squad would haul furniture from inside the building up to the roof. Another worked at ripping up the heavy roof tiles, and the last was tossing the heavy objects over the side onto the infected. They worked diligently, if not hard, but uninspired. The weariness of manual labor weighed heavily on them. Their hearts hurt worse. Their souls despaired beneath the cold, weathered sun. How can you give someone hope when their loved ones rose from the grave, attempting to rip them into little pieces? How can one pull the trigger on their loved ones? How can you dehumanize someone's loved ones enough for them to put them down in cold blood? Is it even possible? Kinnick wrapped his fingers under a concrete tile. It lifted up an inch before he had to set it back down. It was in slate like the roof tiles. Where did this come from? he asked aloud. He got his fingers under it and heaved, bear-hugging the tile to his chest. That's from the courtyard, Master Sergeant Massey said. Kinnick strained and dropped it off the roof of the Pentagon. He watched with very little grim satisfaction as a small hole appeared in the massive horde where he had crushed the infected. Well, that was heavy. He wiped his brow. The open space below filled in with more infected. It was like being on top of a medieval rampart while the enemy below tried to gain entry by storming the keep. At least this enemy isn't coordinated enough to scale the walls, he thought. Then they would literally have a medieval battle, and the enemy would overrun them within minutes. A radio sounded off in the corner. 
a loud crackle rippling over the grunts of men and women at hard labor. Colonel Kinnick, the radio popped. Kinnick walked over to the radio and picked it up, holding it close to his ear. Kinnick over, he said, was all he could manage in his rundown state. General Travis wants you below. It's urgent. Static filled the air and cut out. Copy. I'll be right down. Over. Kinnick took a deep breath. He didn't mind being relieved of such a task, but he most likely walked into an even worse prospect than hard manual labor. Funny thing, right after we get started, the colonel has a very important meeting to attend to, O'Sullivan chirped. I don't make the calls a general does, Kinnick said. That's right, O'Sullivan. Quit sandbagging it. Let the full bird do what he's got to do. Master Sergeant Massey barked. Massey gave him a nod of respect. The nod let Kinnick know that Massey would not rest while there was still work to do. They all reported to General Travis, a two-star general, as the higher-ranking officers had evacuated to safer places farther into the interior of the country. They had the strategic mission in sight. So far, it had been to lose tens of thousands of soldiers to the plague, and even more to desertion, and they hadn't been able to control the outbreak of any city with a population of over a thousand on the East Coast. It could be worse, Master Sergeant Massey commented. Kinnick eyed the thousands of soulless marching to the Pentagon. We have to hold. It is the only way. How so? Moans drifted all the way to the roof. The wiry sergeant smiled. They could be inside. I guess I should play the lottery then, Kinnick said. I'll be back up to check in after the meeting with the general. Sir, we will keep up the barrage. Kinnick would make his last stand here. General Travis also had seen the symbolic importance and hunkered down. While his peers evacuated, he elected to hold the Pentagon against all odds. He embodied the spirit of a true leader. A hard man to please, but a man that other men would lay their lives down for, and they did, by the hundreds. Travis was a good soldier. A few inches taller than Kinnick and a bit thicker in the chest, the man presented a strong symbol to the troops in such a horrific time. He was the kill them all and let God sort them out type. A man they needed now. Kinnick would follow him to hell and back. And that was good, because hell had come. Gwen, Moonshiner Camp, West Virginia. Lucia, Lucia, Gwen mumbled through the oily rag. Lucia laid in center of the shed, covered in filth. Dios te salve, Maria, Lucia whimpered. Her bruised cheeks faced Gwen, but her dark eyes were empty all feeling lost inside them. It will be okay, Gwen tried to say. She nodded her head furiously, attempting to soothe the woman. Lucia rolled her head away from Gwen, her voice barely audible. He bendito es el fruto, y du tu fientre, Jesus. Gwen banged her head against the wall in frustration. The pain reminded her that she was still alive, and she was still in hell. For the thousandth time, she strained her arms in an attempt to break the rope holding her captive. The rope sawed into the sores rubbed into her arms from days of chafe and friction. Lindsay sat in the corner, her head down, arms tied around her knees. Lindsay, Gwen whispered. It came out more of a grunt. Won't, Lindsay mouthed. Help me get free. Gwen bent her back, showing Lindsay her tied hands. No, they will hit us and... Lindsay stopped mid-sentence and glanced at Lucia. We can't. Help me escape. I will find help and come back, Gwen mumbled. Lindsay shook her head mutely. Gwen bowed her head. These people were part of her family, and like family, they could drive you insane. She had a responsibility to these women. I will not fail them again. We can't go softly into the night. We must punch, kick, and bite our way to the bitter end. She would do it for steel. She would do it for herself. She would do what she had to do. Gwen took her bound wrists and rubbed them along the wood on the wall. It may take three weeks, but I will break out of here. She sanded the rope down stroke by stroke, thread by thread. Gwen, Lindsay croaked, eyes wide. Her neck tensed and her chest strained as she breathed hard. She nodded at the door. Moments later, the door kicked inwards, and in a momentary lapse of fear, 
Gwen hoped. She dared to hope that Steele had come galloping in like a knight in shining armor to rescue them. One could stand much more steady with a rock to lean on. Her hope was crushed against the massive boulder of a man that entered the shed instead. He loomed above her, taking in the women at one glance. Gwen gasped. His frame pressed into all corners of the doorway. He was like a regular man, but only massive in proportion. Ruega por nosotros pecadores ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte, Lucia continued. The man grinned down at Gwen through a thick, scraggly black beard that looked like small black wires running off his cheeks and chin. A hand the size of a ham engulfed her shoulder and he pulled her upright, as if she were a toddler. Amen. Dios te salve, Maria, Lucia whispered to the side. This must be the girl, he said, drinking in Gwen's body with his eyes. He wiped the corners of his mouth and dusted his fingers off on his dirty white T-shirt. No yelling now, pretty birdie, he cooed, his voice sounding like two rocks smacking together. Roughed, callous fingers removed her gag, and she flexed her jaw, rotating it open and closed. That's good. What's your name, little birdie? He said. Gwen stole a glance at Lucia and Lindsay. They looked at her fearfully. She peered up into his eyes, trying to look defiant, a fleeting moment of rebellion punctuated by pain. With speed she hadn't expected, his bratwurst fingers wrapped around her jaw in a vice grip. How can I protect them or even myself against such a monster? I said, what is your name, girl? Gwen struggled against his iron grip. Screw you, she said. Her voice sounded like a child's. Her eyes burned as she looked into his. His eyes were almost covered by his bushy brows. She crushed the photo in her sweaty palms and gritted her teeth. Her leg flew high and hard into his crotch, as if she were punting a football out of the stadium. Bull, he grunted, bending over at the waist. Anger scrawled over his wide, cragged features. How's that feel, you big fuck? She yelled up at him. Her victory was only a fleeting moment. A giant fist sailed into her face. Black hung over her eyes and bells rang in her ears. Echoes of voices around her waxed and waned. Not knowing how long she was out, she carefully opened her eyes. Her hands no longer held her photo. A sense of dread filled her insides. That wasn't smart, he said, arms crossed. Her head beat like a drum. She didn't think her jaw could hurt any worse. The painful ache shot through the bones of her jaw, down her neck, and into her gut. She caught her breath between painful throbs. Her hands grasped behind her for her photograph. Your face was pretty, and now it ain't. She moaned, fingers stretching behind her. Go to hell, she spat. She rolled on her shoulders to a seated position, her hands tapping the ground behind her. We have to find it. A scowl on his lips, he eyed the other women. He reached out, touching Lindsay's head. Her eyes clenched close in fear of his hand. None of them are good enough, and I don't have time for your tomfoolery. His hand dug into Lindsay's hair. He squeezed, tight knuckles white, and hauled her to her feet. The women sobbed now, and Lindsay's eyes begged for release. The giant pulled a long, speckled deer antler dagger and pressed it to her throat. Lindsay's eyes bulged. Please stop, she pleaded. A vile grin crawled across his face. The caverns of his eyes gaped. It was as if he fed on breaking her. My name is Gwen, she whispered, her voice barely audible over the cries of her fellow captives. The black-bearded menace dropped Lindsay onto her rear. Gwen's scrambling hands wrapped around the photo a mere glimmer of hope between her fingers. A tiny spark of her still remained. I can't hear you. He moved close to her. He stunk like stale sweat. Violently, he put a hand on her leg, gripping tight. What'd you say? My name is Gwen, she whispered, each word betraying herself and the women around her. She had given him an inch, but it felt like a mile. Her will had crumbled underneath his colossal weight. Her head swam and her stomach turned as her eye tightened. Blood swelled beneath the bruised surface of her skin. 
The monster reveled in his victory. He smirked and revealed missing teeth beneath his black shrub of a beard. My name is Puck Roberts, and you are my new woman. He yanked her upright by the elbow. If you act out again, I'll hurt them. He pointed his knife at the women. You understand? You are my property. I am no man's property. The other women moaned in fear. I understand, Gwen said, her voice squeaking at the end. I will do what I must. Puck gave her a gap-toothed smile. Good. You aren't such a dumb blonde. He cut the ties binding her wrists. She gasped as he wrapped a rope around her neck like a farm dog. With a tug, he guided her outside. The bright light stung her eyes, and she stumbled. He kept her up with the rope, and she coughed. What have I done? Who am I? She had agreed to be this man's concubine, this monster who would let his friends rape women, a man responsible for the death of her love, and now she was to be his lover. The thought of him touching her made her want to vomit. Puck dragged her through trampled grass. Small wood buildings sat surrounded by trees. Other people were there. Thin Casey gave her a wicked smile, hands shoved into his pockets. Fat Chuck stood next to him with a dumb grin on his face, belly showing out the bottom of his T-shirt. There were others she hadn't seen. They smiled at her misfortune as she half walked and was half dragged to a small cabin in the distance. She looks nice, shouted Fat Chuck. A hand snuck under his shirt, and he scratched at his belly. Where are you taking me? Puck laughed at her question. His laugh was a deep bass drum. She wrapped her hands around the rope. He tugged her along like a naughty dog. Got some fight in her, huh, Puck? Casey said. We'll break her, Puck said. You bet we will. They shared a laugh. He dragged her around a smoldering fire pit. Two men were chained to a wooden pole in the middle of the camp. On one side, a battered black and blue face looked up at her. When? The man cried, his voice parched. Ahmed? Gwen said. She pulled back on her rope. Ahmed? She shrieked. His face was a puffed blackish purple. It had swollen to double its normal size. Puck yanked her chain forward, jolting her neck. Come on, he grunted. The other battered figure stirred. I'll kill you, Mauser shouted from the other side of the pole. Gwen tried to keep him in view, twisting and turning on her rope, hands wrapped around it. Mauser, help me, she called to him. Mauser wrestled with his chains. Puck smacked her across her face. Stars appeared in her eyes. No more yelling. You act out. You and your friends suffer, he grumbled. Gwen's cheek felt like it was on fire. An arm wrapped around her waist, and he lifted her up on his shoulder. Casey, you want to quiet them down a bit? Be my pleasure, Casey said. He turned and yelled, Henry, get the sticks! He carried her the rest of the way to the cabin. Its wooden door banged open, and he turned sideways to get her inside. He's going to do it now. I can't be here. Her mind raced, not allowing any true thought or purpose to emerge victorious. He set her down, and a big hand guided her to a chair. Her feet unwillingly baby-stepped. Sit, he grunted. He nudged her near a faded blue wooden chair at a dingy yellow kitchen table. She sat, hands on her lap. She stole a glance at the photograph before bowing her head. The cabin was small, with only a single open room. Puck tended to a metal wood stove resting on cement pieces in the corner. On the other side of the room sat a full-sized bed, its rusted metal frame foreboding. She averted her gaze as he moved around the room. A plate of food dropped in front of her, and she jumped. Baked beans, some sort of mystery meat, and canned corn. She tried to resist the wonderful aroma. It had been days since she last ate. The stress... The terror and the pain begged her to dig in. Eat up, Gwen, her mind mocked her. You don't know when you are going to eat again. This could be your last meal. She averted her eyes away from the tantalizing food. Puck's dark eyes weighed her like a grizzly bear eyeing a tasty grub. 
He lost interest and dug in. He shoveled some meat into his mouth, slurping up some juices. Eat, he said, chewing his food with his mouth open. His mouth stayed open to breathe in between chews. She stared past him, neither seeing him nor the food, using every inch of will she had to hold back. This could be my only meal from here on out. If I give in, I will be doing what he wants, bowing down to his rule over me. Eat, he commanded. The food looked processed, disgusting, sweet, and delicious at the same time. The smells of beans tickled her nostrils, egging her on. She never thought a baked bean would smell so succulent. A little maroon, oval-shaped, mushy bean. Maybe if I eat a little to keep up my strength, no one could blame me for that. She poked a single bean with her fork and placed the miniature morsel of food into her mouth. Smoky barbecue flavor exploded onto her taste buds. The bean crushed on her salivating tongue and was gone. The temptation was too much. Her stomach roared as she scooped up beans onto her fork, using her thumb as a backdrop. She inhaled the food. Puck smiled through his dark beard. I like a woman who eats, he drawled out. I could give a rat's ass what you like. She smiled back at him, attempting to be sweeter than a cupcake. Just keep the food coming, fatty. The food went down in huge chunks, and soon she was holding out an empty plate. More! Puck laughed. Ha! 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 You do like to eat! He exclaimed. He rose to slop more food on her plate. She faked a smile at him as he brought her food. When I get a chance, I am going to kill you. She ate another whole plate of Hilltop Special. When she was done, Gwen felt hundreds of times better with food in her belly, but deep down she had a keen sense that in some way she had betrayed everyone she cared about. She leaned back, taking in the meager surroundings, acutely aware that she was almost naked. Folding her arms across her chest, she tried to cover her skin. Puck's eyes licked her exposed flesh. Unlike the rest of her body, her cheeks grew hot. He stood up and grabbed a dirty dress that was draped across the bed. It had ruffled shoulders and a splayed-out hem with a bow in front, as if its former owner had walked off the set of a prom in a 1980s coming-of-age film. Put this on. I like my girl all dressed up, Puck said. That? she said. If it wasn't him asking, she would have laughed. His face spelled evil. Yeah, he muttered. Of course. She hummed as sweetly as possible. Better than being half naked, or is this a way to get me all the way naked? Gwen turned her back to him, letting her soiled nightgown fall to the floor. Goosebumps formed on her exposed skin. She slid the dress over her hips and pulled the straps onto her shoulders. Pretending to fix the dress, she tucked the rolled-up photograph into her chest. The weight of his eyes rested on her backside. Let me see your front, he growled. Taking a deep breath, she calmed herself. Her friends depended on it. She needed to earn his trust. Trust equals freedom. She smoothed the front of her dress and spun around, giving a winning smile with a bat of her eyelashes and a curtsy. The shoulder of her dress slipped off, and with all the grace she could muster, she put it back in place. Puck's eyes widened a little. So, Puck, what do you have in store for us tonight? She asked. The dress whisked as she walked back and took a seat back at the table. I'm gonna go check the fences. You get to stay here, he said. Perfect. If she was alone, she could figure out some sort of escape plan. You like parties? He asked. I just love parties she replied, playing it up. She tried to give him a genuine smile. Please don't give me away. He rose up and moved close. His heavy body odor oppressed her. It took every ounce of her strength to not turn away in disgust. Not my kind of party, he said. His fingers wrapped around her wrist. Ow, that hurts, she complained. Her nails dug into his hand. Puck ignored her pleas. He pulled her upright. Her feet slid out from beneath her as she struggled to gain footing. He was a tsunami of mountain men driving her for the bed. No, no, she thought. This can't be happening. He shoved her down onto the lumpy mattress. 
Its damp, musty smell penetrated her nostrils. One at a time, he pinned each of her wrists, his hand engulfing both of hers with ease. She kicked out at him, her foot bouncing off his side harmless. His eyes held an eerie look as if he was only doing a day's work. Stop! Stop! No! She shouted. Hold still, bitch! He snarled. He clicked a handcuff around her wrist and another around the metal bed frame. She struck out at him again, and he dodged her by stepping back. He smiled down at her and surveyed his work. Lot of spunk in you, he laughed. He leaned in close, gripping her face so she couldn't pull away, and kissed her. A slimy tongue speared into her mouth. He held it for what seemed to be an eternity until he let her go. Feels like true love, he said, and walked out. She half sat, half laid on the bed, and cried. Why did I fight so hard for this? Steel, Wilderness of West Virginia Steel stalked along the outside of the prefabricated house, his breath fogged in many clouds, disappearing in the night. He ran a hand along the vinyl siding, using it to keep himself upright. Peering through the windows, he looked for any signs of life, dead or otherwise. Stalking around in the night and only my underwear covered in blood, I might earn myself a bullet. Steele worked his way to the back of the building. Nothing sat in the dirt driveway. Wood was stacked in a pile near the back door. Looks like somebody was here recently. No matter. They're probably dead now. Gripping his knife, he tested the sliding glass door. His hand shook. Locked. Slowly, he crept around the house, trying windows like a thief. Eventually, he came to a bedroom window that was cracked open. He pushed it up with a shaky hand. He stood on his tiptoes and hauled himself through. Cologne and other trinkets tumbled from the top of a dresser he landed on. They rolled to a stop on the floor. Silence responded. Unnerving, dead silence. Fuck. If somebody is in here, they know I am too. Steele stood still and listened for movement in the next room. He expected the low scrape of the infected dragging themselves across the floor. The grind of dead feet followed by them smashing through the door. Silence. Steele lowered the window. In the dim light, he could make out a queen-sized bed, a TV on a stand, and a bedside table. Movie posters adorned the walls, and nothing really matched as if the owner had bought their items piecemeal. Looks like my place before Gwen. Steel beelined for what he hoped to be a man's closet. He ripped open the doors and flipped through the clothes. Anything warm. Steel thumbed through shirts, trying not to screech the hangers across the metal, until he came across the thick, fuzzy, familiar feeling of a flannel and threw it over his filthy body. Not a bad fit. He held out his arms and the sleeves dangled long past his fingertips. He rolled them up. His hands patted the man's top shelf. His fingers wrapped around a pair of pants. He kicked his boots off and slipped on the jeans and cuffed the bottoms. It will do. Better than freezing to death. He snagged a checkered blanket off the man's bed and wrapped it around his shoulders, letting the warmth of civilized humanity embrace him. Better than you sorry bastards outside. Clutching his knife, he inched open the bedroom door to the living area. A simple beige pleather couch with another TV sat in the living room that was connected together with the kitchen. His eyes settled on the Holy Grail a simple, white-stacked refrigerator. Food. Steele's feet stuck to the linoleum as he walked through the kitchen. With each step, his feet quietly stuck and ripped free. As he got closer to potential food, his stomach rumbled violently to remind him he hadn't eaten in what seemed like an eternity. Okay, okay, he whispered to himself. He opened the fridge. Light poured forth. Steele quickly closed it. Leave it open and risk attracting the worst this area has to offer with only a knife to fight them, or find food elsewhere. He flung open cupboard doors in search of sustenance. He crouched down and dug through a bunch of canned goods. Hundreds of cans lined the pantry. Not bad. The old canned food bachelor diet. Steele smiled when he came across a can with a big grizzly bear in the front. Bear's home-style chili. Not the healthiest of foods but packed with protein and carbs. Nutrients he needed to survive. Nutrients he needed to heal. 
It was also packed with beans. No one but me, so I can let him rip. There's gotta be a can opener around here somewhere, he whispered. He rifled through a drawer. His brow creased with agitation when he didn't find one right away. Come on, dude, he thought. This guy has all these cans and no fucking can opener? You're holding a knife, he said aloud. He cleaned it quick. His mind struggled. He already held a tool that could solve this problem, his razor-sharp knife that could easily cut through aluminum cans. He punched the blade through the top of the can and sawed through the metal. A spicy, meaty aroma filled his nostrils as he removed the lid, and he didn't even bother to look for utensils. He tipped the can back and let the chili fall into his mouth. He chewed with his mouth open, smacking his lips with satisfaction. Wiping his face, he thought of the next rung on his survival hierarchy. A weapon. He needed something other than his knife. He tiptoed from space to space. He opened drawers, crawled into closets, looked under the man's mattress. He was sure it was a man now. There was no way a woman had both an Xbox One and a PlayStation 4. Plenty of games, but no weapons. Nothing. Steele laughed to himself. This must be the only household in West Virginia that didn't have a friggin' gun in it. Can't Molon lave them if you don't got them. In the end, Steele held a bottle of whiskey and a small flashlight for all his effort. He tiptoed his way to the single bathroom and rummaged through the man's meager supplies, but only managed to find a few gauze pads, some bandages, and antiseptic spray. He shined his flashlight in the bathroom mirror, illuminating his face in the reflection, and almost puked. One of the dead stood in his place, gaunt, thin, and ravaged by the elements, a ghost of some forgotten battlefield. Dried black blood flaked down his face and had streaked his beard with dark shades of red. His skin was pale, his eyes were sunken, and the gash across his skull was fresh. If he was ever handsome, no one would call him that now, disfigured at best. He leaned into the mirror, the flashlight glowing on his face as if he told a ghost story. The wound started at his hairline and went back at a slight angle to the left. Back and to the left. Skin and hair had been dug out to either side, leaving a divot on his head. Whiteness was exposed on top like an amateur golfer had hacked up the fairway of his head. It looks like I took a bullet to the head. Steele lightly touched the top of the wound and pain shot down his neck, taking his breath away. Fucking A, are you hot shot? He took a breath. In the head. I'm lucky the perpetrator wasn't a better shot or I would be dead. Or I should be thankful that bullets do weird things sometimes after you fire them. This thick fucking skull of mine finally paid off. When will get a kick out of that? The thought of her made his gut grind. Please, God, let them be alive, he said to his horrible reflection. Only his destroyed face stared back. No answers, only pain in his eyes. They would have taken you with them. He looked away from his reflection. Or at least buried me. Unless Gwen was trying to break up with me. Damn, couldn't have just sent a text or something? He left me naked on the side of the road. No, he wouldn't have done that. Tears welled up in his eyes. They couldn't have. He crushed the counter in his hands to reassure himself. They are still alive. I will find them, he muttered. No time for feelings. Can't find them if I'm dead. He snagged a worn washcloth out of the linen closet. We will get out of this shit, he said, as he prepared himself for more pain. You are already dead, the back of his mind whispered. Steele cracked open the bottle of whiskey and took a few pulls. The fiery liquid singed his throat all the way down to his belly. He dabbed the washcloth with water and, as tenderly as he could, cleaned the wound. Although a dirty scab was forming, the skin around the wound was frayed and puckered. Pain shot through his body over and over, and soon the wound leaked blood on his face. He shoved gauze into the wound, and when it was as clean as he could make it, he took a long pull of whiskey and poured a bunch over his head. The most painful pull he ever took. He puked in the toilet, water and vomit splashing. His abs contracted into small orbs of muscle over and over. The sight and smell of the chili and whiskey coming up made him wretch again. For three horrible minutes, he stood over the toilet, about to pass out, staring down at his own filth. Not as good coming up. 
He composed himself and wrapped his head with the white bandages. Now he had to try and keep it clean so he didn't die a horrible, feverish death from an infection. His stomach rumbled again, so he made his way to the pantry, this time opting for a can of chicken noodle soup. He slurped the soup down. The broth eased his troubled stomach, and his body immediately fell into exhaustion. He made for the bedroom with only one intent. He sat on the bed. Not bad, he thought, bouncing up and down, but he didn't really care. Anything was preferable to outside of the hard cushions of the mobile lounge. He crawled under the covers and snuggled in. He was out before he could think about how tired he was. Fevered dreams plagued him, but they weren't dreams. They were nightmares. The dead came for him, except they were his friends. They came in waves. First, an almost unrecognizable Jarl came for him. Most of the flesh from his body was gone like he was a giant bleeding heap of bones and muscle. His squad mate, who had died in their escape from Mount Eden, snapped Steele's bones one by one like twigs. Wheeler came next, pale as a ghost. He was shirtless, and his chest was collapsed on one side from where a terrorist's knife had punctured his lung. Bandages hung off the wound as if they'd been ripped away in a crazed attack. He stuck his hands deep into Steele's guts, as if he tried to see what steel was made of. Gwen, along with the other survivors, came for him at once. Gwen wore a blue prom dress, her skin the color of a porcelain doll. Her eyes showed nothing for him aside from death. She let out an unholy wail as she led the rest of his friends for him. They beckoned him to join the ranks of the unhallowed. They reached for him, and, through tears, he fought and pushed and shoved them. Nothing he did deterred his army of undead friends. They reached with bloodied arms, smiled with crimson grins. Their decaying bodies pressed forward, and he retreated backward until he could go no further, his back against the fiery wall. No! Stay back! He screamed at them. Hayes filled his dream, and all his friends were gone. A booted man in tactical gear walked closer to him, reddish hair, tattoos running down both his arms, a swagger that only a seasoned warrior could carry successfully. Mauser, Steele echoed. Mauser stepped closer out of the fog, his face pale. He was like a ghost. Are you okay? Steele said into the nothing. Mauser was silent and only stood, facing Steele. His eyes never left Steele's, as if his friend waited for him to say something. After a moment, Mauser brought a hand to his chest, and his fingers revealed bright cardinal red that popped out in the cloud of gray that surrounded them. Steele blinked, and when he opened his eyes, Mauser was closer. He thrust his bloodied hand into Steele's, bloody stickiness locking the two together. What happened? Steele said, his voice echoing into nothingness. Mauser's grip was like iron. Steele wanted to pull his hand away, but couldn't. A grave smile spread on Mauser's lips, gradually bearing bloody red teeth, his eyes pale and white. He nodded and disappeared. Steele shot awake, gasping for air. His body was on fire as it shook to stay warm, both ice and fire at the same time. His clothes dripped with sweat. Every muscle in his body was sore, and his old sports injuries flared up the worst. He gingerly made his way back to the bathroom and ingested every fever reducer and pill that looked like it might be an antibiotic. He bent down under the faucet and guzzled water and lay back down. Thank God for Wells. His head pounded out a rhythm with his heart, each thundering blow like Thor's hammer striking the top of his skull. The door latch clicked as it was slid open. He held his breath. It clicked softly as it closed. His mind was a heady fog. He lay in sweat-filled sheets unsure of reality. Another dream? Or was that real? Steele peered in the dark, using his ears for any affirmation that what he heard was real. The backslider rolled on its single track. Wood scratched metal. Fuck. He needed a way out. Moonlight glowed through the window. Only death awaited him outside. Fever, exposure, the infected would ensure his demise. Footsteps clopped closer to the bedroom door. Steele sprung up out of the bed and dashed for the closet. He squeezed the flimsy accordion door closed. Seconds later, the door opened and was replaced by a beam of light. The flashlight scanned the room, searching for an intruder. Steele clutched his knife, his hand knuckling white. His blade was black, jutting out from his overhand grasp. 
A shotgun was pointed in a corner held by a single hand. Steele shifted his feet and his shoulder brushed a wire hanger. It swung loose and it teetered back and forth, creaking. The shotgun leveled at the closet, steady and flat. Blade versus shotgun. No good. He gritted his teeth. Footsteps echoed over the floor. Man stopped. Both men knew the other was there. The man inhaled through his nose. The oxygen whistled in. Steel tensed his legs, ready to spring into action. Offset and close the distance. Must be fast. The lightweight door crashed open, and Steel lunged into action. Joseph, Southern Pennsylvania Joseph's radio clock emitted a soft green two o'clock. He rotated his steering wheel with both hands as he took it to the side of the road. His small car rolled to a stop, the gravel crunching beneath his tires. He ducked his head to get a better view. A reflective green sign read, Pittsburgh 13, in white letters. He eyed his dashboard. The gas gauge needle lay diagonal to the side. I need to find more fuel before I attempt whatever is left of Pittsburgh. He covered his mouth as he yawned. Some sleep couldn't hurt either. He snatched up his atlas. His finger bounced from south of Pittsburgh, tracking a route north and west. His finger traced all the way to the west coast of Michigan and stopped at a tiny circle representing a small coastal town on Lake Michigan, a town that had the infamous distinction of housing the last known whereabouts of Patient Zero. If I can average 25 miles per hour, I can reach Grand Haven, Michigan in five days on the back roads. He exhaled deep. What will you do with him when you find him? Go to a nearby lab and begin tests? Perfect. Find the lab, hunt for food, fight the undead, study the virus, make the vaccine, distribute to the remaining population. No problem. Definitely a one-man operation. Joseph turned a knob on his dash. The lights went dark. He didn't switch the car off. The engine idled a soft, muted hum. Weariness wore him down into sleep. He dozed in and out of consciousness. A gray-skinned woman's face pressed itself against the passenger window, jaw working open and closed. Black slime oozed between her teeth. Filth streaked down the window as her nails clawed the glass. He stared dimly, his mind draped in drowsiness. Nightmares or reality, there was no difference. Thumping on the window gradually tugged him free of his twilight. She was joined by another infected, whose ribcage was partially exposed. White ribs folded over, holding in the remains of a maroonish gray lung. What an awful dream, he thought. Within moments, the first two were joined by more, beating the car with broken hands, bent fingers, stumps where arms should have been. They beat the car like a drummer would a bass. It's real, his mind whispered. He jumped up in his seat. Cloudy white eyes glared at him. Their eyes lacked any substance, showing neither empathy, hatred, nor recognition that he was to do anything other than die. He watched for a moment, trying to understand them. The infected woman clanked her teeth into the glass. Pieces of brown enamel stuck to spittle dripping down the window. If the woman had a soul, it was no longer within her. He pressed the pedal and gassed the car straight ahead. Bodies fell to the side as his wheels spun gravel and dirt alike. Miles dragged by. The undead reached for him in passing. They followed him down the road until he lost them in the night. Packs of infected swelled near trees and cars. More and more of them prohibited him from stopping again, so he drove on. The die had been cast. He would have to run the Pittsburgh gauntlet without making sure everything was planned out, prepared, or ready. Not being prepared gave him anxiety. If I get trapped in the city with no gas, I am dead for sure. I can't change a tire. A horde will swallow me whole. Joseph followed an entrance ramp onto a highway. Dormant traffic stood quiet. Lifeless taillights faced him. So many vehicles are headed toward the city. Why? He meandered through the vehicles. His car whined as the mare caught on another car and snapped off. Damn it, he said. He inched the car back the other way. The back end dug into the front end of another car, and he cleared it. Ahead of him, early morning sun shone from behind a mountain. Stunted greenish-yellow trees climbed over the mountain, covering it like a multicolored shroud. Darkness retreated downward near the tunnels, pressured by the growing sunlight. The tunnels called to him, 
and forbid him from entering their domain at the same time. That must be the Fort Penn Tunnel. The tunnels themselves were carved straight into the rock, and the front entrance was layered with tan brick. A windowed control center faced outward, the windows lightless. It will lead me straight into downtown Pittsburgh, metro area home to over two million, mostly dead, the rest infected. He tapped the gas pedal, and even when he saw the blockage, he didn't stop. Huge shipping containers towered to the top of the tunnel entrance. A smattering of faded red, blue, and green containers were stacked on top of one another with a base of earth and debris. He threw the car into park in front of the blockade. Joseph pulled out his atlas, a lost skill in a world with the modern convenience of GPS and the Internet. There had to be another way to get through Pittsburgh. Joseph traced his thumb around the city. He would have to backtrack thirty or forty miles to go around the city. Shit! That added a good chunk of time to his journey. Time he didn't have. Every moment he didn't have patient zero, the chances for stopping the virus diminished. Joseph nervously inched his glasses up his nose. He'd really screwed this up. What was I thinking, trying to go through the city? It had been quarantined and now abandoned. He threw the car into reverse and checked his rearview mirror. A tan Humvee stuck out into his lane on the left. Where did that army truck come from? That wasn't there before. He looked in his side mirror. Neither was the camouflage-clad man quickly approaching his door with a gun. The man stopped short. Put your hands on your head! Joseph put his hands on his head and turned to look at the man over his shoulder. Are you infected? The soldier screamed. His gun hovered a foot from the back of Joseph's head. The door ripped open. Joseph found himself face down on the ground. The soldier frisked him and flipped him over. Please, let me go, Joseph eked out. He covered his face. The soldier grabbed his hands and zip-tied them together. The soldier patted him down and shoved his hands in Joseph's pockets. Why are you here? The soldier asked. Another soldier's back was to them. Both men were young. The partner's gun bounced from angle to angle as he checked for threats. Let's hurry this up, the other soldier said. He glanced nervously over his shoulder. Give me a minute, will you? Joseph's captor said. Joseph turned his head to the side so he could talk without eating the concrete. Official business. I am trying to find a vaccine. Hands dug into his shoulders, and the soldier rolled him over onto his back. The soldier was a plain kid with big ears. Did you come from Colonel Rossman's camp? The soldier's eyes darted around the area. His name tag read Henderson. I don't know who that is, Joseph said. Henderson rammed a hand into Joseph's pants pocket, fingers grasping around. I am on official government business. You must release me. We all are, aren't we, Pope? Henderson quipped. He smiled at his partner. We sure are. I'll check his car, Pope said. He opened the back door and dug through Joseph's meager cash. You must listen, he started. I am a doctor. The soldier stopped digging through his car. Henderson gave him a sidelong glance, his ill-fitting helmet sliding to the side of his head. His ears seemed to hold the helmet in place. A doctor, huh? Henderson said. Pope raised a lip at them both. Colonel will want to see him. A burst of machine gun fire erupted from the Humvee's mounted gun. Henderson's radio buzzed. We got a lot of Zulus coming our way. Not the first time we've heard the doctor's story, but the colonel will set you straight one way or another. For your sake, you better be telling the truth. Joseph squirmed in his zip ties. Gunfire reverberated off the front of the containers. Joseph had no choice but to let himself be pushed for the Humvee. Dead flesh paraded through the abandoned vehicles, every step bringing them closer. Joseph stole a final glance at his small car, all alone, missing its driver. Henderson shoved him into the back seat of the Humvee. A soldier in tan boots shuffled his feet in the middle as he rotated his turret. Brass shells tinkled down inside the Humvee as the man fired. Hurry up! Pope yelled from the driver's side, slapping the door of the Humvee. Henderson hustled to the other side of the vehicle. The fifty cal lit up again and punched bullets with a blazing fury into the infected. Bodies jolted and jerked as they collapsed, and the Humvee lurched into motion. Kinnick, Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia
Kinnick jogged down a dark stairwell of the Pentagon lit only by the greenish glow from the exit signs. It brought him back to his first experience with the Zulus. His heart rate sped up as the trauma played out in his mind. It was only by mere chance that Kinnick had made it inside the famous five-sided building. Luck and blood are the only reason I'm here. Weeks prior, Kinnick had been sitting in his office in the Department of State's headquarters known as the Woodrow Wilson Building, mulling over rebel leader Colonel Kosoko's personality profile. Unstable, psychopathic behaviors, and he reveres his son. Alarm bells started blaring, high-pitched dings echoing throughout his office. The alarms were accompanied by a white flashing light, as if the wall was taking his picture. Great, just what we need, Kinnick said. His tone was harsher than he intended. It had been an extremely stressful few days, as the administration had attempted to rectify numerous situations under the radar. He closed the report and flipped it onto his rich wooden desk. Jackie, I don't have time for this, he shouted out at his personal aide. She peered at him worriedly over the wall of her cubicle. She was a timid mouse peering from her hole. He ignored the alarms and picked up another report. You hear me? he shouted again. She nodded and ducked below her cubicle wall. His mind was on autopilot now. He had been over these documents multiple times and still could not pull all the pieces together. What is this guy doing so far from his home base? He can't possibly think he would be successful in a coup unless the government is weaker than our analysts are reporting. Pictures of Kinnick's family were stuck on the wall, along with a series of photographs of him in a jumpsuit in front of C-130s. Smiling faces looked down on him. Over the sirens, he could hear his deputy officer, David Holland's voice. He opened a vanilla folder holding the last report on his mission. He read it for the one hundredth time. The CIA agents are unaccounted for, the embassy staff are on a flight bound from a Cone International Airport with counterterrorism agents providing security. I should be breathing a sigh of relief, not fucking losing my mind. Something was very wrong. The fire alarm's bright white flash clamored for his attention. It's as if they'd know I have things I need to do. He grabbed his sport coat from the back of his chair and threw it over his arm in preparation to leave the building. Deputy Officer Holland ran into his office. His graying hair glistened, and he breathed heavily, as if he had been running a race. Jesus, David, what were you doing, working out at lunch? Kinnick said. David was the lieutenant colonel on a tour of duty at the State Department. Kinnick wanted to laugh at the man with his red cheeks, sweat running down his forehead. No, sir. David breathed hard, trying to get enough oxygen. Isn't the physical fitness test next quarter? Kinnick said. David raised a fatigued hand, cutting him off. Thank God you're here. There's a group of people trying to get inside the building. We have been ordered to remove you and the other undersecretaries now. As his second reached for his sleeve, Kinnick dodged him, his smile turning sour. This is no time for a joke. We have a lot on our plate right now. Anger elevated in his chest. The DSS agents are in the hall, David said quietly. He glanced back at the door. Seriously, we don't have time for this. We can't work while they try to push some bullshit fire drill on us. People stood in their cubicles. His staff's eyes were drawn to him. The staff that had come in. A flu had stricken his office. Either that or they were getting their leave in before the end of the summer. They watched the interaction and whispered to one another. Our careers are on the line, Kinnick whispered to David. This is not a joke, Michael, David breathed his eyes shifting to the gathering crowd. Under his breath, he murmured, The secretary is already gone. The threat is real. Two tense-looking men in suits entered the office, DSS agents. Providing protective details was one of the Diplomatic Security Service agents' official functions. The two agents did not look comfortable with their current assignment. I don't expect them to know what's at stake, but you do. Kinnick pointed a finger at David. But I'll humor them. Trying to appear unworried, Kinnick walked briskly through his office. His staff scattered out of his way. They gathered their purses and briefcases in their hands. Jackie approached him, worry set in her deep brown eyes hidden behind glasses. She held files close to her chest, as if they would protect her from whatever was going on downstairs. What's going on? Should we try to leave? She said. 
She glanced at the door, her nerves showing. Kinnick regarded the door quickly and shook his head. No, no, stay here until this blows over. My evacuation is only a precaution. She looked him in the eyes and bit her lip. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow, she said. I will see you tomorrow, he said in a fatherly tone. He gave her shoulder a squeeze. That would be the last time he saw her. David practically carried him out of the office. Hold on, damn it, he chided, removing his arm from David's grasp. Michael, please, David hissed. Kinnick bared his teeth at him. The staff is watching. Show some self-control. David grimaced, peering over Kinnick's shoulder, and he smiled at the people watching. Kinnick threw his sport coat on. It's not like the world is ending. He walked with resolve into the hallway, confident that this would all be over soon. The DSS agent's faces could have fooled him. The two men scanned either end of the hall. Their guns weren't drawn, but Kinnick knew when men were on edge. These agents teetered on the precipice. Under Secretary Kinnick, we have to hurry. The special agent C-clamped Kinnick's arm to get him running, and Kinnick picked up his feet as they sped up. The two agents placed him between them and jogged on the hallway, coats flapping behind them. Kinnick had no choice but to follow suit and run. The agent on the left spoke as they ran. We are taking you to the Third Street exit. C Street is closed off. Their dress shoes clicked off the floors and echoed down the hallway. They skipped steps as they hastened down flights of stairs. The lead agent planted a shoe into the exit bar of the lobby door, and they burst into the huge entrance of the Department of State. Beautiful spiral green, white, and gray marble covered the floors and crawled up the sides of a permanent check-in station. Turnstiles were placed evenly to either side of the station, where employees could scan their work badges to gain access to the building. Along a walkway above the lobby, flags of every nation stood at attention. Journalists would report in front of them when broadcasting from inside the building. On their left, glass windows opened up to a large courtyard where employees would often eat lunch. A huge steel statue of the globe centered it. Gunfire exploded, resonating between the marble walls and Kinnick flinched. The DSS agents drew their firearms that had been holstered beneath their coats. Each agent put a rough hand on Kinnick's back, shoving him down to make him a smaller target. Kinnick knelt down. The agents unleashed shockwaves of gunfire. The sound washed over Kinnick and reverberated in the pristine environment like an earthquake. Violence was the polar opposite of the building's purpose. This was a bastion of peace, a common ground for Americans and non-Americans to come together to make progress in creating a stable world, not a place of brutality. Kinnick looked about in a daze. A uniformed security officer fell on his back and concentrated his fire on the closest assailant. The man wore the blue power suit and tie of a government employee. His mouth hung open and blood ran down from his lips, dripping onto his mellow gold tie and white dress shirt. Tap, tap, tap. The assailant's torso flinched as bullets entered his flesh and exited his back. He absorbed the bullets like a sponge absorbs water. Glass at the front door is spiderweb behind him. The officer let his gun rip until the assailant lunged onto him, his arms flailing. They wrestled and rolled back and forth in a mortal struggle. The officer screamed in pain as the man's mouth clamped down upon his forearm. Red liquid spurted from the wound onto the officer, the man, and the floor. His partner stood by, paralyzed. Shoot them! screamed one of the agents. Pointing his handgun with one hand, he fired into the bloody scrum. Another assailant dropped to his knees, biting the officer's ankle. We have to leave, David yelled into Kinnick's ear. The DSS agent pulled him up by his arm. Sir, now! The agent screamed at him. Kinnick's body felt numb, like he was in a dream state. The screams, gunshots, blood, all blurred in a frantic frenzy to escape. A heavy hand pushed him into a stairwell, and they hustled down the steps as fast as their feet would go. When they reached the bottom, one of the agents called into his cufflink microphone. Kinnick found himself huffing. What the hell is going on? He breathed. The DSS agent's eyes glanced back from Kinnick to the door. Sir, be quiet, he croaked. Side door 12, the other agent said into his cufflink mic. David's eyes were wide in fright. He stared frantically from one agent to the other. The door above them slammed shut, 
and heels clapped down the steps. Help me, a woman squeaked. She stumbled down the last steps in her heels. The rear agent grabbed her and pushed her away from Kinnick, putting a gun in her face. Oh my God, please, she pleaded. Driven by fear, her hands covered her face. Don't move. The agent held her in the corner, arm extended. She sobbed into his arm. Tears fell like rain from her cheeks. I, 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 I please help me. Her head twisted around, emotions overtaking her. Agent, release her, Kinnick commanded. He placed a hand on the agent's shoulder. She nodded furiously. Tarek was acting crazy, uncontrollable. He bit me, and he chased me down the hall. On cue, a pounding boomed through the stairwell. The woman shrieked in fear. Fists beat the door in a fury. Sir? Someone bit her? What the hell is going on here? All Kennett could think of was his staff upstairs. He'd left them in danger. Their active shooter training isn't going to help them out of this. She can't come with us, the agent said. She looked pale, her blue dress making her look like a child's doll. The agent released her. She squeezed her forearm where she presumably had been bitten. Bright red blood oozed out around her fingertips. She sat down on the stair and sobbed. My arm hurts so bad, she whimpered. She hugged herself. If Kinnick had thought the agents would let him, he would race back up the stairs now to his floor and gather his staff. Instead, he bent down, taking her hand. What's your name? Emma. Her voice was quiet. Everything is going to be okay, Emma. You are coming with us. Tears fell off her face. <laughs> Thank you, she sniffled. She comes with us, he told the lead agent. No, it's against regulations, the agent said. She comes with us, or I'm not going with you, Kinnick responded. The agents exchanged looks. Car's here. Get ready to run. Don't stop for anything, the lead agent said. Emma breathed raggedly behind them and uttered a violent, wet cough. The agent kicked the door open and the sun blinded them. The rear agent's hand dug into Kinnick's shoulder, propelling him in the direction of a black suburban. As his eyes adjusted to the outside, a handful of people turned for them. Kinnick's detail ran for the vehicle. It was a race for the door. Everything happened in a jostling blur. A man dragged his leg behind him, flesh and bones sticking through his dress slacks. A woman in a business suit reached for the lead agent. Fresh, dark blood soaked through her white shirt. The crowd wobbled on their feet as they made for Kinnick. The lead agent capped rounds into the people clustering around the SUV. Their bodies shook, but they weren't phased by the hot lead. Must be hitting them. We're too close to miss. They won't go down, screamed the lead agent. The people ignored the bullets as if they were mere pellets. Kinnick made eye contact with the woman as she shuffled in his direction. She never blinked. All color had fled from her eyes, leaving a milk-whitish hue where her irises should have been. Kinnick was shoved past the lead agent, his gun still blazing, into the back seat of the black suburban. Kinnick crawled on his hands and knees, and Emma scrambled behind him. David threw himself next to her. The rear agent squeezed into the back seat. The door slammed closed. The lead agent ran for the front passenger side door, only to get caught by the group of people. They pinned him to the side of the car, their sheer weight holding him in place. He screamed as a woman with a tight professional bun dug her teeth into his neck. The woman tore out part of his neck, and a fountain of blood spewed onto the window. It poured down the window and collected in the sill. The agent slapped the window. Go, go, go! Kinnick screamed at the driver. The driver threw the SUV into reverse. Kinnick death-gripped the headrest of the seat in front of him. They left the gathering crowd of people. A wet thud thumped, and bodies flew off the back bumper of the car. People collapsed onto the concrete. Kinnick gaped out the window. A man had left a path of blood and flesh in his wake. The concrete stripped the skin from his bones. The mangled man sat straight up and reached out broken fingers bent in all directions. Most of the left side of his face was road rash. Red blood poured down his neck onto his clothes. His nose hung by a fleshy strap like an unclipped chin guard on a football helmet. His eyes had burst free in impact and now dangled like two bloody golf balls. The driver gunned the SUV, leaving the mangled people and flew down C Street going 70 miles per hour. The SUV launched over a hill, 
everyone in the vehicle leaving their seats for a moment until it set back down with a violent bounce. The driver braked a tad, and the back wheel swerved. Kinnick leaned into the front seat. What the hell is going on? This isn't a terrorist attack. Those people all work around here, he yelled. Sweat dripped down the driver's jawline. He steered wildly around a car abandoned in the middle of the road. Sir, I have no idea. Please put your seatbelt on and sit back. Kinnick sat back. He looked over at David and Emma. Her head slumped down, chin on her chest. Kinnick went into hero mode. Emma, are you okay? Emma. He gently placed a hand on her shoulder and shook her. David put an arm around her shoulder. It's going to be okay, he said. He looked over her head at Kinnick, shrugging slightly. He didn't know what was going on with her either. Emma's head bobbed upright like a puppet's. Let me see your arm, all right, Kinnick said. Emma turned to Kinnick as if hearing him for the first time. Her eyes were a blank, cloudy mess, like a snowstorm of the pupil. She lunged for Kinnick. Her hands grasped for a suit. What's wrong with you? he shouted. He thrust his forearms into her neck. David wrapped his arms around her body, holding her down. The agent fumbled with his gun behind David. I can't get a shot, the agent shouted. Emma swung her head like a tormented dog, teeth mashing together, flailing her arms in a struggle to get free. Everyone yelled at once, and eventually Emma was pushed face first into the passenger seat of the Suburban. She clawed the dash with her fingernails and pulled herself upright, her legs kicking at David. The rear agent braced himself on the driver's seat and fired rounds into her head. The driver veered, unable to control the car as the bullets exited her head and sprayed brain matter onto the windshield, webbing the glass. She slumped over the center console, legs spread straight out into the back seat. Holy shit! The driver shouted. Kinnick brought himself under control. The woman had been attacked, bitten, and then she turned into a crazed maniac. Holy shit! The driver screamed again. The driver busted over a curb. Red signs with white lettering warned them, Wrong way. They sped down the wrong way of the key bridge. On the other side, a long snake of traffic stood still, with thousands of people fleeing the district. Is everyone okay? Kinnick shouted, his voice sounding muffled by the ringing in his ears. The agent nodded, dumbfounded. You okay? Kinnick said, looking at David. Yeah, I'm good. David held up his hands, sticky blood drenching them. He wiped his brow, smearing blood across his forehead. That's when Kinnick saw the wound on his David's hand. A chunk had been taken out of the meat of his palm. Your hand, Kinnick said. David stared at it. Did she bite me? He whispered. Wrap it in this. Kinnick ripped a piece off the woman's dress and shoved the rest of her into the front seat. I can't believe that bitch bit me, David said. A long, iconic building rose up on their left. Take us to the Pentagon. David, hold on. We're going to get you help, Kinnick said. He hit speed dial on his phone. Get me General Travis. Steel, Mountains of West Virginia Steel leapt with all his might. He shifted his shoulders and grazed the barrel of the shotgun with his free hand, offsetting it away from his face. The shotgun exploded an inch from the side of his head. Concussions from the blast rocked the room. He took the barrel of the shotgun and shoved it hard into the man's shoulder. At the same time, he brought his knife up to the man's neck. They toppled to the floor. The stock of the gun pushed into Steele's gut, and the knife flew from his hand. Steele swung his leg over the man's waist and scrambled into the mounted fighting position. The man bucked his hips, and Steele locked his legs around the man's body. Steel rained fists down on the man's face. He didn't land every punch he threw, but he didn't need to. Only enough punches to keep the man on the defensive. The man's eyes went large as Steele buried a knuckle into his right eye. P Please, stop! The man sputtered. His hands covered his face, attempting to deflect the strikes. Stop! Steele dove from atop the man and grabbed his knife. He held it to the man's neck. The man held his hands above his face, his face beat red from the fight. Steele's chest heaved. He pressed the knife into the man's skin and let the blade sink in. 
his mind running on autopilot. The front door creaked. The wood announced newcomers with groans. Deep guttural moans penetrated the house from the outside. Their voices seemed to groan, We are here. Let us in. Steele jumped off the man and snatched up the mossy oak camouflage shotgun. The man scrambled backward against the wall. Shut the fuck up for a minute. Steele racked the shotgun, pumping it up and down. He flipped the gun upside down, fingering the loading flap into the magazine tube. His finger met no resistance, meaning the shotgun held only one shell. Do you have any more shotgun shells? Steele asked. Infected fists met the wood of the door. More hands joined the first. The man wiped his nose of leaking blood. Why should I tell you, asshole? He said. He spit some blood onto the floor. The man was long-limbed with the body of a runner. Because I'm the one with the gun. Steele rested the hunting shotgun on his knee and pointed it at the man from the hip. Screw you. You might as well just shoot me because when they break in, it'll be over. Anger boiled over, indifference in the man's eyes. He's right. Tight spaces are their friend. This man is my only friend. Sorry. The man humped and averted his eyes to the front door. I didn't know anyone still lived here and I was scared, Steele said. He secured his knife and stood up, crossing the bedroom. Tell me about it, the man said. His eyes grew fearful with distrust as Steele got closer. Steele offered a hand to him. Most people call me Steele. The man looked at his hand like Steele had offered him a piece of garbage. I used to be a counterterrorism agent for the division. The man wiped his nose again as fresh blood replaced the old. I will assume you don't work there anymore, the man sneered. The division. Sounds like something a guy would make up so his victims sound crazy when they call the police. Uh, yeah, some shadowy secret agent robbed me and said it's for the good of America. Steele cracked a smile. I'm not going to rob you, but I need your help, he said, gesturing with his head at the door. The man gave him an untrusting look, but took his hand and stood up. I'm Kevin. The short-haired man was youthful-looking, but the wrinkles around his eyes told Steele Kevin was in his thirties. A loose West Virginia sweatshirt hung limp on his slender frame. I only have a few slugs left. The door pressed in a crack as the body pushed up against it. I'm open to suggestions, Steele said. I got some tools in the shed out back. Kevin rose his eyebrows. Steele nodded. After you, kind sir, he said. They tiptoed to the back of the home. Kevin slid the glass door open and stepped outside, followed closely by Steele. An infected woman stood between them and the shed like a pale shade in the mountain night. The woman was completely nude, and the shape of her rounded hips and hourglass figure mesmerized them for a moment. She noticed them, and her mouth hung open, her hand raising in a slow manner. Her gait was awkward, and she struggled to move her feet with purpose. She stumbled as she walked, toes catching on rocks. As she got closer, it was apparent she had been bitten on the neck, a single bite, as if she had been nipped by her lover. Kevin gulped. Her dead eyes looked through them, and Steele charged and shoved his knife through her eye. Her naked body slumped on the ground, still. Come on, he whispered, his voice harsh. They yanked open the shed doors. Steele would prefer to snipe the bastards from far away, but he didn't have enough shells and gunfire would only draw more in. His hand inspected wooden shafts. They rustled as he ran his hand along the tools. He gripped a wooden half tight. Steele hefted the axe in both hands, a common wood-cutting tool. Time for a nice melee, Steele said, flipping his axe around in a circle. He never liked to fight, but he was always prepared to win one. The melee used to be a part of medieval tournaments, except we aren't medieval knights. We don't have armor or horses, Kevin said. Well, let's give them an old-fashioned ass whooping anyway, Steele replied. The two comrades snuck around the house. The sounds of the infected assault echoed into the forest. They're going to draw more in, Kevin whispered. Steele peered around the corner. The undead were piled on the front door. Their bodies smashed against one another as they pressed in to get inside. 
No time like now, Steele said, and charged for them. It didn't matter if Kevin followed him or not, because the fight was on. He gave a high-pitched whistle as he closed on the first infected man. Steele took him down with an overhead strike. The wood axe cleaved into the man's skull and split him open like a melon. The man collapsed, and with a foot on his chest, Steele ripped his axe from the infected. Kevin ran past him, a shovel held overhead, and smashed it down on an infected skull. He followed with a spear-like jab into the forehead of another. Steele raced past him, and they hacked, smashed, and chopped the walking dead until they were dead, dead again. Steele breathed heavy through his nose, and Kevin bent over, hands on his knees. His cheeks were still red. A smile crawled on Steele's lips. Kevin gave him a nod of his head. Kevin can fight. You swing that shovel with some conviction, Steele said. As the Welsh saying goes, anger is as good as skill in a fight. Kevin said with a smile. They quietly made their way to the front door. Steele turned the doorknob, and it opened. Door's been open the whole time, fellas, Steele said down at the bodies. He didn't realize how bad he was until he was back inside. Steele's head swam with pain. He plopped down on Kevin's couch and held a hand to his eyes. The pounding inside his skull was relentless. Kevin sat down next to him and handed him a clear glass with a mahogany-colored liquid inside. Steele smelled it, his nose hovering above the glass. Whiskey, dark brown and rich. Rye? Steele asked. Ha! Yeah, man. Madam Scarlet Gray's whiskey. Ulysses S. Grant's favorite. Same recipe. Steele took a long drink of the rye. It was smooth and singed Steele's throat a touch at the very end like someone held a match flame near the back of his mouth. Steele grimaced a bit and nodded his head. That's good. Lucky for us I didn't dump this one on my head wound, he said with a half laugh. They sat in silence for about ten minutes, letting the alcohol dampen the adrenaline from their slaughter. Kevin broke the silence by throwing a log into the wood stove furnace in the corner. I see that my clothes fit you terribly. Steele snorted a laugh. Well, I started in my underwear, so be thankful that I am wearing anything at all. Kevin rose a hand. Keep them. I'd rather not imagine us wrestling with you in your underwear. He sat back down and poured Steele another glass. How'd you get here? Steele took a long sip of the whiskey. It burnt his throat more this time. I woke up practically naked in a ditch. My friends were gone, and I had a hole in my head. Gone? Sounds like some bad friends. They wouldn't have left me by choice, Steele said. They stared at the flames together. Where are you from? Kevin asked. D.C. I came in on a flight from Africa where a bunch of the passengers became infected. We had a hell of a fight on our hands. We killed a lot of people. Shoot people on a plane? Where did you get guns? Steele looked over in his direction. I wasn't kidding about being a fed, but it got bad when they left us for dead at Macomb. Me and a few of my fellow agents escaped Virginia with a doctor. I just can't remember what happened when we got here. Steele took a long pull of the whiskey. The alcohol numbed the pain in his head, muffling the drums. So that whole division bullshit you fed me isn't BS? You guys, like, fight terrorists or something? Steele shrugged a bit. Sometimes. Track them, find them, fight them. The usual. Wow, that must be a bang-up job, Kevin said. Not as glamorous as you would think. Long hours, lots of assholes. How about yourself? Well, I've been hiding out here since they closed the schools. I used to be a history teacher at Jefferson High School about ten miles up the road. I'd only seen one or two of those things before you showed up. Hit them in the head and bury them out back. Is it true what they are saying? The whole East Coast is infected? Steele stared at the fire through the wood furnace door. Yes. Kevin's voice shook as he spoke. I meant not everybody. Everybody can't be infected. Tens of millions. Every one of us that dies joins their team. Every person bitten joins them, and it happens fast. Just one of those things, and a group of people could infect everyone in a matter of a minute. I've read plenty of world-ending events in history. Shit, open the Bible. There have been plagues, disasters, famines, war, huge migrations of people. 
but it hasn't been until recently that the world has been so interconnected. Never anything like this. It's happening, and we are losing. Kevin ran a hand through his hair, reciting his story. They closed the school down after so many people became sick. Everyone raided the grocery stores for everything by the time the day was over. That's why I was down the road at my neighbor's. No idea where they went, so I dug through their stuff and grabbed some essentials. You know, mostly food. Oh, yeah, and I found some gas for my car out there. Steele leaned his head back. Gas, gas, gas. Dude, are you okay? Kevin asked. Ah! Steele massaged his temples. Pain struck deep in his mind. What did you say? It hurt him to think. Kevin looked concerned. I said I got gas for my car. Are you all right? Steele looked back at Kevin, hardly able to see him in the dim firelight of the stove. Gas. That was it. Everything crashed upon him at once. We were in our mobile lounge when we came upon a woman stranded on the side of the road. She was probably twenty, pretty, showing a lot of cleavage. Me and my friend, a doctor, went to see if we could help, and someone shot me from the trees. Lucky for me, they were a little off, Steele said, closing his eyes. Kevin drank his whiskey greedily. There is something about that girl, though, something distinctive. I just can't put my finger on it, Steele said. Kevin shook his head. I wouldn't put it past anyone around here. Steele patted the bandages running around his head. It was her laugh. Her laugh was this high-pitched cackle or something. You know, like a witch's, but higher. Steele took another sip of his drink, letting the whiskey burn just enough to know he was drinking, but not enough to hurt his throat. That's all I got. A damn laugh. Wait. Did she tell you her name? Kevin said. Mmm. I can't remember. Lindsay, Kelly, Brittany, something like that. Did she have a mole on her cheek? I just can't remember. Ashley, maybe? Kevin stood up. Ashley O'Neill, he uttered, his face dropping. She's, huh, was a student of mine a few years ago. He fell back down to the couch. She was always hanging around a bad crowd. A couple of guys that were known for being rough. Puck Roberts, Casey and Henry Barnum, Chuck Connolly. They distill their hoots on Backbone Peak. Everyone knows to stay away from there. Sheriff doesn't even mess with those guys, he said, voice weakening at the end. You know where Backbone Peak is? Yeah, I do, Kevin said cautiously. Do you have any camouflage? Um, uh, it's West Virginia. You and me are going to be good friends, Kevin. Steele leaned back, getting comfortable on the couch. He watched the fire, waves of exhaustion crashing into him. I catch some Z's, because tomorrow we're going to check in on your friends. Kevin gave him a weak smile and tipped his glass back. Kinnick, Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia Kinnick nodded to a few Pentagon police officers who were carrying equipment to the roof. No more than sixty men and women remained of the uniformed police force. As first responders, they'd been attacked and driven inside, and that was only the beginning. The officers were followed by some overweight defense contractors. Everyone had to pull their own weight now. No sitting, no idleness. Each day could be your last. Kinnick walked down the center of one of the Pentagon's corridor rings, passing glass cases holding General MacArthur's soft service cap and five-star uniform. Two sliding doors glided apart, and he stepped into a corridor much nicer than the rest. Joint Chiefs of Staff Army Wing. Fine dark wood lined the walls. Emblems of each of the branches of service were inlaid within the granite floors themselves. He stopped at a large conference room. The door was covered with fancy engravings. The greatest military in the nation is confined inside its beautiful headquarters. A major sat at a desk. The name tag on her light blue uniform read Holt. General Travis is waiting for you, she said. 
He gave her the best smile he could muster. Thank you, Major. Her left cheek rose a bit in return. She looked down at her desk. Smiles suit you better, he said. She looked up and gave him a better one. How can you expect me to smile at a time like this? You could be on rooftop duty with me. She stifled a grin. I guess it could be worse, she said, looking down at her desk. We have more bad reports coming in. Outbreaks inside? No, she whispered. Then we're doing better than yesterday. Her lips flattened as she tried to maintain her composure. We will get through this, he said. His mind mocked him. Remember when you told Jackie everything was going to be fine? She's rotting somewhere now. Yes, sir, we will, Major Holt said. He nodded to her and pressed down on the flat gold door handle. Major General Travis brooded on the other end of the room, gazing at a digital map displayed on the wall. It was out of place in the regally decorated room, seeming more in line for a computer hacker than a military general. The 62-year-old general's short cropped hair was white on the sides, turning an ashy gray on top. His hands were clasped firmly behind his back. His aides, a captain and a lieutenant, raced back and forth, bringing him reports. General Travis no longer wore his dress Navy Blue Army service uniform, but had opted for the Universal Combat ACUs. These are the times that try a men's soul, General Travis muttered. He took a deep breath, staring at the map displayed in front of him. I wonder what Thomas Paine would have said about this mess. He would have said that this was no place for the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot, Kinnick said. He clenched his jaw at his words. Am I a winter soldier? General Travis continued to weigh the dismal map before him. I am sure he would. Any headway in the roof operations? The general never lifted his eyes from the map. Kinnick had the urge to stand at attention, but knew that it was not necessary. He settled for holding his hands in front of his body. We're tossing anything heavy enough to put a hole in someone's head. It seems to be working to a certain extent, but the infected are never-ending. Travis looked over his shoulder at Kinnick. His eyes beat his brow ridge for space. Any helicopters from Mount Eden? Langley? Kinnick frowned. No, sir. None in sight. Travis turned back to the map. Large red X's sat over military bases in the region, including Andrews Air Force Base, the next most likely place to acquire aid. Further west, a circle sat around Mount Eden. General Travis turned around and began flipping papers over on the table. As you already know, the Pentagon is a large contingency facility with stores of food to last people months, especially as our numbers decrease. This place is not a fortress, but a giant contained city. Kinnick nodded. He was no novice. The Mount Eden facility was vital to our survival, Travis said. Kinnick interrupted. I know that, sir, but those doors down there are built to withstand nuclear bomb blasts. Fifty thousand people couldn't push their way in here. We— General Travis cut him off, looking up at him. I do not mean our survival here, Colonel. I mean our survival as a species. This epidemic is global. Our forces have been eradicated abroad. We've lost all communications with General Benner at CENTCOM and General Walters in Stuttgart. Europe has gone dark, Africa is dark, Asia is dark, Australia has been overrun with refugees, South America is overrun, only the furthest outposts of northern Canada remain untouched by this plague. You get the picture, right? We may only have one shot at beating this thing. That is why we have fought so hard to hold here. We are quickly becoming it. He emphasized the word. His steel-colored eyes traced a line on the map. If we lose... Mankind loses. America has always been the bastion of hope for the future. Now it is time for it to fulfill its promise. Others will hold, but it's only a matter of time. Look at the map. General Travis moved to the side to allow Kinnick a full view. The general tapped the corner of the map, and it zoomed out into a much larger map of the United States. He jabbed at key points on the map, dragging his finger to scroll over the terrain. He slid the map low to the distinguishable outline of Texas. We have portions of the 1st Armored Division operating out of Fort Bliss, Texas. 
He scrolled his fingers to the top right. The 76th and 63rd Armor Regiments are moving west. I'm guessing to Colorado. We could request assistance from the 59th Striker Brigade Combat Team under Colonel Hartman, stellar soldier. But General Dunbar can't spare them. Traveling overland, they may not exist by the time they get here. We could try and hold an airport down and fly them up, but I can't risk leaving the safety of this building. I do not have the vehicles to make a run for it. I've got National Guard units running failing quarantine operations at every major city in the U.S. He widened the map, dragging two fingers apart. I do not see these as feasible options at our current rate of attrition. Peterson Air Force Base is operating in Colorado, but let's just put it this way. We aren't getting much feedback. The map was a grim realization of the dire predicament they were in. Can we pull a National Guard unit south from Philly or east from Pittsburgh? Bring down some troop transports? Kinnick asked. Pittsburgh still had a circle around it. The quarantine of both D.C., Baltimore, and every eastern seaboard city had X's through them. General Travis coughed onto his hand, looking even older than his age. Sending units east would be suicide at this point. I'm pretty sure the president would veto any moves like that. It looks like the commander-in-chief wants his forces west. It doesn't surprise me. I would have done the same thing, but it doesn't help us much either. We are deep inside enemy territory now. No one can relieve us? Kinnick asked. He stole a glance at the map. A question mark hung over Mount Eden to the west. No more than the Wildcats can win a Super Bowl. We are being whittled away, Colonel. We need a game changer. You and me both know Virginia is lost. Kinnick grimaced. General Travis's words stung. Not because he had a great affiliation with Virginia, but because his family was out there when it all happened. He had left a hasty voicemail to his wife about leaving town or coming to the Pentagon. She never returned his call. His children had been at school when the outbreak started. He hadn't heard anything. He knew in his heart they were gone. How could they possibly survive this? He tried not to think of them out there, cold, dead, alone. At night, he would lay awake crying as he stared at the ceiling, wondering if it was even worth going on. General Travis saw the look on his face, and a moment of sympathy crossed his creased features. It was there and past, only a memory of empathy. The only thing that remained in the general was a hard resolve, a man with a righteous sense of duty, a man who knew his duty would bring about his demise, but marched forward anyway. Hell is not conquered easily. No, sir, it isn't, Kinnick said, staring down at the table below them. We need something that can win this, something that gives our people hope to continue the fight. Travis paused, eyeing Kinnick. A pang of doubt crossed his face, uncharacteristic for a man of his standing. Kinnick knew this. He knew what was at stake. I don't know if you were briefed on this, but Mount Eden had a collection of scientists working on a cure for this disease. Some of the top authorities in medicine, virology, and whatever other experts they could piece together from the region, and now we have no communications with them. We may have the only facility left that could support finding one. The severity of the situation shone in the general's eyes. As if the loss of troops and supplies weren't enough, most of the leading scientists could have perished inside Mount Eden. America's fate was spiraling down the drain. Tell me about it, Dr. Joukowsky, Travis asked. Kinnick frowned. I'm sorry, I don't recall the name. I have a report here from before the outbreak that you helped orchestrate an operation to escort our diplomats and embassy staff out of the U.S. Embassy in Kinshasa. There was a doctor with them, Dr. Joukowsky, that was at the Mount Eden facility, and he may have found patient zero. A team of the scientists from USAMRED are claiming if they can get their hands on patient zero, we've got a shot. Fort Dietrich is still operational? No, but they have a small contingent here, and a few more remote locations for continuity of operations. I authorized the Kinshasa mission. Nasty business with some counterterrorism agents. I never received the update on their mission status. General Travis gave him a firm nod. The mission was completed. Dr. Joukowsky made it to Mount Eden. The problem is, he's missing. Steel. Backbone Peak. West Virginia. Steele gently moved a branch from his view. 
He was deathly quiet, and his movements were slow and calculated. The hunter must move cautious and deliberate, for prey spook easy. The human eye catches off color and movement the most easily when searching for enemies. His borrowed camouflage and setting up in the night provided him with the greatest defense from detection from his hillside position. Steele and Kevin sat in a makeshift blind of branches, leaves, clumps of moss, and dirt. It reminded Steele of deer hunting. The smell of wood fire floated up to them from the camp below. Few people moved about the camp. Kevin sat dejected and sullen, head low on his chest. Steele had to practically drag the high school teacher by the neck up to the ridge. Steele watched Kevin for a moment. No, he is no coward. He is just scared. Steele touched his knee. He mouthed, keep a lookout. There is no point in them both going up there if Steele was going to be doing all the work by himself. He was nervous, too. The terrain was foreign to him. Every jagged rock, leafy shrub, sappy pine, and deer path was outside his knowledge base. This was someone else's backyard. The people below knew this land like the back of their hand. He was the intruder. He was the invader that disrupted their land. Any one piece of the terrain could betray him at any moment, including Kevin. All were familiar to the men and women in the camp below. He didn't have a team of professionals at his back. He didn't have the equipment to fight any sort of battle. He didn't know how many assailants he was going to have to engage. He didn't know if Gwen was even there. The X Factor was the infected. If they stumbled upon them, they could kill them or give them up to the camp below. Each was its own unique death sentence. A choose-your-own-adventure where you lost every time. Steele ground his jaw. It sent pain through his healing skull. He refused to give in to the things that could go wrong, and he looked at all the things he had on his side. He was an excellent marksman and had extensive fighting experience. I've got an ally. I've got surprise. That counts for something. It will be enough. It has to be enough. The two men let the sun dip behind them, and he took a pair of binoculars from Kevin and gazed over the camp. Kevin spoke, his voice a small whisper. What do you see? Is Buck there? Steele scoured the scene below. Six small log cabins sat quietly on the hill. A man and a woman walked together. The man chased the woman into a cabin and closed the door. He's big, like six foot six or seven. Had a black beard the last time I saw. Kevin whispered. He rubbed his jaw and squinted as he watched the camp. Last time you saw him? Steele asked. Yeah, you know, around town, Kevin said quickly. A few men walked along the perimeter, but they weren't big enough. Nah, I don't see him, Steele said. That's good. He's a real asshole, Kevin said. Steele pried his eyes away from the scene. I don't care what he is. If he has Gwen, he's a dead man. Steele said. He's a cruel bastard. I'm not sure you understand. I don't care. Scanning, he saw two distilling sheds, partially covered with woodland camo tarps. Must be where they cooked up their moonshine. The tarps would prevent anybody who happened upon the camp from seeing the sheds. There was some sort of large hole in the far end of the camp, a few nightly bonfire pits. He stopped studying with his binoculars as he came across two men. There, in the middle. He handed Kevin the binoculars, who placed them up to his eyes. I see them. Two tied-up guys. That washed-up shirtless ginger with the tattoos chained to the poles, my friend Mauser. And that asshole next to him was Ahmed. Asshole? Kevin inquired. Not my favorite acquaintance, Steele said. I hate him, but if he shows me where Gwen is, I'll kiss him, I swear it. He rolled his eyes to the sky. You hear that, big guy? You can hold me to it. The faint crunch of leaves and clumsy feet in the trees below rolled up the mountainside. Kevin pointed out with his free hand. Steele took the binoculars back. Two infected approached the camp. They felt their way through the trees, exhausted and soulless. Nobody ran. Everyone continued about their hill business. A man stood almost thirty feet from where they walked. Steele was sure the moonshiners could see the dead. He felt the pucker effect, knowing that he was about to watch a man be murdered by the dead. The dead picked up their pace a fraction when they saw the man. One of the infected tangled himself in a near-invisible barbed wire. It struggled with the impediment, 
wrapping himself up in it like a spider web. The barbs tore its skin, hooking its flesh. The other crawled through the wire and got back on its feet. Steel tracked it as it marched, and with a single arm reached out for the nearest moonshiners. The moonshiner in the t-shirt didn't even react. The infected collapsed face first into a ditch. Interesting trap. I have an idea for the morning. I'm going to need your help. You have a pair of running shoes? Steele said with a grin. Kevin's eyes flared. I'm not going into the camp. Kevin crossed his arms across his chest. You won't have to. You'll be just fine. Gwen, Backbone Peak, West Virginia. Gwen lay on the stinking bed. A brownish-yellow stain stretched over the mattress, reaching for her. The damp and dirty mattress lumped up into her hip, leaving her back in perpetual discomfort. Her hands were stretched above her head and cuffed to the rusted heavy metal frame. She clinked her wrist over the flaking metal frame in a futile effort to free herself. She bent her neck backward to get a look at her restraints. Grasped in her hands was her bent, warped picture. She longed for the captured moment in time. Why can't I be back there? Drunken laughter filled the night, pummeling her will. Puck's big-bellied hoot roared above the others. They didn't seem to care that the infected might hear them. The fools would draw the dead right in on us. She sat upright, her arm awkwardly stretched behind her. How are we going to get out of this? I've got to have a plan. Her eyes searched the cabin for anything that could be used as a weapon. Wood sat in a pile near the fireplace. If I can get something to smash over his head, then I could escape. But these jackasses know these woods and these mountains, and we would be bringing along injured people. Doesn't matter. I can't wait here only to die. She pulled on the bed. It rattled as it moved. The heavy metal frame weighed down the whole thing. Grunting with exertion, she yanked on her cuffs, dragging the bed a tough inch. The woodpile jeered her from several feet away. Come on, you stupid thing, she whispered. She strained with effort. The bed groaned under her pressure. She stopped when the laughter ceased. The silence enveloped her. The lack of voices froze her in time. Why aren't they laughing? The door of the cabin creaked open. Oh, my God. A giant squeezed in through the doorway. The frame looked for more space. She shouldered the bed back and took a side roll into it. She wrapped herself into a ratty blanket, her handcuffs running along the frame. Holding her breath, she waited. See you tomorrow, he called out. Owen, don't forget to watch the fences, he slurred. The cabin door latched closed, and he lumbered across the floor, each heavy step causing the floorboards to grumble loudly in protest. Couldn't have seen me. She held her breath, but it forced itself out of her chest. Her heart thundered. Will he do it this time? She squeezed her eyes closed, trying not to breathe too hard. Please leave me be. Don't touch me. The flimsy mattress gave way to the large man as he lay down next to her. The bed bowed in the middle. She could feel the heat running off his body. He ran a robust finger down her shoulder. Her skin crawled beneath his touch, and she flinched as he flicked away the shoulder strap of her gown, letting it fall limply down her arm. No, please, she thought, not like this. The mattress complained beneath his weight like it may give up at any moment and collapse. The sour body odor and booze overpowered her senses. Soon he would overpower her physically with his body. She waited for it. Huck's breathing leveled out. Silence. Nothing happened. She chanced to glance over her shoulder. In the dark, his chest rose and fell in a routine pattern. She turned back away from him and exhaled in the darkness. Thank you, Lord. She didn't sleep as her mind ran through every scenario possible. I will escape. Joseph, Mount Washington, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Humvee sped for a side road, and the driver took it up a steep hill roadway. Old 19th-century homes decorated the hillside built during Pittsburgh's industrial rise. Joseph's head thumped against the window as they ran over corpses in the streets. At the top of the hill, they passed a red-brick church, then drove past a series of concrete barricades 
and taller concrete walls. A soldier stopped them at the chain-link fence gate. Movable barrier set to either side, ready to be rolled into place at a moment's notice. What do you got, Pope? You get that bottle of vodka? The guard asked. He looked in the back at Joseph. It's in the back. Henderson decided he'd pick up some doctor. Claims to be on a secret mission. The guard laughed. Sure thing, buddy. I'll get it you later, Pope said. Come on in. The guard waved them through. Pope steered them inside the base. They passed a dozen soldiers in full combat kit. Large tents were set up near the center of the camp. Pope took them down a lane and stopped. He gave Joseph a smirk. This be your stop, secret agent. Specialist Henderson hopped out after him. Don't drink all that vodka. I'll be back later, Henderson said to Pope. Whatever, bro. You drew the short straw on this one, Pope said. He spun the wheels as he drove off. Henderson sighed heavy. Come on, Doc. Henderson not very gently led Joseph in the direction of a big, drab, tan tent that sat on the edge of a steep cliff. Humvees drove in and out of a motor pool. They passed barrack-style tents, all seemingly the same. The camp boomed and the earth shook. Joseph dove for the ground, eating dirt in the process. He instinctually covered his ears with his elbows. After a moment, he looked up and around at Henderson. The young soldier stared down at him with a big, shit-eating grin on his face. First time around a 155 artillery piece, huh? Don't worry, you get used to it. Henderson yelled with a laugh. Here. Henderson offered Joseph a gloved hand and helped him up. See there? Henderson pointed to a group of tall artillery pieces. They were in a neat line, long barrels standing at salute along the mountaintop. Those are so loud, Joseph said. He gave the artillery pieces an untrusting look. Here, put these in, Henderson said handing Joseph a pair of neon-yellow foam earplugs. They looked used and worn. Joseph looked at them doubtfully. Sorry, pal, that's all I got. I'm not sick. And after he thought for a moment, not that I know of. Joseph stuffed the plugs in his ears anyway. Where are you taking me? Joseph said and stopped. You can untie me. I won't run away. You wouldn't have wanted to go into the quarantine zone anyway. Nobody usually comes back from there. Joseph glared and raised his hands up to be cut free. You wouldn't want to go where I came from either. The East Coast is overrun. It's only a matter of time before the infected make their way here. The color drained from Henderson's face. We'll get you untied, he said, sliding a knife out from his belt. He slit Joseph's zip ties and the thin plastic fell to the ground. I heard it was bad out there. I have a sister up in New York. I haven't heard from her in weeks. Henderson said. Joseph didn't respond. They walked in silence until they reached the command tent. The tent sat on the edge of a very steep cliff, leaving it free from infected assault on one side. Joseph also realized that meant they had no way to escape if they were overrun. The remains of Pittsburgh sprawled before him. A single large brown river flowed freely six hundred feet below them. The river split into two and a piece of land stuck out in the water like a defiant middle finger in the landscape. Skyscrapers jutted up from the city while dozens of bridges connected the surrounding hills to the city of Pittsburgh. The downtown was covered in thick black smoke. The man-made giants of steel and glass sat dark. A single gray building slouched, ready to collapse at any moment. The only signs of life were reflections of fire glowing in the windows that hadn't been shattered. Specialist Henderson stood alongside Joseph for a moment before he spoke. You are in quarantine base Rattlesnake. We are here to make sure nobody leaves Pittsburgh through the Fort Penn Tunnel. Henderson pointed at the rivers. The farthest one at the divide is the Allegheny. The one closest to us is the Monongahela. Where they connected together makes the Ohio. You see that there? His finger pointed to a large yellow-seated stadium sticking out on the side of the river. That was Heinz Field. They turned it into FEMA Facility Hope weeks ago. The boys call it Camp Hopeless. All of our wounded used to go over there and not come back. Now no one goes over there. He pointed in turn in each direction. We have three other quarantine staging areas around the city. Each group covers a sector. The landscape must have been a beautiful panorama before the outbreak. 
Bridge after bridge led out from the city center. Yellow, black, suspension, and high-rise bridges crossed the rivers. The city of bridges is what they call it, the most in the entire world, Henderson bragged. Wow, how do you know all of this? Grew up in Mount Lebanon about fifteen minutes away. Bleed black and gold. He was cut off by another barrage of artillery which thundered, shells clapping the air. Earth and concrete erupted on the other river bank across the river, launching debris hundreds of feet into the air. What are they shooting at? Joseph asked. Henderson looked at him, confusion in his eyes. They're shooting at the crazy people across the river. They pretty much shoot all day, until the barrels get too hot, then they take a break. A long, open-roofed barge that typically hauled coal up and down the rivers docked below. Men scrambled with supplies toward a red trolley car on the side of the mountain. What are they doing? Joseph asked. Henderson winked. That's the Duquesne Incline. We move supplies and people up and down the mountain that way. It's faster than driving around, and it keeps our shooting lanes clear. You see, since we blocked the Fort Penn Tunnel, some of the infected still make their way up the mountain over the road. So we set up a bunch of heavy machine guns and sniper nests along the way to pick them off. <laughs> a couple of times we had to take a big dump truck and drive over a group of them. We usually just push the dead bodies over the edge down the mountain. The mountainside was littered with thousands of bodies caught in crevices and shrubs which covered the hillside. It was like a landfill, but instead of trash, the bloated remains of humans lay piled about. Dark carrion birds leapt back and forth, fat and well-fed. Henderson looked abashed, then with hope at Joseph. I heard there was a cure, Doc. Is it true? Joseph shook his head. The loss of life was staggering. No cure. Show me to your leader. Henderson led Joseph to a smaller tent next to the command tent. Officers buzzed in and out. Joseph sat in a foldable chair and waited, but not for long. A short, wide-shouldered, bald white man pushed through the tent flaps and immediately sized Joseph up. His thin, tight upper lip quivered for a second. It remained in place. I am Colonel Jackson. I am the commanding officer of the remaining 34th Brigade Combat Team, comprised of the 1st Battalion, 113th Pennsylvania Artillery, and the 1st Battalion, 175th Pennsylvania Infantry, the old Bloody Anvil Brigade. He stood in front of Joseph, looking down on him. He continued with his resume-based harangue. We are a portion of the 28th Infantry Division, known as the Iron Division, that is stationed throughout Pennsylvania, Indiana, Ohio, and formerly New Jersey. My men tell me you are a doctor and that you were traveling alone. Is this true? Joseph took off his glasses and wiped them on his shirt. My name is Dr. Joseph Joukowsky. Although I'm probably not the kind of doctor that you are looking for, I am a virologist with the CDC. I escaped from the Mount Eden FEMA facility with a group of survivors who were ambushed and captured by bandits. Damn, there's nothing left, Jackson spat. Joseph didn't know how to answer that. I don't know. The infected were everywhere, he said, feeling a bit embarrassed for not knowing. We have been having problems with personnel at FEMA Camp Hope. You see, before we knew how to deal with these things, our doctors and field medics were infected. I sent my only remaining physician to help the civilians, but now the facility has been shut down, permanently. Why is the facility shut down? Overrun. No one came back. We lost a lot of good soldiers trying to hold that place. Joseph gulped. This is like no war I've ever seen, but in some ways wars are all the same, and I need a doctor to keep my units operational, Colonel Jackson said, his cold eyes demanding of Joseph. I would be honored to help our servicemen and women, but I'm afraid that my mission is of more importance. I'm traveling to Michigan to track down a lead on Patient Zero. I could use your help in getting there. Colonel Jackson held up a hand firmly. Dr. Joukowsky, who gave you this mission? Um, the United States Congress? Joseph lied. Colonel Jackson stared through him. We must be in bad shape if Congress is sending a lone virologist on a mission of such importance with nothing more than a tire iron to defend himself, Jackson said sternly. Joseph didn't know what else to say and did not have the opportunity. You can see that I have very little to spare in the way of personnel. 
My numbers are strained due to infection and desertion. The 128th Support Battalion downriver is doing an excellent job of keeping us supplied, but I cannot risk the lives of my men on such a risky task. Even if I could spare the troops, I can't let you enter the quarantine zone under Presidential Directive 6642. But I do have a use for you here. It is imperative that we maintain our quarantine of the city or the infected will break through, Colonel Jackson said. He started to pace and stopped at a map hanging on the tent wall. Desertion? Joseph wondered. Colonel Jackson grimaced. How can I ask men to do their duty when their families are being slaughtered, and we don't know where the next reinforcements are coming from? I'm going to be honest with you. Things are bad. We haven't heard from quarantine base Adder, Boa, or Cobra in two days. He thrust a meaty finger onto a map of Pittsburgh. Question marks surrounded red-drawn circles indicating bases that surrounded the city. Full infantry brigades completely offline. What I would give to have just a fraction of the 59th Striker Brigade combat team here. They were ushered over to Philadelphia. Haven't heard from Colonel Hartman in a while either. Colonel Jackson stared thoughtfully at the map, seeming to wonder and despair at once. I must continue on, Joseph stammered. Colonel Jackson glared. You will not continue on. Having a doctor will give the men hope. It will give the men courage to fight on. You, Dr. Joukowsky, are a key ingredient to this mess. You will stay here and aid this operation. As an American, you have a duty to these American soldiers. Under the Martial Law Act of 2002, I hereby conscript you into the United States Army. Steel, Backbone Peak, West Virginia Rancorous laughter rose above the bonfire's flames. They both died down as the night ticked away. Steele slunk through the trees on the outside of the camp. His steps were calculated and slow, as if he were learning the footwork of a complex dance. He was in a dance of shadows, where any misstep meant death. Any twig break or rustle of leaves in the wind could mean nothing or the impending approach of the dead. Or worse, the men in the camp. He was the hunter, the outsider, but he felt like the prey. The trees provided him good concealment, but he didn't think any of his enemies were awake now. Orange coals lay in the fire pits, glowing tiny orbs of light. The form of a man lay near the fire. Bastard has probably passed out. As he crept closer, he was sure it was a moonshiner. The man sawed away, snoring with his mouth hanging open. Steele crouched down and watched patiently. Planning an attack was a prudent man's game. Rushing would get him and Kevin killed. He waited until he was sure the man was sound asleep before he moved. Twenty yards from the camp he came to hastily placed barbed wire. The barbed wire wasn't meant for people like in the battlefields of World War I. The three-road wire was made for common farm animals or livestock. The spiked barbs would poke and cut the unknowing, hindering access to the camp, but would not keep any determined human out, alive or dead. Steele picked up a twig from the ground and tossed it at the lowest rung of the sharp knotted metal. The stick bounced harmlessly to the ground with a crackle of leaves. No hum of electricity sang forth. Good. No current. Sliding out some wire cutters from his pocket, he snipped each of the three rungs. He chanced to glance at the fire pit. The silhouette of the passed out man lay still. Steele inched closer and closer to the camp. Maybe I should gut this guy in his sleep. Give them something to think about. He closed the distance, his eyes focused on the man's sleeping form. A thin, taut wire snagged his ankle, sending him off his feet. Poof! He gasped as his body hit the earth. His hands braced his fall. Dirt and dried leaves crushed beneath him. He held himself motionless. You clumsy idiot. His heart sped up as he scanned the forest floor. Long, pointed wood stakes were centimeters away from his nose, a trench of short spears placed in haphazard fashion. Lucky you're short or you'd be a dead man. They have tripwire. Case, you hear that? Came a voice in the dark. Men sat still near the fire. Steel breathed heavily through his nose. Hear what? 
Oh, and I swear in Christ Almighty, you are the scariest idiot I've ever met, Case said. I thought I heard one of them out there, Owen said, his speech slurred. So what? We'll get the slave boy to clean it up in the morning. Come on, let's see if we can get our hands on some of old Barnum's secret stash, Case said. Where's he got it? Owen said. Follow me, Case said. The two men left their sleeping comrade and tramped away in search of their liquid treasure. Steele crawled back to the tripwire and cut it free. It twanged away, curling up in a coil. That should be enough to give the undead a head start. They only need to traverse a trench of sticks. A couple will get tangled, but the others will walk over them. While Steele crawled, stalked, and climbed his way back to where Kevin waited, he almost called off his plan. You good? Steele asked. He could tell Kevin was nervous in the dark. Yeah, it's good up here. I know. I cleared the fences. A nice open route. Thanks, Kevin said. Sarcasm surrounded his words. I am putting Gwen in danger. I am certainly putting Mauser and Ahmed in danger. They are practically chickens in the coop. But if I don't do this, we will be going in blind. Kiss all of our asses goodbye. You'll be fine, he said to Kevin. Kevin snorted in response. The two men hunkered close to the earth, each left to his own thoughts. Early morning hung over Puck's camp like a thin gray sheet. Nothing moved below. The fires were mere plumes of smoke. Steel almost found peace in the waxing light. Almost. Knowing that his enemies camped below and the infected roamed the land meant that no peace could be found. No peace here. No peace anywhere. Near dawn, he and Kevin parted ways. The high school history teacher trooped off into the morning. Stay fast, buddy. Thirty minutes later, Kevin's lanky form weaved between the trees. He glanced over his shoulder. Interspersed throughout the trees behind him was a pack of infected, who struggled their way through the forest. He led them near the cut fence and then peeled off, staying low. As he hid behind a tree, the dead passed one by one, and Kevin buttonhooked back up the mountain. Steele sat stoically as Kevin approached, panting from the effort. Good work, buddy, Steele said. Remind me, breath, to never wheeze. Do you any favors again? Kevin gasped. I don't ask them lightly. Steele said, his voice soft. I thought they were going to catch me, Kevin said hoarsely. Thank you, Papa Squat. This party is about to get started, Steele said, gazing through the binoculars. I can't believe we're doing this. I'm going to need a drink. Kevin coughed, letting his head fall between his legs. More than one. Steele was silent, watching the camp below. His breath fogged in the morning light. He hadn't noticed the encroaching chill in the night that surrounded them now, a chill that had threatened his life only days ago. The shapes of dead foes moved through the trees. The infected followed one another in the search for fresh, unsuspecting victims. Steele watched the spectacle with grim determination, judging his enemy's every move in response to danger. A man stood near the trees, relieving his heavy morning bladder. He yelped when they brought him down. The dead forced their way into the camp. The pack of slow movers was hell-bent on the destruction of the humans. They clambered in between the cabins, searching for prey. Steele checked his watch. Three minutes had passed and no one had yet responded to the obvious threat. The pissing moonshiner became a rapidly decreasing pile of steaming guts. A woman screamed as the dead pounded on windows and doors, and the alarm finally sounded out. Gwen, Backbone Peak, West Virginia. When light barely reached over the window sill, she stirred. Puck snored loudly next to her, and nature called her to action. Gently, she shook his chest. Puck, sweetie, wake up, she whispered. I have to pee. His dark black beard hung matted to his chest by drool that settled in the corner of his mouth. What a revolting human. Gwen gave him a punch in the shoulder, hoping she wouldn't get a black eye for her effort. Puck, please, 
she said louder. I'm going to piss the bed, she whispered. He whimpered, smacking his lips, and scratched his giant hairy belly beneath a filthy stretched-out tank top. She pulled herself upright, trying to angle her arm in a position that gave it some relief from its stiffness. Her handcuffs rattled on the rusty bed frame. She clinked them back and forth in the frame above Puck's head. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! She yelled at him. His hand unconsciously wiped the corner of his mouth. Frustrated, she stared out the window. The camp still slumbered. The light breached the darkness. The night retreated before it, revealing shoddy cabins. Mauser and Ahmed were strung up on the other side of her cabin. Not having them in view gave her anxiety. Her anxiety grew even worse not knowing the status of her women in the shed. Her bladder throbbed and her gut roiled with anxious thoughts. I have no way to tell if they are all right or even still in the camp. They could have killed them in the night and I would know nothing. A shadow in human form passed close to the window of her cabin. Jesus! She put her free hand to her chest. The shadow continued on, hobbling like a man who was bound to a cane. It was the way the person moved that made the hair raise on the back of her neck. Another tormented shadow brushed by the window following the first. His skin was gray. Tendons of his neck were exposed by mouth-sized holes in his flesh. Infected. Her mind raced with alarm. Puck! Wake up! Infected! She yelled. He murmured in his sleep but didn't wake up. She punched him in the chest repeatedly as if she were trying to restart his heart. A black eye is better than dead. Wake up, you big dummy! Infected! She screamed. More shadows lumbered past the window, skimming it with hunched shoulders. An infected noticed her and started slapping the glass, as if he were insulted by Gwen. His eyes were sunken in his skull, leering like sour milk, and his lips were gone, worn away long before, uncovering teeth and gums that oozed blackish gore. Puck opened his eyes a crack. Damn it! he shouted. He leapt out of the bed and was at the door in two long strides. He hefted a wood axe from the corner and ran out. Wake up, you stinking bastards! he yelled outside. The infected glared down at her. His hands smeared the glass with filth. Within moments, it shattered onto Gwen. She crawled to the corner of the bed, handcuffs preventing her escape. The thing's flesh caught on the glass, flaying his skin up his arm. Bloody hands stretched down through the window and grabbed for her. Its yellow, cracked fingernails nicked her neck and face. She hardly felt the blood finding its way to the surface of her skin. No! She screamed at him, but it didn't care. It hated her. That was the only way to describe it. Blind, angry hate, hell-bent on her demise. Stretching painfully across the bed, she scrambled on the floor. Using her other hand to pull on her steel bracelet, she yanked harder and harder on the handcuffs. Any more and her wrist will break. If I dislocate my thumb, I can slip my hand free. Her breath came out rough and forced. She pressed down on her thumb joint. The pain built up as she applied pressure with her other hand. The fiend's flesh peeled backward, a shave with glass gone wrong. Its hand inched closer, its mouth gaped in death's smile, and then its jaws clamped together. In an instant, the fiend was ripped back through the window like it was sucked from a hole in an airplane. Gwen lay paralyzed across the stinking bed. Huck's scraggly, beard-covered, watermelon-sized head replaced the infected's. Seconds passed as her eyes tried to decipher if he too was infected. You okay? He ground out. Yes, she exhaled, and he was gone. Steel, Backbone Peak, West Virginia An enormous man with a long black beard bellowed at his comrades. He swung a wood axe into the skulls of the infected intruders. Gunshots rang out as more men of the camp were brought into the action. The giant man worked over the infected with violent efficiency, swinging a two-handed wood axe like it was a wiffle ball bat. He decapitated an infected with a single blow, its head rolled away from its body. That guy is too large to take one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to need some help. I'll go for his joints. If he gets his paws on me, I may as well be facing a grizzly bear. Steele gritted his teeth. Once the entirety of the camp was brought into play, the battle was over. Only a single moonshiner perished in the undead assault. 
Steele was pretty sure old Blackbeard could have taken on all of them by himself. Steele dropped the binoculars. You did good out there, he said. A little too good. I caught that guy as he was taking a piss, Kevin said. I'm not sorry for it. Kevin looked at him and frowned. I'm not very enthusiastic about killing my neighbors, no matter how felonious they trend. Those are evil men down there. They have killed innocents, of that there is no doubt. I will execute their sentence if needs be. I won't ask that of you. There will be a need. I must live with that. Kevin didn't look convinced by Steele's explanation. Maybe you should be the runner next time, he said. Steele eyed his new friend, who was easy to hold people in the same light as he would other agents or soldiers. Kevin was only a schoolteacher. Everyone had the capability to be brave or to be a coward. He had already asked so much of his new acquaintance. I shouldn't have pushed him so hard. What choice do I have? I need his help. I'm going to have to kill people down there. That big one for sure. What they're doing is wrong, and I have to stop them. More importantly, I need to get those innocent people free. But I can't do this without your help, Steele said, putting a hand on his new friend's bony shoulder. I owe you, Kevin. Like it or not, we are a team now. Can I count on you? Steele said. Kevin blinked at him for a moment. We could try talking to them. They may listen to reason, he said after much thought. After my first interaction with them, the time for talking is over. Tomorrow night we'll strike. We'll wait until they get drunk, and you will lead another pack of infected this way as a distraction. In the confusion, I'll free my friends and we'll escape, Steele said with a smile. He was conscious of the fact that he must look creepy smiling with his head wound. Kevin flattened his lips. I've got a lot to lose by helping you, and I like living, even if it's just scraping by. I'll think about it. Gwen, Backbone Peak, West Virginia Gwen gripped a piece of broken window glass in one hand, ignoring the sharp edges dangerously touching her skin. I won't be a victim. I will fight. She crouched next to the bed, hands still cuffed to its frame. Men shouted outside. A gunshot rang out here and there. In a half hour, order was restored to the camp. Puck returned to the cabin with a mean look on his face, gore smeared on his overalls. His footsteps shook the cabin as he marched over to Gwen, and she shied away from him, thinking that he had come to beat her. She flinched away from his hand. Fishing a key from his pocket, he unlocked her from the bed. Come, he said. He threw her cuffs on the bed. She stood up and rubbed her raw wrists. Should I follow? Her feet let her out the door anyway. I almost hoped he wouldn't come back, but if he didn't, then it would have just been the dead in his place. They walked through the camp. White corpses lay strewn about the ground. Heads were dented inward. Pink brains leaked from beneath blood-matted hair. He walked kicking a decapitated head out of his path like it was a soccer ball. She flinched, although she knew she shouldn't. That is not the last dead person you will see, she said to herself. He snaked her through the camp and led her down a path into the forest. A fence of barbed wire lay rolled to either side. Look, he pointed with his axe. Bodies quivered in a trench of stakes. The points of the stakes had been driven through their torsos, arms, and legs. The dead had stacked up on one another, resulting in a human pincushion. A muddy, infected arm reached for them, fingernails clawing the thick sludge with its hands. It moaned, unable to extricate itself from the pile of dead. With ease, Puck put the thick tread of his boot on the infected man's neck and swung his axe downward with a sickening crunch. It was as if he were playing a game of croquet. Gore swirled in with the mud. Hefting his axe near his head, he bent down and pulled the wire up for her to see. His dark eyes probed hers. Someone cut this, he said. She shook her head. I don't know, was it? She said, playing dumb. Her grandfather owned a century farm in southeast Iowa. His farm spanned hundreds of acres of lush grassland and timber. 
She had spent enough time fixing fence to know when one had been cut by hand, not by chance. Somebody cut this one and the other ring over there, Puck said. He stomped over to the other side of the stake ditch and held up another single wire. What is that? Somebody cut this tripwire, too, and let the Satan spawn in, he said, pausing in anger. Not one has gotten inside until now. But you handled it, sweetie. You protected us, she said, letting the slime drip off her tongue. His dark eyes burned into her, judging her words. Everybody I know is here or dead. You know that, honey, she said, stepping closer. I am just grateful that you saved my life. She wrapped her arms around his massive, stinking torso. He held his arms out from his body, not used to her affection. She tried to stay in front, avoiding his armpits. Puck looked down at her. It ain't your fault, he grumbled, patting her back. Casey, he hollered over her shoulder. Get old Barnum and patch up this fence. Casey nodded and walked off to get old Barnum. I've got to run down the mountain. When I return, I'll be good and hungry. Make sure that deer is all cooked up, but not too much. I like it a little bloody. She smiled up at him as sweetly as she could. I'm going to poison you if I get the chance. I'll fix you up something delicious. Gwen burnt the meat as much as she could and still claim ignorance. Growing up in Iowa deer country, she had cooked more than enough venison in her lifetime. So much, in fact, she couldn't stand the gamey smell or taste. She held the iron pan in the flames, letting the meat char. She could feel his eyes upon her as she made good on her promise to cook for him. She dumped the slab of charred venison on his plate and put a tiny piece on hers. She looked at her cut of deer meat while he sawed into the meat and chewed noisily. You have a man before here, he said in between bites. The meat crunched as he chewed. Yes. You never cook for him? No, I cooked for him. He did. Does he not even know that his people killed Mark? Yes. The words were bitter and didn't feel right on her tongue. I guess I know what killed him, he said, cutting into his chunk of meat. They continued in silence as she picked at her food. One of your friends shot him she said after a moment. He continued to eat, not looking up from his food. Do the victor the spoils. He should have fought harder for his woman, he said, smiling at her with gross intent. I am no prize to be won. I choose my company. Strong words from a woman in chains. We are all caged by something. He blinked at her, trying to digest her words. Food was caught in his beard like a black-haired Christmas tree with crumbs as ornaments. She held his gaze momentarily and looked back at her food. Eat. You're lucky there's food. Better than some coward could provide for you, he said. You don't know anything about Mark. Eat, he said again. She put a fork into her food and saw the tough meat. They ate the rest of their meal in an awkward silence. Gwen hoped she hadn't overstepped herself and alienated her captor, whose generosity and trust was paramount to her survival and escape. He eyed her with dark, dim eyes. He rose to go outside for his nightly drinking. Clean this up, he ordered. Puck, I was thinking that I could join you out there tonight. I get so scared when I am alone. Please? He eyed her lustfully and nodded. I have half a mind to take you right now, he said, and licked his lips. Sweetie, think about how much better it will be when I feel a bit more comfortable with my new surroundings, she said softly. I promise I will make it worth it. She gave him a sexy smile, her insides roiling with each word. He growled a bit and walked outside. She swiped a piece of venison and stashed it under her clothes before accompanying him outside to the bonfire. Puck engulfed her hand and led her near a large fire that crackled and flared bright in the night. She could see through the firelight that her friends were still chained to the pole. Thank God they survived the infected. The mountain folk quieted down as they approached. 
and after an awkward second, parted ways for them. Puck and her were like a hillbilly king and queen surrounded by their yokel court. Gwen felt their eyes upon her, eyes that judged her, hateful eyes that despised her. She was the outsider, the other. Puck picked her up with his massive paws and set her down on his lap like she was a ventriloquist dummy. Am I a dummy trying to befriend them? Prune-faced old Barnum mumbled something to Casey and they burst out laughing. He produced a large mason jar and took a long swig. His puckered lips pursed a bit at the end, and he handed it to Casey. He took his turn, and they passed it around the campfire. Everyone started yapping again, conversing loudly about the day's happenings. Gwen listened quietly, watching them and looking for weaknesses she could exploit. In any other world, it would have looked like some country folk enjoying a campfire in the hills. In this world, they had killed her love, raped her friend, beaten them, and held them hostage. The most sickening part was that they didn't even seem to care. Whatever system that had once been in place to hold these people accountable had disappeared. Fat Chuck pulled out a banjo. He ran his thumb all the way down the strings before he began to pick them in sequence while his thumb rested on the top string. His fingers formed a sea-like position as he strummed and twanged the instrument in time. Mark's badge glinted in the firelight, draped around Chuck's neck like some sort of grisly trophy. Play the part or they will never trust you. Gwen nestled into Puck's chest, feeling his warmth. It repulsed her, but it took her eyes away from the glittering badge that flickered in the firelight. The flames raged in Ashley's eyes from across the fire. Gwen tried not to make eye contact, knowing the woman was placing a hex on her. Instead, Gwen snuggled into Puck's furry arm. His body does make a relatively comfortable pillow. I feel safe with you, she said up to him, the words tasting like a cigarette butt in her mouth. He looked down on her, wide smile showing gap teeth. She gave him a sweet smile, fluttering her eyelashes with half-open eyes. She gave a triumphant look over at Ashley, who scowled even more. Give me a few more days and Puck will be eating out of my hand. Another week and I might run this camp. But I don't have that much time. Casey's rat-like face leaned over to them. His mustache belonged on an adolescent. You want a drink? He said, giving Puck a nervous glance. Puck grunted. Gwen took the mason jar in her hands. She smelled it tentatively. Bitterly strong alcohol wafted into her nostrils, more like rubbing alcohol than anything else. Yuck, she said, twisting her head away. Smells like pure gasoline. Ha, huh? they say old Barnum's hooch made his wife go blind. Told her not to be sneaking my stash. A wrinkled man wheezed from across the fire. Give it here, Puck said. He snatched the mason jar from her hands. You do it like this, he said, tipping the jar back and guzzling the great alcohol down his throat. Liquid trails dribbled down his beard. Ah, he said. He wiped his mouth with the back of his sleeve. Oh my, Puck, she exclaimed. Jesus, I'm not sure I can fake such happiness at such primitive behavior. Does he think I'm impressed by his ability to drink rocket fuel? I've never seen anyone drink like you. I'm a good drinker. You have some too, Puck said, handing her the jar. Gwen had never been a big drinker. She almost gagged as the jar neared her lips. She took a sip and the fiery fluid burned down her throat. She coughed and they all laughed at her. Drink more, Puck said. He laughed, his big belly jiggling with mirth like an Appalachian Santa. I don't know. Come on, drink up, Casey called over. Little Miss Perfect probably never been drunk before, Ashley called at her. What? It ain't good enough for your highfalutin ways, Chuck said. Oh, okay, she gushed. She took another small sip. She coughed and coughed. The more sober I stay, the better. They laughed at her city ways, and she passed the jar on. Puck possessively wrapped a heavy arm around her. The moonshiners told stories. For most of them, Gwen couldn't tell if they were pre- or post-outbreak. It was difficult to tell. These people seemed to have always lived on the fringe of society. 
They had never abided by normal laws, but in reality had been a much smaller unit, more like a tribe, and Puck was their chieftain, a position that he held by brute force. I've lived up here since the war. They worked us to death in those days. Then when the war was done, the company went away, left us with nothing, old Barnum said. He's talking about World War II, the one versus the British, Chuck said to Gwen. Never left this mountain. Don't suspect I ever will. A lot of boys who left never came back from the war, nor the ones after. Barnum nodded, affirming his survival to playing it safe and never leaving home. Or was it because he knew he would now die on the mountain? Gwen couldn't tell. Join up, they'd say. Serve your country, they'd say. See the world, they'd say. Then all that came back were little yellow Western Union telegrams. The cave didn't seem so bad compared to having a sneaky Jerry run you through the bayonet in the snow. They all nodded their heads as they listened to the old man. After the war, I met your pa, Richard O'Neill. A real firebrand, that one. That war did him no service. Didn't help my bet either. Had to set him straight a few times. Quit reminiscing, you old fart. We all know about Pa. You don't need to remind us. Ashley called over. I am just saying war hurts a lot of people up here. He pointed to his head. But nothing that a little hooch can't fix, he said with a laugh. He gripped the mason jar in both hands with a smile. As the night progressed, the stories flowed, complemented by rounds of alcohol, and Gwen had a hard time navigating their intertwined histories. Old Barnum, the oldest member and the patriarch in name only, was an uncle or grandpa to Casey and Henry, who in turn were cousins or friends with Fat Chuck. Owen was a brother to Ashley and was married to Virginia, who was sister to Hunchback Larry, who was cousins with Bobby and One-Eyed Sue. Huck Roberts was his own unit. She gave up trying to decipher everyone's relation to one another, but realized there was an intertwining of two major families, the Barnums and O'Neills, with a smattering of Connollys. They had always stuck together, fierce and proud, distant relatives from the old country, all different branches of the same clan. After a few hours, she stood up, stretching her legs. I have to use the outhouse, she whispered to Puck. He looked her in the eyes, deciding if he could trust her. She slapped him on the shoulder playfully. Where would I go? You think I would run off into the mountains at night? She said. Satisfied, he nodded. Outhouse is over there. He threw a thumb behind him. Gwen stepped slowly into the night her first bit of freedom from Puck scaring her. It was eerie leaving the people she hated, knowing that the night held endless dangers, infected, animals, getting lost. Would I even make a run for it if I had the chance? Could I make it on my own in the unfamiliar mountains of West Virginia? No, I will not desert my friends. They need my help. I will not leave them to a fate worse than death. An opportunity will present itself. Chained forms materialized in the darkness. Will they see if I make contact? She furtively glanced behind her. Laughter roared at the campfire. She slowed down as she came alongside Mauser, Ahmed, and Eddie. Mauser looked up. His chained arms clinked above his head. He had grown a grizzled reddish beard, and bruised darkness surrounded his swollen eyes. She couldn't contain herself. She darted to him and knelt down near him. Hey there, good-looking, Mauser started, a painful grin spreading over his face. She wanted to cry just looking at his broken face and body. She wept a tear from the corner of her eye. I'm fine, Ben. You don't look so good. Nothing that a spa day won't fix up, he said. He coughed, and it sounded painful. Tomorrow night they're having some sort of party. I think they are going to do something horrible to you and Ahmed. We have to escape. She rushed out. She gave another glance over her shoulder. Nobody watched from afar. Mauser's face was downcast. They watch us almost all the time. And Ahmed and I are banged up too. They've only fed us once. His face does look gaunt where it's not swollen. Eat this. 
she said, and shoved venison in his mouth. He gulped down the food. Christ, that was terrible, even for a sorry son of a bitch like me. A small act of rebellion on my part. I'll continue to work on Puck. Maybe I can get the key and unchain you. She smiled sadly at her battered longtime friend. Mauser chewed more meat greedily. He stopped. His name is actually Puck. Jesus, where the hell are we? Far from home, she responded, watching the trees. He nodded and looked at her fiercely in the eyes. Just tell me when to run and I'll run. Or fight, Mauser said. A crack of a twig behind her gave away the uninvited. Gwen stood up and spun around, her heart racing in her chest. A feminine form emerged from the shadows. As she got closer, a nasty sneer crossed her lips. Ashley. I heard what you were planning, bitch, she said. Gwen composed herself, smoothing her dress. Whatever are you talking about? I was just talking to my friend here, she said. Ashley reached out to grab Gwen by the sleeve. Gwen brushed her hand aside. Don't you touch me or I will tell Puck, Gwen said. Ashley stayed her hand, outrage settling on her face. Puck would never take your word over mine, Ash said. Are you sure? Gwen used her haughtiest glance and pursed her lips. You don't know nothing about us, Ashley stammered. Gwen turned her back to her continuing on her way to the outhouses. Better not jump me, bitch. Gwen tried to appear calm, but she was tense, waiting for Ashley to fight her. Step after step, she relaxed. Please don't call my bluff. Ashley called after her, shrill and mean, sending a shiver down Gwen's spine. Tomorrow it won't even matter, bitch. They'll be dead, and you'll be alone. Steel, Backbone Peak, West Virginia. In the dim light of a hanging lamp, they took stock of Kevin's meager inventory of weapons. A pump-action camouflage Benelli 12-gauge hunting shotgun lay on Kevin's kitchen table. Scattered nearby were three red-tube brass-bottomed slugs. Steel's knife lay out for sharpening along with one of Kevin's deer knives. A rusted-out shovel leaned against the wall in the corner, almost as if they were planning on burying the bodies or each other. So you're telling me you live in West Virginia and you don't have any handguns or rifles and only three slugs? Steele asked, rubbing his eyes to alleviate the throbbing of his brain. Kevin scratched his head. I'm a teacher, not a prepper. I usually go hunting in November, but I've had to use some of my slugs since people started to go the way of the dodo. Steele nodded, his head throbbing. I know. I know, Kevin. I am more disappointed in myself for getting into this mess than with you. Should have been more cautious. Shouldn't have been so trusting. We knew it was an ambush. It was a clear setup. The way the cars were angled. The way the road ran through the mountainside. The excellent vantage points. Damn it. My buddies who were in Afghanistan would have mocked me for my presumed safety. My spidey senses should have been screaming danger. Instead, I got a bullet in the head. And they got Gwen. Pretty meager, huh? Kevin said, crossing his arms across his chest. Steel grimaced. A little luck never hurt. Three slugs ain't going to get us too far against ten-plus guns pointed in our direction. We're going to have to be silent. Use stealth, surprise, and chaos to our advantage. Kevin appeared apprehensive. Don't quit on me now. Listen, Steel, and I mean this with all due respect. You seem like a good guy and a relative badass, but you are just one man. What good is one good man with good intentions against a gang of rotten men with bad blood running through their veins? Kevin said. His eyes darted downward. His voice rose as he spoke. I don't want anything to do with Puck Roberts and that clan of misfits. They aren't like me. They are backward, mean folk who provide nothing to society. Steele's brows creased. Why are you upset? What did they do to you? Kevin shook his head in frustration. It's just those people. They, they, 
I'm not like them. Do you know how hard it was to get where I am? I was the first person in my family to go to college, the first in a family of coal miners and hooch cookers. I understand, but this isn't that world anymore. This isn't a world that values degrees. Not unless you can make me some slugs out of nothing. Kevin gave him a small grin before it turned to a frown. Steele knew what he was going to say, but let the man speak his piece. Kevin stuffed his hands in his navy sweatshirt front pocket. Those things out there. On top of Puck, this is just too much. Kevin shook his head, working up his denial. Abandoned in my time of real need. Those are my people, my responsibility. I'll be out of your hair tomorrow, Steele said. Kevin looked sorry and nodded, leaving Steele to his thoughts. I've got to get some rest, Steele said. He crashed on Kevin's couch and closed his eyes. Sleep didn't take him soon enough. His sleep was fitful and uncomfortable. The sun cracked through the blinds, and Steele awoke to the distinct greasy smell of frying bacon. He kicked his blanket off and sat up on the couch, knife flipping free of its handle. Kevin stood in the kitchen cooking food over the stove. Don't kill the cook, he waved a spatula at Steele. I promise it won't be that bad. Steele gingerly swept his hair to the side, covering his healing wound. Just touching his hair sent pain shooting through his hair follicles. He collapsed the blade and shoved it back in his pants. What's the special occasion? Steele said. Kevin flipped bacon over. It's the last of bacon. Fridge is out. I love me some bacon. Can you make that extra crispy? Preaching to the choir. Steele took a seat at the kitchen table, pushing some of their weaponry and gear out of the way. I wouldn't have someone saying that I sent you out into this shitty world on an empty stomach. Just wouldn't be right. Some of us in these parts are rough around the edges, but we aren't heartless. Kevin scooped six reddish-brown, fat-streaked slices of bacon on his plate. They crunched crispy bacon in silence. Each man was lost in his thoughts. Steele on his task, Kevin on his own. Steele tossed the last piece of bacon in his mouth. He licked his fingers with a smack of his lips. Best damn bacon I've ever had. Don't tell Gwen that. Kevin smiled sadly. We didn't see her. We don't even know she is there. You don't know this woman. She is unlike anyone you will ever meet. She has the will of a warrior, the heart of an angel, and the mind of a lawyer. I've lost plenty of debates to her. She could talk the president out of the White House. Kevin cracked a smile. She sounds like an amazing lady. That she is. The best. And if we don't swoop in and rescue her, she will just rescue herself. And trust me, when she finds out we didn't help her, Steele eyed him. You don't want that. I don't know. I know about battles and wars, not conducting a search and rescue mission. Kevin's words sped up as he talked and built himself into an excited frenzy. Like, did you know Major General Daniel Sickles lost a leg at the Battle of Gettysburg and donated it to a museum and visited the leg every year after its amputation? Or that the Anglo-Zanzibar War lasted only 38 minutes? How about how the English-Welsh longbow changed medieval warfare forever at the battles of Poitiers, Agincourt, and Crecy, with its ability to take away the French cavalry charge with a hail of pincushioning, bodkin-pointed arrows? Steele held up his hand. Kevin stopped talking and settled for being flustered. Hey, man, it's okay. I understand. I'm not a fighter. I could write all day about fighters, but I'm not one. I wouldn't stand a chance. Stand with me. We might not be in a history book, but we sure as hell will put on a fight for the ages. I won't beg for your help, but I'm not above asking for it again. Would you like to meet Gwen? Will you help me rescue my friends? Will you make history on this mountain? Kevin examined the contents of his plate, food gone. He licked his lips. Worry stretched over Kevin's thin face. I feel like I'm crazy for saying this but I'll help you. I don't know why, but I'm going to do it, he said, his mouth forming a determined smile. But you owe me a nice bottle of whiskey when this is done. Steele grinned ear to ear. 
I will get you a whole damn case when this is all over. Mauser, Backbone Peak, West Virginia. Mauser lazily opened his eyes. He coughed a bit, cold air biting his lungs like hungry rats. His lids were swollen and heavy from a horrible night's sleep. His arms hung above his head, muscles worn and torn from being stuck in the same uncomfortable position. The sun crested the treetop mountain, gold and warm. Will today be the day I die? Ashley's words rung through his head. Gwen had better put that big brain of hers to work because I can't think of any way out of this mess. If we have any hope, it's together, and I sure as hell don't feel like dying today. Psst, Ahmed, you awake, he said. Ahmed grunted in response. It sounds like they have something planned for us tonight. I don't like parties where I am the main form of entertainment. Just stay alive. Don't give them the satisfaction of defeating us, Mauser said. Ahmed uttered a fluid-filled hack in response. I'll try, he groaned. His health had declined rapidly. The lack of food, water, and the daily beatings combined with exposure to the elements were taking their toll upon the man. The camp stirred to life. A moonshiner stumbled out of a cabin and scratched his balls. A female followed him, blanket around her shoulders, walking crooked almost as if she were infected. No, just hung over. Mauser wondered where they were keeping Lucia and Lindsay. He hadn't caught a glimpse of them yet. He knew Gwen was over in that cabin with Puck. He tried to stretch his neck to relieve the pain. Easy to beat a man chained to a pole. Untie my ass and I'll put on a show. Casey strolled by, swinging his whipping stick and whistling. The same three notes over and over. He broke out into song. He taught them all a lesson, with all his limey blessings. Mauser struggled to keep his mouth shut. If he was trying to annoy Mauser to death, it was working like a charm. He was about ten minutes early today. Don't you disobey him if you want a rash of bacon, he sang. He stopped about a dozen steps from Mauser, turning on him. The fuck you looking at, idiot? Mauser quickly dipped his head. Nothing, sir he said too fast. Casey walked over, his whipping stick swung like a pendulum back and forth, and his sparse mustache jumped up and down on his face. You're lucky I'm in a good mood today, or I give you a whooping. That and Puck doesn't want you too banged up for the party. Fuck you, Mauser said under his breath. What'd you say? Casey ran at him, stick raised. Mauser tucked his chin, shying away from the man and his stick. I said, thank you, sir. That's what I thought, boy. I'll be back for Uncle Tom here in a second, Casey said and continued on his way, whistling. Mauser exhaled. Not getting his jaw broke was a privilege. Concentrating on their patterns was even more important. Depending on how much the mountain folk drank the night before, they would usually start moving around thirty minutes after daybreak. A couple of the moonshiners relieved the night watchmen. The amount of alcohol they'd consumed, the least drunk man would patrol the perimeter of the camp. Most nights it seemed like a race to get drunk enough to not stand watch. The duo of moonshiners walked into the woods. They were armed with shovels, knives, axes. They swung wildly through the trees and crushed the skulls of the infected who had become entangled in the layers of barbed wire. Casey returned and unshackled Eddie. Come on, boy, Casey said. He pulled Eddie upright and marched him into the woods. Eddie hauled the decaying bodies through the trees to a pit. This process was repeated every morning. Routines were any ambusher, attacker, or escapee's friend. A routine could be manipulated, and these hillbillies tended to do the same thing every morning. Mauser hoped that Gwen recognized this. A good time to escape would be a few hours before daybreak. That would hopefully give them a few hours' head start before anyone knew they were gone. The problem was Puck's party. I can serve drinks or get greased up and wrestle a mat or whatever stupid shit they have in mind for a night until we can escape. Can't be that bad. He hung for hours. They ticked by with no respite. The cool fall mountain air settled on the camp, 
Gwen never came to him, and the hours dragged along like an infected in traffic. With every passing hour, the impending doom of the party weighed down on him. His insides turned as darkness joined the cool air. Maybe they've forgotten about us. He only dared to hope. Mauser was sorely sorry when he saw Chuck's fat face and Casey's amateur mustache ambling up from the other side of the camp. Time for a bit of country fun, city bitches! Casey sneered. <laughs> Chuck laughed, the ever-supporting minion. Chuck reached for Mauser's lock and stuck the key in. If I jump up quick, I might be able to take him. Keep his hands tied. He thinks he's tough, Casey said. Casey's glance told Mauser he knew his inner thoughts. He was a cruelly insightful man. Chuck's beady eyes stared at him. Steele's gold badge dangled around his neck. You're unfit to even be in the presence of that badge, Mauser spat. A slow grin crawled on Chuck's face. I'm law in these parts. He kicked Mauser's ribs. Pain stabbed his lung and Mauser wheezed, rolling on the ground. Chuck pulled him up by his tied-up hands. Come on, boy! Casey shouted at Ahmed. He kicked Ahmed in the butt repeatedly. Ahmed crawled over the ground until he could stand up. Unsheathing a knife, Mauser flinched as the blade came close to him. Chuck continued for him and cut Mauser's shirt open down the middle. Dang, look at all them paintings, Chuck said. He scratched his head with his knife. Casey joined him, holding Ahmed's chain. Mauser had been getting ink on his body since he was an 18-year-old in the Coast Guard. Tattoos were a common part of Coast Guard and naval culture going back centuries. Don't like the color you were before, boy? Casey said. He leaned in close to Mauser's face. Why it ain't good enough for you? He must be a stupid or something, Chuck added, pushing Mauser in the back. Casey grabbed him by the mouth. Soon enough you'll be screaming for a bullet to the head, he said, his rank breath invading Mauser's face. Mauser stared straight ahead, not engaging the wretched little man. You hear me, turd? Mauser gave him a curt nod. Good. Now let's get you moving. They walked them both away from the pole. Mauser kept his head low and didn't say a word. He had to conserve his energy for whatever heinous event these hillbillies had planned for them. Given the opportunity, he would try to take some of these bastards with him, especially Casey, that rat-faced bastard. He would not explain himself to these people. They trudged through the dark, the only illumination was the erupting flames from huge bonfires roaring ahead. Jesus, are they going to burn us alive like the fucking Salem witch trial? He glanced at Ahmed. He already looked dead. Everyone in the camp stood around waiting for the arrival of their sacrificial lambs. Mauser had seen them all before. One-eyed Sue, ugly Steve, slutty Ashley, prune-faced Barnum, hunchbacked Larry. Mauser looked around at their grinning faces. Even poor Eddie was there, shackled like a common criminal in county lockup. Whoa, look at these cats, cried prune-faced Barnum. You should have let me fuck him first, shouted one-eyed Sue. She reached out, grabbing Mauser's junk with one hand while holding a baby in the other. Damn, boy! She laughed and slapped him across his face. Mauser kept his eyes averted. What's the matter, don't like girls? She said, laughing harder. Being manhandled was the tip of the iceberg. He was a mere sideshow compared to Ahmed. Everything imaginable was thrown against Ahmed. They pummeled him with racial slurs, assaulting his very existence as a man. Prune-faced Barnum struck Ahmed with his fist, and Ahmed struggled to stand beneath their hate. His gauntlet of shame finished at a large pit surrounded by their captors. Gwen sat on the other side of the fire, curled up next to Puck on one side of the pit, an unconcerned look on her face. The fire's shadows danced over the crowd as if they stood on the edge of hell. The smell of rotting flesh grew stronger as they were pushed closer to the pit. He leaned back against Casey's hand. Casey laughed. Ha! <laughs> Why don't you go on ahead and take a look? He said. He shoved Mauser closer to the pit. Mauser flapped his arms, attempting to regain his balance. 
His hands leapt to the chain on his throat, the only thing keeping him above the pit. Ten feet below, dead, decaying hands reached up from below. Unseen faces gazed directly at him, and open mouths groaned. The dead squished through the mud, clothes melted into their skin, looking upwards at him longingly. Fuck me! Mauser shouted. Casey laughed, and Fat Chuck giggled. You and Dad Hodge, you're gonna have a great time down in there. Chuck said, laughing out loud in glee. Holy shit, what is wrong with these people? Casey pulled him back from the edge. You already stole our stuff. Just let us go, he pleaded. A chorus of boos met his request. What would be the fun in that? Besides, Ma and Pa are hungry, Chuck laughed. Mauser's heart rate spiked as he glanced over at Ahmed. Ahmed's eyes were as wide as his eyes could get, with eye sockets swollen to the size of baseballs. Pain exploded into the backs of Mauser's knees as Casey brought his whipping stick into them with all his force. Mauser sank down, the wet ground seeping through his pants. Ahmed thudded onto the ground next to him. A massive black-bearded puck stood and raised his arms, calling for silence. Puck wore a thick tan work jacket with jeans. A wood axe leaned against his chair along with a wood-stocked AK-47. I know it's been a while, but I promise y'all some entertainment. Tonight, you're gonna get some, he rumbled. A round of clapping and hoots went up from around the pit. Go in the Arab, hunchback Larry burst out. Puck gave an evil eye over to the outburst. Hold on. Hunchback Larry lowered his head. I think we'll make it a little more interesting. He ushered Gwen up from her seat. Gwen, my dearest, how about you pick who goes into the pit first? The blood disappeared from her face. Don't think I don't know about your scheming. My girl Ashley here told me all about it. Now, you have to pay for what you've done. She looked like she was trying to shrink into thin air. Her lips quivered and then tears rolled forth. Mauser didn't blame her. Cruel beyond comprehension. A Sophie's Armageddon choice. They laughed at her. I know roommate's got to count for something, right? She can't just toss me in for leaving my shoes out in the foyer and dirty dishes in the sink. Does it really matter? Either way, Ahmed and I are dead. A fate that she must know in the back of her mind. Hurry up now, Gwen. Who gets to have fun first? Puck goaded her. The Arab! The Arab! Others shouted. Let me keep the painted one! One-eyed Sue yelled, giving Mauser a twisted smile. I think I'd rather go in the pit. The strain wore heavy on Gwen, having to choose which of her friends would die first. It was tearing her apart from the inside, a burden she didn't want to carry. Isn't it bad enough she has to watch us die? Mauser's limbs tingled. It was a funny thing knowing he was about to die, and it gave him a bit of clarity even when his inside screamed. He supposed that some people might panic thinking about their final moments. Mauser drew strength. He knew he would have some control over his fate. One doesn't get to pick where they come into this world, but every man is given a choice how he entered the next world. In a pile of shell casings, or bullet holes in the back. I will not give them the satisfaction of lying down. I will fight. Mauser stood shakily, conviction etched on his face. I want to go first, he shouted. The group quieted down, staring at Mauser. Puck glared, furious that he'd taken the fun out of Gwen's psychological torture. He marched over to Mauser, engulfing his shoulder with a meaty paw. You don't get to choose. Gwen must choose, he growled, holding Mauser in place. Let's get this party started. Mauser gave a smile to everyone. Everything's going to be okay, he called to Gwen. Let me help you. This can be a choice. Gwen looked up, tears streaming down her face. I can't. I can't, she quavered. Mauser was forced back to his knees, a knife held to the side of his throat. The point pricked his skin. 
his eyes locked with hers. It's okay. I'm ready. When? Hit me, Mauser said. Gwen's eyes glistened as she nodded. I never thought it would be like this. Everything is going to be all right. I promise, Mauser lied. She nodded, wiping tears from the corners of her eyes. I pick Mauser, she sputtered. Her hands leapt up to her face. There, it's settled. Ahmed, buy me a beer when we're done here. Deal? Mauser said with false bravado. Ahmed nodded dumbly, defeated, in shock, attempting to face death, but with no will to do so. The knife was released from Mauser's neck, and he stood. Mauser offered his hands to Puck. You want a real show? Untie me. Puck grinned, unsettling Mauser. Puck turned away and planted a huge foot into Ahmed's back, sending him sailing into the pit. Joseph, quarantine base rattlesnake, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Joseph sat in a fold-out chair inside the quarantine base's large medical tent. His earplugs muffled the coughs of the sick and the booms of the artillery outside. He yawned. His sleep had been fitful, but better than on the road. With each passing day, Joseph was ushered closer to defeat. His one shot to find patient zero had been squandered, and now he was stuck with a failing military unit on the outskirts of a dead city. He checked the thermometer of a pale soldier lying on a cot in front of him. His temperature was under control. He will need another dose of antivirals to make sure he doesn't relapse. An influenza outbreak had plagued the unit, requiring a great deal of antivirals. It kept him busy, but most of the men only needed rest, rest that they were not allowed to have in the field. The tempo of shelling and base defense was constant, and Joseph was sure most of the men were sick due to lack of adequate physical and mental rest. What's a dead man's knot? Five letters across. Henderson sat nearby, pen in hand, folded piece of newspaper in the other. A noose, Joseph said. He walked over to the next soldier. Perfect, Henderson exclaimed. He shook his head in disbelief. Dang, Dr. Joseph, you sure do know everything. No, I don't, Joseph said apathetically. Well, sure you do. You're going to find a cure for the virus. Joseph rolled his eyes. No, I'm not. I can't do anything here. You'll get there, Doc. Hudson stuck the pen in his mouth while he thought. Joseph looked up at Henderson, sitting across the room. Are you going to take me? Well, no, that would be against orders, but at some point the colonel will get you there. Henderson gave Joseph a dumb smile. He was just a kid, no more than twenty, and had already seen more death than the most seasoned of warriors. How about killer of pre-modern war? Henderson crunched his brow. Rifle doesn't fit. Bow and arrow is too long. Hmm. Starts with a D. Dysentery. Henderson counted out the letters. What do you know? It fits. He gave Joseph a smile. How have you not finished that? Heavy howitzers boomed outside as if they were at the Battle of Gettysburg. Well, I don't know. It's hard. The last newspaper came out, what, over a month ago, and you still aren't finished? No, maybe I don't want it to be over, he said, defensiveness creeping up in his voice. Henderson went back to his task of solving his never-ending crossword. Why is that? Because then I won't have nothing to do. There is always more to do. I'm going to check on a few of the patients and make sure they're getting enough fluids. They were well supplied with medical supplies and antivirals, but the task was still daunting with his basic atrophied medical background. Is Henderson here to assist or make sure I don't run off? You know what? How about you grab those IV bags over there and change them out? Joseph commanded. Truck tires came screeching to a halt outside the tent, and people shouted back and forth. Henderson set down his crossword and went for the door. The tent flap blew open. A fiery, red-haired soldier charged through in bloodied tan digital camouflage. 
His name tag read Yates in block lettering. Joseph hesitated, thinking the man might be infected. Yates and another soldier hauled a patient behind him on a stretcher. More men followed them, dragging in their comrades. It's going to be a long day. Joseph immediately started a triage for the men. The first man they set down were the remnants of shredded clothes. Multiple metal fragments protruded from his chest and arms. Joseph put his ear next to the man's mouth, watching his chest rise and fall in rapid successive repetitions. He placed a red marker on his stretcher. The next man they set down had burns and gunshot wounds to his upper leg. All the hair on his face and head had been burnt away. Joseph tossed a red marker down next to him. The next man was already dead, eyes glazed over. He suffered from a deep, penetrating wound just to the left of the mid-thoracic spine, which almost was certainly severed, descending the thoracic aorta. Joseph threw a black marker near his feet. He's dead, Joseph said to the men standing around. He repeated the process for soldier after soldier as they piled in. They set them on the ground in a mangled row of ground-up men. Sergeant Yates paced back and forth behind Joseph, fuming in anger. Those fuckers set up a roadside bomb. It was like Iraq all over again, he said to himself. Another soldier with a faint beard spoke up. Wesley was on fire and just wouldn't stop screaming, Sarge. I know, Taylor. We'll get those fuckers, I promise. I never thought people here would be like this. Those, those fuckers. We aren't invaders. We're Americans. Sergeant Yates hissed. We were only trying to help, Taylor said to himself. Joseph couldn't bear it. If you aren't putting pressure on a wound, I need IVs and him and him. And if you aren't doing anything, get the hell out of here, he yelled over his shoulder. Yates mumbled an apology, and the handful of troops not helping left the tent. Joseph's mind raced. Americans attacked American soldiers? Can't be. Why? He found the nearest red marker and went to work. Taking a pair of scissors, he cut open the soldier's shirt, revealing a chest that looked like hamburger meat. He's more of a boy than a man. Hold his mouth open, Joseph said to Henderson. The specialist wrestled with the soldier's jaw, finally prying it open. Joseph inserted a laryngoscope, a flashlight with a 90-degree blade on it, to see that he was deploying the endotracheal tube beyond the vocal cords. The tube slid down his throat. Joseph put his ear next to each of the man's lungs to ensure he was breathing properly. With the airway open, the man would survive for the time being. Bag him! Joseph shouted. Henderson placed a resuscitation bag over his face and squeezed it in a regular rhythm. Using tweezers, Joseph removed pieces of metal and ripped fabric from the boy's shredded flesh. He unwrapped a Vaseline gauze and wrapped it around the soldier's chest wound to ensure air didn't leak out. Joseph wiped his forehead. The soldier needed emergency surgery, and Joseph didn't have the capabilities here. More shouting emerged from outside, and tires burned rubber. No more, he thought, but it grew quiet, and he knew the soldiers outside were gone. Joseph moved to the next red marker. The man's face and arms were severely burned. The tourniquet wrapped around his upper thigh and prevented him from bleeding out long ago. Get fluids in him now, Joseph commanded. With a snap, Joseph slipped on new gloves and began the emergency surgery process. He scrubbed the soldier's leg wound and started the excoriating process of removing fragments, bits of clothing and dirt from wounds caused when the velocity of the bullet vacuumed foreign particles into the wound cavity. His tweezers clamped around a large fragment and it clinked as he dropped it into a silver tray. Blood spurted on his face. It must have inadvertently moved a clot. Hand me the hemostatic agent, he commanded. Henderson handed him a brown package filled with the small granules that would save the man's life. He ripped it open and dumped it into the wound. The spurting blood vessel calmed down with the white sand-like hemostatic agent setting to work clotting the wound. Get me the pressure bandage. Henderson handed it over, and Joseph wrapped the soldier's leg tight with the bandages. After the excruciating makeshift surgery, Joseph only had to deal with the burns that had spread across the man's face. The man would lose the use of one of his eyes, if not both. He washed the burns on his face, scrubbing the skin. He applied wound filler, followed by antibiotic powder. Controversial, but it hopefully saves his life from infection. 
the man's life would still be in question for days. Only when the last men were stabilized did he allow himself rest. Hours had passed. He swept up a bottled water and guzzled it, taking a seat near the edge of the tent. The patient's chests rose and fell, many slower than they should. So much death. So many innocent people dead. That night, Colonel Jackson checked on his men. He made rounds around the cots. He breezed past Joseph. Come, Jackson said. Joseph stood up and tailed him like a whipped dog. Night had crept up on Joseph without him noticing. The air outside the tent was pure, not defiled by the blood, sweat, and tears of the wounded. The moonlight shone off of Jackson's ghostly bald head. How are my boys doing? he asked. Two are dead, and I don't expect Jefferson to make it through the night. Thomas, I give a fifty-fifty chance, but he will most likely lose the use of one of his eyes. Damn it all to hell, Colonel Jackson cursed. He shook his head. Not here. This wasn't supposed to happen. They stood in silence for a moment, until Jackson took a pack of cigarettes from his top breast pocket, pulling a white cigarette straight from the pack with his lips. Cigarette, doctor? Jackson said, speaking from the corner of his tight lips. Joseph almost laughed at the colonel, but then at the same time, it sounded delicious. A few weeks ago, I would have asked you if you were crazy. But you know, time is too short to worry about that now. Colonel Jackson grunted and struck up a lighter for Joseph. They stood in silence for a minute. The colonel's guttural voice broke the night air. I lost five soldiers today, a dozen to desertion last week. We have thirty to forty men unable to perform their duties and aid in the medical tent now with you. Do you know how many soldiers I started with? Joseph shook his head in the darkness. No, Colonel, he said. His understanding of military organizations was limited to television and the news. We started with 234 in the Artillery Battalion and 358 in the Combat Infantry Battalion. 592 United States Army soldiers, the toughest, most professional military organization on the planet. Now I have less than 200, most of those being the artillery troopers. How many grunts left? He shook his head and snorted. What am I wasting my breath on you for, Doctor? You don't understand military matters. Joseph took a drag off his cigarette and tried to keep a cough inside his chest. His limbs were woozy as the smoke filled his lungs, and he relaxed at the same time. No, Colonel Jackson, I don't. I was in Africa when this first started. I saw a village of people become infected and fall ill. Within the week, they started to die and consume each other. We were extracted to the embassy in Kinshasa, and within hours it was under assault from the undead, there was a terror attack. Most people died. Colonel Jackson's eyes flashed respect for a moment. It faded into the precipice of his soul. Joseph exhaled smoke. I thought I had samples of patient zero. We were going to stop this. Then on the return flight from Kinshasa, there was another outbreak amongst the staffers. And if it weren't for the valiant effort of a team of counterterrorism agents, I wouldn't be here today. When we landed, McCone International had already been compromised. Do you know what that meant? Colonel Jackson didn't answer. Oddly enough, the heavy guns had stopped their barrage, and the camp was quiet. It meant that I didn't have samples of patient zero. I wasn't at the initial outbreak. The disease has mutated so fast we can't keep up. But if we had patient zero, however a long shot that is, we could isolate the original mutation what I think is a cross from primate to human. If we had that person, that one person, we might have a slim chance of stopping the disease. A slim chance, but a chance, Joseph said. He took another hit off his cigarette and coughed out loud this time. Colonel Jackson looked at him grimly. There is no hope for a cure, he said. Joseph tossed his cigarette butt and stepped on it. Colonel Jackson's thin lips tightened even more. No, Colonel, but there is a man in Michigan, and I have his address. He may be our only hope to finding some sort of vaccine, maybe someday a cure. In time, I could make your soldiers immune to the disease. 
I need you to take me there. You are the only one who can make sure I get there alive. Colonel Jackson's Cro-Magnon skull glistened. That is out of the question. My orders are to stay here and contain the infected in Pittsburgh. I would be court-martialed if not outright shot to go on such a mission. Rage boiled up in Joseph. Eventually, hordes of the undead will come through here and overrun this camp, and you will have contributed only more infected to this war. Jackson looked like he was going to rip Joseph's head off and spit down his throat. Joseph didn't care. When was the last time you heard from the other quarantine bases? When was the last time you received orders from a superior not in a protective bunker? Somebody who knows what is going on out here. Every day, more and more dead make their way here. We are alone. We are on our own. The government response has failed, but we can still win. The words gave him hope. We might still survive. Colonel Jackson was no idiot. He would have to understand. As a member of the United States military, you have a responsibility to protect this nation. Please, help me save this nation, Joseph pleaded. This man couldn't be blind to what was happening. Time was vital. It meant saving lives, their lives included. Colonel Jackson stiffened, his posture becoming rigid. Jackson leaned into Joseph. His face hovered an inch away from Joseph's. Do you take me for an imbecile? Do you think I can't see what is happening to this unit, this military, this country? He lowered his voice. Do you think I can't see that everything that the United States has built is crumbling in a blink of an eye? Everything that we have fought so hard for? I see it, Joseph. These are my men out here dying. Those boys you treated in that tent are mine. I am the one who is responsible for them. I am the one who decides whether or not to send them into the jaws of hell. It is me who they look to, to take them home. He flicked his cigarette butt onto the ground and twisted his boot on top of it. Jackson pointed at the tent. The men in that tent were trying to help some civilians that were trapped when they were supposed to be making contact with the quarantine base boa. Now we have a whole new threat. By God, if it isn't bad enough, we have to deal with a bunch of undead cannibals. Now we have to deal with domestic terrorists. I had a unit today leave the base with no orders. Do you understand? Joseph gulped. No, he whispered. They left the base with no commands. I don't know where they are or what they've done. And even if they come back, do you expect me to punish them? Do you expect me to lock up a platoon when we are in a war of extermination? Not if I want to remain in charge. He eyed Joseph. You don't want someone else in charge of these men. The country is breaking, and there is nothing I can do to stop it except follow my orders and hope that somebody higher up the food chain has this figured out. He looked at Joseph for a long time, his eyes pools of black, before turning his back. Victory in war is not repetitious, but adapts its form endlessly, Colonel. Joseph said. The virus is. They met eye to eye. Joseph knew he was right. We stay, Colonel Jackson said. Good night, doctor. Jackson walked away. Joseph wandered back into his medical tent. His mind was in a daze. This is not a conventional war. This was an unconventional war at best. But Joseph knew this wasn't even like the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, but a whole new animal. An animal that the United States Armed Forces wasn't ready to face. They wouldn't have a chance to regroup. Joseph needed someone who was willing to gamble. Joseph knew that man, Mark Steele, and he was dead. Mauser, Backbone Peak, West Virginia Mauser's feet sank deep into the mud. The mud slurped as it sucked him down. He lifted his foot free, feeling like a bug stuck in flypaper. Mobile and hostile and stuck in the fucking mud. The twisted stink of the brown goop mixed with decaying flesh assaulted him. The stench was a punch to his gut, making him recoil in disgust. He managed to stand upright, flailing his elbows to catch his balance, his hands still tied together. The moonshiners hollered at him from above. 
their faces shadowed like demons by a hellish firelight. Eager bastard, Puck bellowed. A smile cracked his boulder of a head. He don't even know where to go, Casey laughed, his mustache twitching like rat whiskers. Mauser had no choice but to ignore them. They were the least of his problems. Ahmed, he screamed. Ahmed grappled with an infected, his back smearing along the mud wall. Its face inched closer to Ahmed's, teeth clanking together. His hands slipped over its skin. Ahmed's feet shifted, trying to gain footing in the sludge beneath them. More mud-doused people came for their fresh meat. Help! Ahmed yelled at him from the corner. Mauser squared himself to the mass of dead. They were entirely red with mud. Their clothes had melded together, skin with cloth and cloth with skin. The mud accelerated the decomposition process, leaving flesh clean to bones like stretch-thin bubblegum. Mauser launched himself for the infected. He drove himself into the undead. Flesh squished beneath his fists as he shoved and ripped them, unfazed by his assault. He strained with his calves as he drove into them. Keeping them stacked was the only way to survive. Using his hands like a hammer, he backhanded a man into the mud and double-hand punched another into the others. Collapsing backward, they fell into one another. They flopped and flung stinking brown matter. He shoved another and threw him back into the wall. Black gore drooled down the undead man's lipless face. It growled through its perpetual skeletal grin. The wall of death wavered, but only gave him a moment of respite. Mauser's chest burst for air, the sudden onset of hand-to-hand -hand combat taxing his system. He swung an elbow wildly backward as a hand dug into his shoulder. Ahmed barely dodged him. I thought you were toast, Mauser breathed. His chest heaved. Ahmed showed him a red rock the size of a softball in his hand. Always bring a rock to a fist fight, Ahmed said. His fist blurred past Mauser and slammed the rock atop an infected skull. Its skull crunched, and the infected dropped face down into the mud. Try and keep that body beneath us. Better footing, Mauser said. More undead slipped, crawled, and crawled their way for him. They were a muddy circus of death. Mauser leaned back, adjusting the body of the fallen undead. The gleeful faces of their captors watched from above their mountain gladiatorial combat. I got a jar of old Barnum's favorite hooch that the city boy gets at first, Puck called out. I'll take you up on that. That Terry is a goner, Casey shouted. Double or nothing on the Arab, Chuck squealed. His pig-like jaws jiggled in delight. Mauser frantically searched the edges of the pit for a way out, mocked by the sinister grins of his captors. No way out, baby, One-Eyed Sue said. She smiled down at him. Fucking One-Eyed Sue. Mauser hated them even more. He jumped onto the mud wall trying to climb out, slipping and sliding down its face. How the hell can I climb out without my hands free? Only a hand from above could pull them free of this mess. Ahmed's voice shook as he spoke. They're coming. Escape was so close. Gwen was there, too. She looked away from them. Any ideas? He screamed at her. She was silent, her face dour. He spun, fury rising inside him. Let's give him a show, then. I'll grab them, you mash them, Mauser said. I've got to be quick, a mongoose, but this mud is making me no better than a three-toed sloth. The zombies pushed closer to him and Ahmed, a host of brown, soulless ghouls in a never-ending struggle to consume them. Mauser sidestepped and pulled a zombie by his neck face-first at Ahmed while giving another a shove into his buddies. He double fist-punched an infected woman with long, thin hair in the face, sending her flying backwards. She snarled as she went down, arms thrashing in the mud. His arms erupted upward into the chin of a man in disintegrating overalls. It fell into the mud walls, unable to stand back up. Hands dug into his leg like claws, raking flesh from calf. Using Mauser's leg, an infected face emerged from the mud pit floor. It pulled itself out from the confines of its semi-earthen prison. Mauser stomped down with his other foot three times, the crack of bones sounding louder than the squishing mud. Another one down. We can do this. Ahmed rushed past him, more of a wobbling slog, and smacked his rock into the face of another infected. He whirled, throwing a series of punches with his rock and assassinated another.
Ahmed took a few steps back to gain his wind, and Mauser took two heavy steps forward. Mauser's ankle turned sideways off something hard beneath him. He felt a crack. A roar went up from the crowd. Pain shot up his foot into his leg, and he fell backward. Shit. The mud gobbled up his tied hands, and he sank into it. Before he could sit up, an infected toppled onto him. The infected's jaw worked like a starving man at a feast. Mauser pushed the man's mouth away from his and sank deeper into the bog for his efforts. The reeking mud enveloped Mauser, accepting him into her fetid womb, and another infected plunged upon him, forcing him farther into the sludge. The mud molded around his body, lapping his face like rank chocolate pudding. It violated his ears, muffling the sounds of struggle as it creeped its way around his face. The pounding of blood in his head overcame Ahmed's faint yells. Mauser's focus zeroed on one thing, the infected man trying to kill him. Half the infected's face had melted away, its molars grinding together exposed by an open wound. Its nose was a cavern, deep and black, its eye socket a mere soupy hole, and a speckled white tendon held its jaw together. A jaw that bent low, trying to take a chunk out of Mauser's face. Mauser fought with all his might, the mud holding him in a bear hug like a Russian bouncer. Maybe suffocating in mud would be better, less painful if he'd just embrace it. More hands scratched at his arms and legs. He let them press him slowly into the pit's floor. One more breath before I go under. I have saved so many from drowning. Now it will be my demise. Muted sounds surrounded him. His heart felt like it was going to explode. He fought to keep his limbs out of the mouths of his attackers. His body panicked as it realized he had stopped taking in oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide. Sorry, old pal. At that point, he knew he would die. Gwen, Backbone Peak, West Virginia Fear paralyzed her. It riddled her body with ice, freezing her in place. Her friends fought in slow motion, their lives hanging with each swing of a fist and clack of gore-stained teeth. Mauser's fingers grasped out of the mud from beneath a pile of infected. His fingers curled around the torso of the nearest dead. Ahmed fought like mad. He lowered his shoulder into the infected and knocked them off balance. He slammed the rock into their faces. She was stuck in a virtual painting, forced to watch the life-and-death struggle of her loved ones. Puck's heavy arm wrapped around her shoulders, a straitjacket grip. Well, look at that. The old city boy went down first, he said. Gwen lowered her eyes. She couldn't watch anymore. I'm too late for them. A tear trickled down her cheek. Puck's iron fingers wrapped around her jaw, forcing her face back to the fight below. Watch, he growled. Mauser was limp beneath the bodies. Ahmed continued a losing battle for his life. Puck shouted out over the pit, Looks like you owe me a jar of the good stuff. Damn, Puck, you always pick him right. Casey slapped his leg in disgust. You see that, boy? He clapped Eddie on the back. His shackled wrists clanked together, his chains hanging below his knees. Yes, master. Eddie mumbled, head bowed. Ahmed wrestled with a pile of dead, striking out with his fists at the dead. They will die, and nothing you did helped them. Gwen's mind mocked her. Her eyes drifted from the death of her friends. Something caught her attention in the woods. A shadow moved near the pine tree surrounding their camp. A long, dirty beard shadowed by the light. Mark? Am I going crazy? She wiggled her head free of Puck's grasp, but when she looked back, Mark's phantom was gone. Why do you still haunt me, love? Her hope sank into the pit with her friends, and her heart fled with Mark's specter. Shouts of laughter made her look back upon the pit fight. Ahmed ripped bodies from on top of Mauser, kicking, kneeing, punching, and throwing the dead. He's gone. Mauser's heads were limp, shifting only with the movement of the bodies atop of him. Gwen's eyes kept returning to the trees. A shadow reappeared. He walked slowly, following along the tree line. Are infected in the camp again? Gwen almost raised the alarm, but something deep inside held her tongue. Fuck these people. I'd rather die than help them. The herb is a better fighter than he looks, Puck said, sounding a bit impressed. 
Ahmed backhanded a mud-drenched infected into the sludge. He fell into the mud, exhausted from his battles, and sank to his knees. The infected man grabbed Ahmed and pulled him down. Gwen did a double-take. Infected Mark stalked behind Henry, who had inched up near the pit to catch a glimpse of the fight. She gulped as blood spurted from his neck, and the man was yanked backwards, a firm hand around his chin. Infected Mark dragged the man across the ground. Henry's feet begged for traction. The body and infected Mark disappeared into the darkness. Her last glimpse of them was only Henry's lifeless feet bent sideways. Huck shook her. What are you looking at, woman? Why aren't you watching the fun? Gwen smiled as prettily as she could up at him. Nothing, dear. Just the festivities. She almost choked on the last word. Crack, crack, crack. Gunfire erupted from the edge of the camp. The blasts roared in the night, overpowering the moonshiner's laughs with gunshot. They stopped hooting and peered drunkenly in the direction of the gunfire. Only firelight danced among the trees. What's that all about? Fat Chuck called out. Huck stood up, pushing her away, his hand hefting his AK-47 to his hip. He walked to the other side of the pit. Casey and Owen, check that out. Huck called out. He gestured with his index finger into the darkness. He stopped and squinted, eyes narrowing. An infected tumbled from the darkness as if it had spawned right into the camp. It fell into Puck. Puck embraced the fiend in a tight bear hug. He picked it up and threw it into the pit with a flick of his arms. How the hell? He shouted. He turned to his terrified comrades. Infected poured into the light. Puck shoved an infected to the ground and bashed its skull in with the stock of his rifle. Snatching up his axe, he howled, They're inside! Fight! Scores of infected responded to his call as his fellow moonshiners scattered in every direction. Owen screamed as three infected brought him down from behind, tearing into his back. Dark red organs wriggled in their hands as they ripped into him. Puck swung his axe like a barbarian. It swished back and forth, cleaving with one end, bashing with the other. With his other hand, he fired the AK-47, bursting off rounds on full auto into the dark. The moans of the dead rang loud and free as they already celebrated their victory over the living. Infected Mark emerged from the shadows. A long wound ran along his scalp. He stared at Gwen blankly, then ran for her. Mark, she cried out softly. You return to me like this? Just stay dead. He bounded closer and closer. Her heart wept. Blood stained his beard and clothes. His head was hideously damaged where he had been shot. His hands gripped her elbows. She turned away, knowing that at any moment, his mouth that had kissed her lips, caressed her skin, whispered sweet nothings, driven her mad, and sang at the top of his lungs on so many occasions, would betray her. His mouth would rip into her flesh, instantly infecting her with the virus as it tore her skin and lips away from her body. She closed her eyes. She squeezed them tight so that the terrors of the night couldn't reach her. It's me, he whispered. He looked over her shoulder. Grab Eddie and help Mauser and Ahmed out of the pit. His apparition uttered. He squeezed her arms and released her. When she cracked her eyes open, he was gone like it was a dream. Eddie hobbled around the pit. I'll help you, Eddie said, eyes wide in fear. She ignored him as she watched Mark march away from her. Hey, you! The mountain of a man turned. Yeah, you, you big fuck. Let's do this, Mark cursed. Puck pointed his AK-47 right at Mark. Mark charged straight for him, and Puck grinned underneath his beard as he squeezed the trigger. Click, click. Steel darted around him. In and out he weaved, jabbing and slicing at the large man with a knife. Gwen was in shock. Mark was still alive. He was here and alive. The pressure of two hands wrapped around her ankle. Soiled fingers gripped her leg. I got too close. She kicked at it with her other foot, but the hands had a vice-like grip. She tipped backward onto her butt and struggled in reverse. Eddie yanked on the hand, unable to pull her free. The hands held on, and a bloody, mud-caked red head poked out of the pit. Mauser. Eddie pulled his arms up. Mauser collapsed on the ground. His chest heaved heavily, but he forced himself back up. Ahmed! Mauser yelled at her. They both scrambled to the edge of the pit. They all reached for Ahmed, 
His eyes pleaded for them. His arms reached for any part of them he could get his hands on. Grab him, Mauser grunted. Gwen's hand slipped through Ahmed's. The mud made him as slippery as an eel. Infected clawed at Ahmed's back, pulling him back down into the sludge. Ahmed jumped up again, his feet never leaving the mud pit. I can't reach. Ahmed strained. Gwen ran to Owen's body. His carbine lay nearby, his hand twitching as the dead consumed him. She snatched it up. Ignoring the blood slicking her hand, she quickly pulled it from his grasp before the infected woman feasting on him noticed she was close. She spun and sprinted to the pit. She squeezed the trigger at the dead faces staring back at her. Her first shots missed, but as she worked the trigger, her shots cleaned up. Her bullets disappeared into the dead's heads, turning them to mush. Mark. Turning on her heels, she pointed the carbine at Puck and Mark. The men were locked in a combatant's deadly embrace. They grunted and strained for advantage over the other. Puck's tree-trunk arms engulfed Mark's body. Mark's back bent, and he wedged his hands into Puck's hips like a hinge, creating space. Gwen tried to line up a shot, her arms swaying as she tried to place the front sight with the rear sight. Puck and Mark staggered back and forth. She couldn't take the shot without hitting Mark. Mark needs your help, she screamed. Mauser looked at her, confused, but Ahmed ran to help. Within a second, Mauser was right behind him, hobbling to his best friend's aid. Ahmed left his feet, putting a shoulder into Puck's side. Puck stood upright, wrapping an arm around both Ahmed and Mark like an older brother with his younger siblings, holding the men at bay. Mauser, reaching the fray, planted a savage kick into the side of Puck's knee. The knee cracked, and the giant's leg sunk inwards. The giant toppled like a tree. The ground shook. She was sure of it. In a flurry of blows, Mark, Ahmed, and Mauser rained fists upon Puck until he quit moving. She felt a pang of pity in her heart for the hillbilly, but she quickly forgot him. The three men approached, each man hardly recognizable. Mark stepped closer than the rest and draped his arms around her body. She felt stiff and rigid, cold beneath his embrace. His mere presence was a contradictory betrayal. We gotta get out of here, man, Mauser said. In his freed hands, he held Puck's wood axe. He cleaved a wide-eyed zombie's forehead, splitting it in two. Can I have this? Mark said. He relieved Gwen of the carbine, prying it from her white-knuckled grip. He inspected it, turning it over in his hands. Never thought I'd see this again, he said. A short smile touched his lips. Gwen's heart jumped. The women are in the shed. She pushed free of Mark and made a sprint for their prison. No time. We have to run, Ahmed said, panting. She ignored them all. Moans of the undead followed her in the night, but she ignored them and the shouts of her friends as she ran for the shed. Two infected pounded the door with open palms. She could hear terrified cries from within. Help! Help us! The woman inside the shed called. What am I going to kill them with? Muzzle flashed yellow in the night, and an infected dropped. Mark stepped up next to her and fired another shot. It entered and exited the skull of the infected. The infected man joined his comrade in a heap of exploded brain matter. He grabbed her elbow. Slow down. It's not safe. She shook her arm free from him and ran for the shed. She pushed the door open. Lindsay? Lucia? She said softly. They stood in the back against the wall. It's okay, it's me, Gwen, she said. Mark's rifle banged with quick shots. The hairs in the back of her neck stood up straight. Something wasn't right. A fist blurred into her eye. Gwen fell to the damp earthen floor, and cold hands seized her throat, squeezing the air from her. Panicked, she grabbed for anything. She found her assailant's hair and yanked to the side. The woman yelled out in pain, giving Gwen the opportunity to roll over on top. You bitch! You ruined everything! Ashley spat in her face. Screw you, you whore! Gwen cursed and sent a quick fist to the center of Ashley's face. Ashley's head thudded off the ground. Gwen hit her again. It feels so good to punch this bitch! Her next fist split Ashley's lip. Her second cracked her nose. And before her third, someone pulled her off. Let me go! Gwen sputtered, swinging her arms at her captor. Lean, muscled arms spun her around like a dance, and she came eye to eye with Mark's dark blue eyes. 
Gwen, stop, Mark said. He kissed her cheek. Tears rolled down Gwen's face. Her eyes smarted from where she had been hit. Her heart beat loudly in her chest. Mark was supposed to be dead. She beat his chest with empty fists. You, you asshole, she cried out. Mark brought her in tight. You were gone. I saw you die. You, you were dead. Gwen mumbled into his chest. His clothes stunk like sweat and coppery blood. She rode an emotional roller coaster of pain and suffering. Her body melted in his arms, the only safe place in the world to be. Something dragged along the wall of the shed. Two women emerged from the shadows in filthy nightgowns. Mark released her. Gwen reached for them and wrapped her arms around the women. They cried quietly against her. Ashley propped herself up on the wall, hand nursing her jaw. Don't get any ideas, Ash. You're going to pay, Gwen scolded. Lucia murmured softly, Maria. She's gone, Gwen whispered to Lucia, holding her tight. Ashley gave her a sullen look, and then a look of fear crossed her face when she recognized Mark for the first time. Recognition crossed his eyes, and they narrowed. Listen up, bitch. I have no problem putting a bullet in you, Mark growled. He grabbed the door handle and peered outside. Fuck, he cursed, slamming the shed door shut. He pulled out the mag from his carbine and hammered it back into the gun. Ten rounds. Not enough to break through the pack coming this way. I'm open to suggestions, Mark said. Seconds later, the slapping of hands and the calls of the dead filled the small shed. Mark put his back against the door. The latch jangled as infected pushed in on the rickety wooden door. Bloody, dirty hands reached through the separation created as they forced it open. I can't hold this, Mark strained. Gwen held the other women close, looking Mark in the eye. Mark nodded and tossed her his carbine. She snatched it out of the air. She thrust the gun into her shoulder. Let them come. Steel. Backbone Peak, West Virginia. Steele was losing his battle against the door. His feet slid, digging dirt from the floor out from under his clinging toes. Hands of the infected curled around the door. He roared and arched his back. The door slammed closed again with the snap, crackles, and pops of broken limbs. Gwen, shoot quick and run, he said. Gwen nodded. Her lips were flat and grim. One, two, he took a deep breath. Three. Steele sidestepped and let the infected pour through the door. The first few fell to the ground. More infected clambered over bodies, and Gwen fired shot after shot point-blank into their faces. Blood and gore ejected from their bodies as the AR-15 bellowed its battle song. When the carbine went dry, dull ringing replaced its war chant. Steele worked the infected from the side, using their frontward distraction to his advantage. He rammed his knife into the eye socket of an infected, and he pushed hard, shoving the lifeless body into two more infected. He front-kicked the remaining one in the doorway. Move! He screamed at the women. They bolted into the night. He stepped outside and immediately rolled his shoulders to dodge a bite from a woman using the walls of the shed as a prop. He backstepped into the arms of a forest green-clad West Virginia state trooper. Steele grappled with the larger man, locking his arm around the trooper's elbow and shoving his knife into the officer's neck. The knife grated, and Steele grunted as he forced the blade into his spine. The infected trooper slumped, and Steele relieved him of his Smith & Wesson 4566 45 caliber sidearm and eight-round magazines, feeling the weight of the large pistol in his hand. From his training, he knew that they were double-action firearms and had no safety. Only more pressure poundage on the trigger prevented the shooter from firing the gun. The women were out ahead of him now, and Steele had to play catch-up. More infected came for them in a disorganized manner. Lindsay screamed as she was tripped up by a crawling infected. Gwen spun around, a wall of dead closing behind her. Their victim was separated from the pack. Arm in arm with Lucia, Gwen turned and ran, Ashley a few steps behind. Help! Lindsay called out, kicking at the infected hands. Steele was the only one close now. Steele racked around into the chamber and ran to her aid. He shot the crawler in the head and fired rounds into the encroaching others. He stooped down next to her. Let me see, he said. 
Her hand shook as blood seeped through her fingertips. She sniffled and tears trickled down her cheeks in streaks. The skinny brunette sobbed openly. She is no more than a girl. Her collarbone sat exposed above her soiled nightgown, arms thin from mistreatment. Please help me, she cried. Every single ounce of him wanted to help her. His mind fought his gut instinct, knowing she would die and turn into one of them. Tiny microbes in her body were already mutating, destroying her insides and converting her into one of the infected. Gwen and Lucia ran for the mobile lounge, a parade of infected trailing behind them. We have to go, Steele said. His eyes said more than his words. I'm okay, I swear, Lindsay sobbed. She released the pressure from her ankle, and the blood flowed forth from the hole. He hauled her upright, her body the weight of a child. They wobbled ten feet, and she screamed out in pain, forcing him to set her down again. He stared into her watery brown eyes. She knew. He knew. I'm sorry. I have to go, he said, scanning the area around them. We are very much out in the open. No one survived the bite. She pleaded with her eyes for life. I can't take you with us. You'll turn, he said. But you just rescued us. Now you're going to leave me. I wanted to help you, but now I can't. I can't save you. His mouth formed a determined half-frown. Steele aimed his gun at the top of her skull, point blank. Her brown hair was tangled, and she was filthy, roughly fifteen pounds lighter than when they had first met. She had been through a hell that most people would have given up on long ago. A mix of fear and pain clouded her eyes. The milkiness of her eyes had begun to settle in, still the doe eyes of the innocent. She blinked rapidly, almost as if she batted her eyelashes at him, but it was the fear of the bullet. You must carry out this sentence. You did not condemn her, but you must show her mercy. Steele let his fingers slowly compress the trigger, till the sound of the blast echoed through his ears. Lindsay's body slumped down in a pile like a small rag doll left behind by a child. He had killed someone he considered a friend. Not only killed, but literally blew her brains out. It was mercy, a mercy killing. Steele spit the bad taste from his mouth. He sprinted through trees. Branches whipped his skin, stinging his flesh. Gwen! he yelled hoarsely. Only the dead turned his way. He fled before them. He kept running until he came to a clearing. Over here! Gwen called out from behind a tree. He met her and tiny Lucia behind cover. Ashley lurked near them, but not with them. A wall of bone, flesh, and virus formed between them and the mobile lounge. The dead searched for more victims, unknowingly claiming victory over the moonshiner camp. Steele knelt down, catching his breath his chest burning like fire from fighting. There are more following me, he said to them. Gwen looked back. The people mover sat idling, lights flashing in the night. It was impossible for Mauser to know where they would pop out. Once he started shooting, both the dead and Mauser would know they were close. Try and get Mauser's attention, Steele said. When the dead get within ten yards, I will start shooting. He started his methodical shooting. Boom. He dropped a woman in a denim outfit. Boom. He dropped a man in overalls, missing most of his face. The ladies shouted at the mobile lounge, waving their hands and trying to get Mauser's attention. Round after round struck their target, but for every one he took down, it seemed like two more took their place. Click. The hammer slammed home and nothing happened. Time to go on hands on. Gwen, would you mind handing me the carbine? He said to her. Gwen was here, and his favorite carbine was in his hands. Just the way he remembered them, only a lot more dirty. His heart sank as the dead made for them. There are too many. We are going to die. The rumble of the giant diesel engine gave him hope. Lights flickered as it barreled forward, but not far enough. It rolled to a stop on the edge of the hill, waiting for them, and gunfire cracked from its windows. We've got to run to him, Steele shouted. His eyes met Gwen's. Whatever happens, keep moving. Steele faced the enemy and charged, not waiting for the women. Hopefully the dead will all converge on me. He swung his way through the pack of undead, wielding his rifle like Davy Crockett at the Alamo. 
Mark Steele, King of the Fucking Dead Frontier, Sultan of SWAT. With some help from Mauser shooting out the window, they made it to the airport mobile lounge. They ran as fast as they could. There was a dodging contest all the way to the people mover's tires. Steele hoisted up Lucia and then Gwen. Ashley followed them. She either came with them or died. Did she deserve to die? Yes. Steele snarled at the trashy blonde. His fingers dug into her shoulders and tears filled her eyes as she begged for mercy. He hated her. She had put his people through hell. She had put him through hell. Can I just let her die? Even the scum of the earth deserve judgment. Even the worst people deserve mercy. Can I live knowing I fed someone to these monsters? Hurry up, was all he could muster, and he hoisted her up like a cheerleader by her hips. Mauser's shaggy-haired face grinned down at Steel, followed by Kevin. Give me your hand, you big tough son of a bitch, Mauser said, shoving his hand at Steel. Up you go, Kevin grunted. Steel locked forearms with his friends, a warrior's embrace forearm to forearm, and jumped up. As Mauser and Kevin pulled Steele up, he was surprised by a tight squeeze around his own waist. Heavy weight pulled him down, and he slipped back inch by inch. Mauser's grip strained, tightening on Steele's arm. Steele's head exploded with stars, the ground forcing the breath from his body. Steele covered his face as Puck's huge fist slammed into the side of Steele's head. Steele kept his arms in close to his head, trying to deflect the blows. The rain of punches was wild and slow, but dominating. If he connects, I'm done. Puck's face had a dark, ghostly delight as he struck downward. You are the one, he growled. Thought we got rid of you. He punched down into Steele's elbow, causing pain to shoot into his shoulder. Steele was silent, using all his focus to keep a heavy blow from putting him out. He tried to thrust his hips upward to displace Puck's weight, but Puck was a ton of rocks on his chest. Steele wrapped his arms around his bare-sized back, clinching in tight, but the man's hand pushed Steele into the ground and wrapped around his neck, engulfing his throat. Gravel dug deep into the back of Steele's skull. His ears beat as blood pounded in his veins. He danced around consciousness. Steele! People's voices echoed around him. A voice staggered in from the side and jumped on Puck. Puck growled only long enough to remove a paw from Steel to shove the infected down. Steel struck his other arm with chops to the brachial nerve that ran along the shoulder into the neck. The grip loosened and Steel scooted away from him as another infected crashed into Puck and another. Steel coughed hysterically as oxygen entered his crushed throat. More freshly blooded infected pounced onto Puck. Steel jumped to his feet and ran for the mover. An infected lunged for him, bony fingers causing him to stumble. He kept his feet and jumped into Mauser's waiting arms. The two friends collapsed on one another onto the mover floor. I could kiss you, you big buffoon, Steele said. One of Mauser's cheeks was puffed up and the other was gaunt. He had the face of a prisoner. Hook her up then, Mauser said. Steele settled for helping his friend upright. You used to be pretty. Mauser said, inspecting Steele's head wound. But damn, you are ugly now. I know, he faced Gwen. Are you okay? Gwen held Lucia in a seat across from them, and she nodded. Eddie sat, still shackled, his head in his hands. Kevin stood nearby. Glad you made it here, Steele said, reaching for Kevin's hand. Kevin nodded furiously. Me too. Steele peered out the open doors of the mover at Puck's demise. Infected pulled at him from every angle. It was like a pack of hounds bringing down a bear. Infected clung to him, tore at him, bit him, and Puck howled as their teeth sank into his body. Steele snagged up his carbine. Mauser handed Steele a fresh mag. He slid it into place. Puck still fought madly, but now he bled from a dozen bite wounds on his body. He swung two infected together like he was banging two cymbals. Their heads smacked together, a mangled mess of bone and brain. Steel lined up his red dot sights on Puck's forehead. The man swung wildly at the infected. There were just too many now, and Puck sank to his knees. The infected took huge chunks from his arms and neck. His arms stretched out as if he were on a cross. 
Steele lowered the weapon and looked over his sights. Puck made eye contact with Steele, growling over the pain. Kill me! He screamed at Steele. Steele continued to look down at his enemy's demise. Kill him, Steele, Kevin said from behind. He rested a hand on Steele's back. Please kill him, or hand me the gun, he said softer. The pain in his voice cracked. Steele turned slightly to Kevin. Kevin had a pained expression on his face. Kill me now! Huck called up, begging for mercy. A fat infected in a t-shirt joined the pile around Puck and took a massive bite from his scalp, ripping hair and flesh from his skull. Shoot him, Steel! Kevin's voice rose in anger. My brother deserves to die better than this! Blood meandered down Puck's face, his body shaking as the virus attacked his blood. Steel lined up the tiny red dot sight near the center of his broad head and pulled the trigger. Mercy or justice? I bear them both for they mean death, and a death I wield with a heavy hand. Kinnick, Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia Kinnick straightened the collar of his neutral-colored Army combat uniform. Bland greens, slight grays, and sand tans stretched over his torso, having been designed for urban, woodland, and desert combat situations. A universal pattern, they call it better than the airman battle dress uniform from the early 2000s. He laughed to himself, as long as it doesn't snow. His uniform was on loan from the Department of Defense. It was unlikely that they would ever get this uniform back. He looked at himself in the mirror. His eyes had dark circles surrounding them. He looked like the walking dead, or the dead walking. Smear some blood on me and I could be them. He smiled grimly, straightening his shirt. No choice but to carry on, good soldier. He checked his watch. Dawn was breaking, and his team should already be prepping. It was time. He ran a hand over his thigh-holstered Beretta 9mm. Hefting his pack, he walked down a corridor following a red line along the floor. Two heavy blast doors easily pushed open with their advanced hydraulic system, and he stepped into the Pentagon courtyard. Soldiers scurried back and forth preparing for his team's departure. Two Sikorsky UH-60 Blackhawk helicopters sat perched in the center of the courtyard, like a noble pair of griffins resting. A small contingent of men who had flown in early that morning attended them. A minor testament to the remaining American military might. It was the best General Travis had left at his disposal. A greasy, brown-bearded man swaggered over to where Kinnick surveyed the courtyard. He spit a wad of tobacco on the ground, running a hand over his long, loose hair and pulling it to the back of his head. You must be the full bird I've been waiting on, sir, he said, referring to the nickname for Kinnick's rank. He saluted Kinnick with a crisp hand, and Kinnick returned his salute. That is correct, Master Sergeant. I am retired Colonel Kinnick, United States Air Force, your CO for this operation. Pleased to meet you, sir. I'm your 18Z, Master Sergeant Hunter. Operational Detachment Alpha 51, the Skins Detachment, Alpha Company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Special Forces Group. The Green Beret looked like he hadn't shaved in years, and the parts that a razor touched hadn't been gone over in weeks. On his sleeve, he wore a patch of a skull wearing a wolf headdress with the numbers 51 along the bottom and skins across the top. Hunter eyed him for a moment and shifted the chew in his mouth to the other cheek. Old you out of retirement, huh? Not by choice. Some extenuating circumstances brought me here. Sir Captain Duffy was reassigned so we could take you on. An unusual request. It's not my place to question, but why are they assigning a retired Air Force colonel to this mission? Hunter said. He is testing the waters to see what kind of commander you are. Unique circumstances, Kinnick said. Master Sergeant Hunter's eyes were flat. Were you briefed on the operation? Kinnick asked. Yes, sir. I am the one with the most knowledge on this doctor. That, and there is no one left that's expendable. I'm thinking that makes us lucky to have a full bird in charge. I'm not sure I would call it lucky, Kinnick said. I haven't led men in the field for years, nor have I on solid ground. The operator spit brown juice in affirmation. 
Was hoping you would help us out in the luck department. Luck hasn't been on the menu of late. Kinnick wasn't excited about discussing the privileges of still being alive. Where'd you fly in from? Kinnick asked. Got dropped in all the way from Eglin Air Force Base, Florida. Long way from home, he said. That's correct, sir, but when aren't we? Hunter said. He rolled a can of chewing tobacco out of his pocket and inserted another impressive chew. How close are we to being ready? Kinnick asked. Hunter turned back, surveying the helos. He nodded and wiped some chew from his upper lip. The birds are fueled and loaded up. I have only half of my operational detachment here. That meant Kinnick only had six SF snake eaters at his disposal. Where is the other half of the detachment? Kinnick asked. Is it too much to ask for a full unit of these unconventional bastards? Master Sergeant Hunter's voice went on autopilot. We lost Burns to a legless Zulu near Eglin. Dallas Jr. and Lee were eaten alive while re-establishing a forward operating base outside of Raleigh. Jimenez, our 18 Delta medic, suck-started his SIG. Malone, another medic, and Ward burned alive when an A-10 hit us danger close with a Hydra-70 rocket. Kinnick held up his hand, indicating he had heard enough. Tough losses. Here I am asking where his men are, and I should have assumed that they were dead. I am sorry for your losses, Master Sergeant Hunter. This is a tough time. The muscles on Master Sergeant Hunter's face twitched. We are, too. Who do we have, then? General Travis said my birds would be full. Master Sergeant Hunter gave the men behind him a sideways look. He didn't say anything for a moment, as if he was deciphering what was the best way to put something. Kinnick stared at him. Be frank, Master Sergeant. I need to know what we are working with. Hunter spit some chew on the ground, rubbing it in with his foot. Yes, sir. Follow me. Master Sergeant Hunter brought him closer to the helicopters. The men formed a loose line in front of him for inspection. We have the remaining skins. Termel is the curly black-haired goon over there. He is a weapon sergeant. He prefers a blade, but he is just as adept with any firearm. Termel twirled a Gurkha-styled hookblade in his hand. Sins and skin, sir, he said with a cruel smile. He may be enjoying the apocalypse a bit too much. The grizzly bear pretending to be a man is Lewis. He's another 18 Bravo. He uses his saw like an MP5 so we keep him around. Lewis gave Kinnick a wide grin, throwing an M249 light machine gun onto his shoulders like it was a toy. Hunter continued. The short, stocky bastard is Gibson. He's our communications sergeant. He doesn't look like it, but he can beat any man here in a foot race. The half-Asian dude there is Hawkins, our intelligence sergeant who doubles as our combat medic now that our others are gone. How's it looking for us, Hawk? Not good, the part Asian man said, his mouth flat, features emotionless. Our engineer is Esparza. The Latino man pursed his lips at Kinnick as he loosely held a breaching shotgun in his hands. On his back, he had a pack and a short barrel M4. A heavy satchel rested on his hip. The rest are a smattering of our armed forces. Patton and Bowman are devil dogs, and the rest are staff from every branch. The sixteen men looked at him expectantly. Aside from his green berets, bald or gray-haired men stood next to their gear. Men not far from Kinnick's age. Men who hadn't seen the field in a decade like himself. Men who had been fortunate enough to be in desk assignments inside the Pentagon when the virus struck. But warriors nonetheless. No offense, sir. Here comes the hurt. Many of these men have seen their finest hour. I mean, they were probably in their prime during Persian Gulf, Hunter said and followed with a spit. Persian Gulf won. Kinnick waved a hand. I do not need to be reminded of my age. My knees, back, and neck do that enough. None take it, Master Sergeant. Lucky for you, we don't need to teach these old war dogs any new tricks. Just make sure everyone is on the same page. We have to work with what we got. Make sure we are ready to go in thirty mics, Kinnick said, using a bit of military lingo that rolled nicely off his tongue. Been too long.
Operation Runaway will be a go in 30, Master Sergeant Hunter said, taking his leave. Kinnick cringed. The last thing he needed was the men already feeling like they were being defeated. General Travis had pieced together the last of his gunslingers. It was his way of saying he had full faith in this mission. Operation Runaway Scrape. Usually operational names were catered to make military operations sound politically correct and just. Operation Enduring Freedom or Operation Uphold Democracy. Nothing like Operation We Are Going to Bomb You Into the Stone Age or Operation Bullet to Your Brain. Ever the full-blooded Texan, General Travis had named the operation after his home state's revolt against Mexico, where the Texans had evacuated the homeland on the run from the superior Mexican army. Although the Texans suffered a series of massacres at the hands of the Mexicans, in the end the Texans won. A bit of hope after tough times. I wonder where I fall into that series of battles. Hopefully not Goliath. Master Sergeant Hunter waved over the bear man, Lewis, who grinned at Kinnick, the meaty-pawed salute, and picked up Kinnick's pack. Sir, let me grab that for you. He slung Kinnick's hundred-pound pack on his back as easily as if it were a child's knapsack and spun, walking quickly to the helo. Sergeant Lewis, no need. Can't hear you, sir, but which bird are you riding in, Crockett or Bowie? I'm in Bowie with you and Hunter. Do not take my pack, soldier. What's that? Lewis cupped a free hand to his ear. The soldier marched away, ignoring Kinnick's protests. The gunslingers could be a handful, but it was their way. The pilots had followed Travis's suit, naming their helicopters after Texan independence war heroes. Kinnick laughed to himself. At least these guys still had a sense of humor. They would need it because General Travis had tasked them with an impossible mission. Find the needle in the haystack. More like find a needle at the bottom of the ocean with hundred-pound weights attached to your feet, blindfolded while you bleed out in a feeding frenzy of tiger sharks. At least they would reach the bottom quicker. The two helicopters lifted off the Pentagon courtyard 29 minutes and 30 seconds later. Kinnick slapped on his headset so he wouldn't be deafened by the UH-60 rotor blades cutting through the air. The men took their seats around him dressed in full kit. Extended mags, frag grenades, blades, sidearms, and zip ties decorated their torsos and legs. The helicopter spun around in the air, giving the men a 360-degree view of the destruction of Northern Virginia. My family is out there, and I am leaving. Arlington's glass and steel-clad office buildings sat dormant. Apartment towers smoldered. No traffic inched along Virginia Interstate 66. The PGC defense firm sign, normally glowing blue, settled in a blacked-out gray. White-painted letters spelled out help across their rooftop. The destruction of the capital he had lived in, worked in, and defended gave him a surreal feeling as the helicopter floated upward. It was as if he watched a movie, rather than looked down upon the epicenter of the most powerful nation in the world. I will most likely die on the mission. If my family yet lives... I most certainly will never see them again. He swallowed the lump in his throat. Worst father. Across the Potomac River, Washington, D.C. crumbled like old photos of a bombed-out St. Paul's Cathedral in World War II. Fires burned whole blocks of the capital, with no end in sight, and thick black smoke polluted the air. No firefighters responded. They were all infected, dead, or hiding. Master Sergeant Hunter, in oakly shades to block the rising sun, tapped his shoulder and pointed out at the city. The dome of the Capitol building sunk inward, dark smoke emitting forth from a gaping hole in the iconic white building. The building itself was stained black with soot. Small shapes of people slowly moving across the white steps were no doubt infected. Master Sergeant Hunter smiled. Do you think Congress will have the budget done for the new fiscal year? The bear smiled. Probably will furlough us again. Give me a nice IOU letter for my credit card, Lewis remarked. Yeah, Kinnick whispered into his headset. Despite his men's attempt at levity, the scene hammered away at his soul with a jackhammer. Was there no hope? His heart hurt in his chest. The nation he loved so dearly was dying before their eyes. Gut check time. Time to suck it up and hit the ground running. 
Crockett, take the lead west. Bowie will follow, he said. The pilot nodded and flicked a switch above his head, moving his feet on the yaws. The helicopters tilted on their sides, peering further west into the countryside of northern Virginia. The noose tightened around them. But at least it was a fight. Steel, Hills of West Virginia The mobile lounge's engine emitted a low chug, 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 chug. The windshield was gone and air flowed freely through the vehicle. The cool wind bit at them, cutting through blankets and clothes alike. Bullet holes had riddled the vehicle, and the wind whistled through them. Steele's head throbbed in time with the grind of the engine. In fact, he wondered if the engine's perpetual grinding was intentional, a slow pounding to his skull until it killed him. His headaches were long and fierce, and seemed to come on with a fervor and retreat with no rhyme or reason. He rubbed his brow and caught Gwen staring at him from her seat across the aisle. Concern etched the outline of her face. Clear eyes judged his well-being with the knowingness of a mother, although she had yet to have that privilege. He gave her a faint smile, more of a grimace. I'm fine, he said, soft as a breeze. Anything louder would cause his skull to explode. Her features were soft, but her high cheekbones were more prominent now. She withheld her wide smile that dimpled twice on her right side. Even as worry creased her forehead, she turned his mood better. I don't know why she ever thought she had to wear makeup. Her 90s prom dress made him want to laugh, but he couldn't get away from the headache bouncing in his head like a pinball machine. You don't look fine, she rebuked. In fact, you look like death. He closed his eyes. His lids felt like iron curtains. I promise I am fine. His stomach roiled with a snare drum in his skull. You're lying. She folded her arms across her chest. Of course I'm lying, but I'm getting better. He lied again. You okay, buddy? Mauser called from the front driving compartment. His eyes met Steele's in the rearview mirror, his hands rotating the lunchbox's large steering wheel. Steele would never know why, but Mauser loved to drive the giant transportation vehicle. He took the vehicle up and over the West Virginia hills with the skill of a veteran driver. Jeez, you too, I'm fine, and you yelling back and forth isn't helping. Got it, Mauser yelled back. Steele massaged his temple in defeat. Kevin sat near Gwen and across from him. The tall man sat with his head low. Kevin's hands were shoved in the front pocket of his WVU sweatshirt. The only person who looks more burnt out than me is Kevin. Steele switched sides in the mover, using the teardrop handrails to steady himself across the aisle. He plopped down next to Kevin. Kevin fidgeted uncomfortably at the close proximity. What? Kevin said. Better to be out with it. I didn't know they were your family. Kevin looked up at him like a beaten dog. His beard was faint, mostly only sprouting from the tip of his chin. Steele could see it in his eyes now. Puck and him shared the same eyes. They were dark brown, almost black, as if they were made from a slightly earthier piece of coal. The same mean eyes that had howled for Steele's death while they fought. Almost the same eyes that pled for mercy as infected had torn him apart. Kevin blinked and averted them forward. College was my way out. It was my escape from that kind of life. And when college was over, four years later... I found myself going back to the same town I grew up in. Guess you never get too far away from the tree. <laughs> Kevin sniffled a bit. He wiped his nose with a sleeve. Sometimes I feel like I've gotten too far away from my home, Steele said. Trees zip by glassless windows, unfamiliar land, foreign hills. Not unlike the trees where he grew up, but not the same either. Not as foreign as the different countries he was stationed in abroad, but not home. The land reminded him of his family and his land that was so far away. Things worth fighting for. And I feel like I never escaped mine, Kevin said. Yet here we sit on the same road, Steele said. He sucked an air through his nose. I don't regret doing what I did. I don't. Some people need to be put down. 
The other nodded. I don't expect an apology. You did right on account of your people. But what did I do to mine? Steele didn't know what to say. How could I claim to understand the decision Kevin had to make in order to help me? I know I was doing the right thing. But does he? He sat in silence next to his friend, unsure how to console him. Huck used to beat me growing up. My dad drank and beat the tar out of him. Huck was bigger and older, and he would turn around and beat the tar out of me. Even when it got bad, I still think he got the worst of it. I would hide from them and read everything I could get my hands on, mostly my grandpa's old books on the Civil War. Kevin's eyes went distant as if he relived the memory. I would imagine myself standing on Little Round Top at Gettysburg with Colonel Chamberlain in the 20th Maine, and every single Confederate charging up that smoky, tree-laden hill had Puck's face on it, and I could never pull the trigger. Maybe that's just who I am. I hated Puck, but could never stand up to him. Kevin shook his head as he remembered. He was a miserable son of a bitch. Thank you for putting him out of his misery. And mine. Steele placed a hand on Kevin's knee. I wish I hadn't had to. Believe me, I'm not. We don't get to pick our families, but mine was rotten. There is still love even in the worst of them. Ashley is still my family as much as I wish she wasn't. Show her some mercy. Steele gulped down his anger for the woman. She sat there pretending not to listen in, eyes averted out the windows, greasy blonde hair clumping together in stringy strands. Her arms were folded beneath her chest. You're related to her, too? Yeah. Pretty messed up, huh? Kevin turned his eyes aside in shame. I didn't pick them. She ambushed us, Steele said. He looked to Kevin for acknowledgement that Ashley was wrong. A bad person. A person who deserved worse than she got. And you ambushed them. And I helped you. Kevin's lips trembled. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Get over yourself and move ahead. Sometimes living with oneself is worse than death. Steele gulped his anger inside. I'm not like them. She will be safe with us. The words burned his tongue. I know she will. That's why I'm with you and not them. You may be related to Puck, but you aren't that man. You are a man who helped people in desperate need. Steele squeezed his leg and stood. Kevin nodded, lips tight. I go where you lead, he said. I'm leading us to call it a day. My head is killing me and I'm hungry. Kevin gave him a half smile. Steele stood up, holding a handrail for support. Let's get this thing off the road to a clear area so we can hunker down for the night. We need to figure out a way to get those shackles off Eddie. That's right. Get these things off me. Eddie called back with a nod. The older African-American man held up his chains at Steele. Ideas? Something heavy or sharp? Steele said. Everyone dug around the mover, rooting through supplies and opening bench seats. After minutes, Steele sat back down by Eddie. We will find something. Eddie's eyes teared up. You are a kind man, but get me out of these. Eddie's voice rose in conviction. You could shoot the chains, Gwen said pensively. Steele took a look at his black AR-15, the lightweight carbine, the modern-day musket. I'd rather not waste the bullets or risk putting another hole in the lunchbox. It's not as if it doesn't have enough of those already, Mauser yelled from the front. Steele was at a loss. We'll find a rock or something when we stop, he said to Eddie. Eddie shook his head. No. He was tired of being pushed around and abused. Risk the shot. I want these off. Now. Eddie held the chains up at Steele. Don't put a fucking hole through the gas tank, you dumbass. Your tomahawk's underneath the driver's seat. Ashley piped up. She managed to look disinterested and annoyed at the same time. 
The blonde hadn't said anything to them since their departure from the moonshiner camp. She gestured to it with a flip of her wrist. Casey hid some shit under there. Steele walked to the front, using the handrails like playground monkey bars. He crouched down and patted his hand underneath the seat until he wrapped his fingers around the handle. He held up his old tactical tomahawk. The foot-long handle was topped off with a three-inch wedge-shaped blade with a spike on the other side. He spun it around in a circle, flipping it over his hand and catching it by the handle. Let's see what the hawk can do. Eddie, pull those chains tight. Eddie knelt down on the floor. He spread his wrists wide, pulling the chain taut. Don't miss, he said, eyeing Steele warily. Steele crouched down. I won't, buddy. I better turn your head to the side. Eddie's eyes went wide. Oh, hell no. Mauser, stop this thing. You got it. The mover rolled to a stop, causing Steele to take a step back. He regained his balance and lined up his tomahawk with Eddie's chains. He took a few practice swings to get down his spacing and timing, then cocked his arm back behind his head. His knuckles turned white as he gripped his tomahawk hard. He gritted his teeth and slammed the tomahawk home. Sparks flew from the chain, and the hawk bounced upward. Eddie eyed his chains fearfully. They were still intact. You didn't get it. Steele licked his lips. Couple more swings. He swung the light hand axe forcefully over and over against the chains. A link in the middle began to split. You're getting it! Eddie yelled, but Steele ignored him, totally immersed in his task. He hammered it again, letting the fire rise up inside of him. Rage bubbled up from his interior, from the lower depths of his soul. A rage that he didn't know existed, a dark part of his soul. The rage drove him, rage against the infected, rage against Puck, rage against his new life. He beat the chains, fury enveloping him. Sweat poured from his face. Eddie would be free. When he stopped, he found himself yelling. Incoherent words screamed from his mouth. His voice dropped off, the sound emitting from his gut disappearing. The rage slunk away back inside him, a retreating snake into its hole. He held the tomahawk up at eye level. The head was chipped and dented from its war against the chains. He would have to sharpen the blade again. The eyes of his people stared at him. His chest heaved. Um, he started. The words hung in the air. Eddie slowly stood upright, his arms hanging at his sides. His arms were free of constraint, his unjust bondage rectified. Eddie nodded to steel. Thank you. Don't thank me for doing the right thing. We should have gotten you out of those sooner. He sat back down on the mover bench and tossed his tomahawk on the seat cushion. He ran a hand through his hair, gingerly skirting the wound. Everyone still watched him, frozen motionless in the large cabin of the people mover. What? he asked. Mauser turned back around in his driver's chair. The others took their seats as the mover revved up again. Somebody find me a place to crash for the night. Steele put his head in his hands again embracing the pain. Kinnick, Northern Virginia At 140 miles per hour, the helicopters made quick work of the scourged landscape, and 20 minutes later, Kinnick's team circled the Mount Eden Federal Emergency Operations Facility. Kinnick gazed down at the harsh scene below. Tents were trampled and ripped into pieces of material. Trucks were tipped over on their sides, Bodies lay in the roads. No signs of life remained, although there were plenty of signs that the infected had made their way through. The helicopters continued to circle, indecisive predators hunting for prey. They searched for anything that indicated the doctor was there. Our quick intel brief stated there's a base underground, Master Sergeant Hunter called over the thump-thump of the rotors. That's correct. We haven't heard from them in days, Kinnick yelled back. Master Sergeant Hunter nodded, eyeing the destruction below. What a bag of dicks. Odds were no one was alive, 
especially not the doctor. Odds were hundreds, if not thousands, of infected resided in the area. The helicopters would probably draw the bastards in. The whirling of the rotors may as well have been a dinner bell for the living dead. They didn't have the time nor the fuel to waste flying around aimlessly. Kinnick tapped the pilot on the shoulder. Put down over there in that field, next to that building. A long grass field lay trampled by thousands of feet. Fewer dismembered corpses lay there, motionless. Master Sergeant Hunter, the entrance to the underground facility is there. I want Bowie with me and Crockett to cover the helos while they refuel. Better to keep these birds well fed. Master Sergeant Hunter was a career operator. He wasted no time barking out orders to his men. Lewis, Esparza, Bowman, Fannin, Pollard, and Termel, you are with me and the Colonel, Master Sergeant Hunter said. I want Gibson and Hawkins along with the rest of Crockett's crew pulling perimeter security. You see any Zulus, try and take them quietly. They all listened. They'd all been through shit before the breaking of the East Coast. The helicopters descended and shook as they touched down. All of his fighters bounded out to their designated sectors like they had done it one hundred times, if not a step slower than they used to. Kick off the rust. Kinnick hopped out and followed close behind Sergeant Lewis's broad back. Lewis had taken point in their small squad, carrying his M249 saw, which he could use to put down some serious suppressive firepower. Kinnick only had brief visuals around the man, but didn't know if he wanted even to see that. Raggedly torn up bodies lay strewn in half-eaten poses. The grass turned black with guts spilt on the ground. Dead, lifeless eyes stared at them accusingly. Why didn't you save us? Kinnick tried to put it out of his mind, but it stung. The American government failed us, they said, glaring at them with lifeless features. His family must lie somewhere in a similar fate, murdered by their neighbors, torn apart with hands that once shook theirs in friendship. I must compartmentalize what is happening everywhere and move forward to the task at hand. Find the doctor. Nothing else means much. America would still have fallen no matter what actions I took. They moved at a quick jog each man scanning their sector for threats. Their guns pointed at different angles, ensuring good coverage of potential threats. They made fast approach on a seemingly nondescript three-story office building. Red bricks stacked with white mortar covered the exterior with evenly spaced windows. A hairy bear paw halted the squad, bringing them silently to a stop. Kinnick crouched his way next to Sergeant Lewis. We got a woman over there, front of the building. Doors look blown apart. Windows are broken on the top floor, Sergeant Lewis said. The charred remains of a white door were strewn over the grass and sidewalk. A haggard-looking woman leaned against the wall, medical gown untied and flapping softly in the breeze. The gown drifted open slightly, revealing clotted wounds that covered her legs. A regular person would have pushed the gown down, but she let the gown ripple and crinkle, exposing her back. From their position, they had some concealment, but Kinnick wanted to go in quiet. There were only eight. They couldn't risk drawing the attention of hundreds, if not thousands, of the infected. Do it quiet, Kinnick directed. He gave a nod at Termel, leaving Lewis to overwatch his comrade. The large, curly, black-haired beret grinned as he drew his bent Gurkha Kukri. He gave it a spin in his fingers as he anticipated his work. The heavy blade finished its rotation in an overhand grip. The soldier moved with stealth at a low crouch. He disappeared and in a moment rose up behind the woman like a specter. Grabbing her by the hair, he thrust his kukri through her neck and cut outward, cleanly disabling the woman. The kukri blurred as he held her head in his hands, and then her body dropped to the ground. Kinnick had the feeling that he had had too much practice with the famous Gurkha blade. The men silently stacked up behind Lewis. They hugged the side of the building. The men squeezed one another's shoulders up the stack. One man passed over the threshold, crossing the doorway. The next man button-hooked. Kinnick crossed the doorway inside. Welcome to hell, was all that crossed his mind before the dead swarmed for his squad. Steel, Hills of West Virginia I see the Philippi scenic overpass here, Ahmed said. He held a folding paper map in his hands. 
Steele gave him a look of loathing. He wanted to ignore Ahmed as if he didn't exist. The airport mobile lounge continued to roll onward, disregarding its occupants' internal strife. The lunchbox didn't care if the PB&J got squashed by the apple as long as it carried its contents to their destination. Anybody else? Steele said. He eyed his other companions. Ahmed's face held a heavy purple hue from the beating the moonshiners had put on him. It gave Steele only a fraction of the joy it should have, knowing that the beatings came from the moonshiners. It's only about fifteen miles, Ahmed said. Will this man never go away? Let me see, Steele said. He snatched the map from Ahmed's hands. Contour lines circled green mountains with gray roadways running through them. We are about here, Ahmed said. He placed his finger on the map. Steele's eyes narrowed. Ahmed's finger hovered over a scenic overpass labeled by a picnic table. I know where we are, Steele said. Kind of. He perused the map. The closest area nearby that may have any scavenge value was the Philippi scenic overpass. There would be restrooms, perhaps a park visitor center, a likely stopping point, and it might hold needed supplies. With potential supplies came other risks. Fights were possible with any number of thieves, ambushers, bandits, and the infected. We don't have enough bullets for any kind of fight. It was clear that the Philippi overpass was the best place for them to stop. But since Ahmed had suggested it, Steele had to veto the idea. No, we'll go here. He jabbed a finger onto the map. Verlander Lake State Park. It's only thirty miles. Steele eyed Ahmed a bit, looking for a challenge. He stretched his neck and made himself bigger in case Ahmed got any ideas. His neck had never felt right since he had a close encounter with a bullet. It will be dark by the time we get there, Ahmed said. Not if Mauser speeds this thing up, Steele said. He shook Mauser's shoulder. Come on, man, get this thing going. I'm taking it as fast as we can safely, and I'm with Ahmed. We should camp while we still got light. Now you want to take it slow? Steele jabbed. He threw his arms up at the unfairness. Steele recalled the numerous times Mauser had driven the lounge through packs of the infected at high speeds. It's probably better if we stop at the overpass, Gwen said. Her eyes pleaded with him a bit, as if she didn't want to do this. Steele saved a special glare for her. Jesus, you too? He knew Ahmed was right, but he hated to see him win. Kevin looked up excitedly. I've been there before. I think there are some cabins by the lake. If I'm not mistaken, a civil war battle took place. More of a skirmish, really, but the first organized land battle of the war. The northern press loved it, referring to it as the Philippi races because of how fast the Confederates retreated. Steele gave him a side glance. I don't need a fucking history lesson everywhere we go. He rubbed his temples his headache draping over him like a blanket of nails. God damn, Ahmed. Anyone have anything else they want to share? The people in the lounge stared at him. Scared eyes looked to him to make every decision, no matter how great or how small. Lucia, Eddie, and Ashley. Fine. Take us there. Ahmed and Gwen smiled at him. He leaned back, closing his eyes and praying the pounding in his skull would lessen even just a bit. Wake me up when we get there, he mumbled. An hour later, Steele sat inside a small cabin on the edge of a pristine lake. Cool, dark mountain water was untouched by the plague that had swept the land atop a pale horse. Everyone slept except for Mauser and him. Before I forget, I grabbed this off Fat Chuck's stinking corpse while we ran to the mobile lounge. Mauser tossed Steele his tactical badge. Steele caught the badge and held it in his hand, feeling the nice weight of the metallic shield. Didn't think I would see this again. He gave Mauser a sidelong smile, running his finger over the eagle imprint. Mauser shrugged. I don't want you getting written up for something stupid like lost equipment. I definitely wouldn't want that in my record, Steele joked. The division had a strict policy when it came to equipment. Not that he thought they would come knocking any time soon. He slipped the chain over his neck, 
tucking the badge beneath his shirt. It was a fake gold-plated reminder of his responsibilities to the public, regardless of the current state of world affairs. What happened to Joseph? Steele asked. I don't know. When the shooting started, he disappeared. The hillbillies didn't have him. What if he was telling the truth, you know, about that dude in Grand Haven, Patient Zero? Well, yeah, he was really smart. Why would he lie? Steele shook his head. I'm not sure. I guess it doesn't matter now. You don't think he escaped? You did, Mauser said. His eyes betrayed how he really felt. I'm a slightly different case, but do you really think a CDC doctor with no practical skills aside from medicine survived a shootout, the undead, and the mountain terrain by himself? Well, yeah, we didn't find a body. Mauser scratched at his head. I wonder how many bodies have been picked clean since this began. If he wasn't with you, he's dead. That guy couldn't even wipe his own ass without help. Now this is just a survival situation for us. No mission to bring Joseph to Michigan. Could have hit or something, Mauser offered. I doubt it. We could still head to Michigan, see if my family is there. Steele rubbed his hands together. We can take this old lunchbox anywhere, Mauser said with a smile. They really shot her up good. Mauser frowned. She's missing a few bits and pieces, but she'll get us where we need to go. She's got character, my friend. She earned those battle scars. I think we've earned those scars, Steele said. Even that guy over there, Mauser said. He nodded across the room. Steele looked over to where Mauser gestured to a sleeping form. Ahmed? Yeah, those hillbillies worked him over pretty good every day and he didn't quit. You know we have bad blood between us. Steele clenched his jaw. Bad blood was the short of it. I know you do. What I am saying is that him and I don't have bad blood between us. He's not as bad as he seems. You didn't have a 300-pound woman in a muumuu trying to rip your face off while he stood by and watched, Steele said. If he didn't pull those dead off me, I would have died. Without him, Gwen would have died at the Metro. He's a part of our group, Mauser shifted. Steele sat there and contemplated. Then he said, This whole thing is about trust. Trust is built with every small moment you are vulnerable and the other person doesn't take the advantage. Trust is built brick by brick and can be wrecking balled in an instant. I will try, but he's got a long road ahead of him. It will never be the same as I trust you. Mauser half smiled, forcing his black eye and puffy cheek to crease. Ow. He rose a battered hand to his cheek. Well, I'd hope not. We've been through some heavy shit together. It doesn't look like that's going to change. Let's try and keep that ugly melon of yours in one piece, all right? Steele smiled, carefully running a hand over the top of his skull. Cut it a little too close, didn't we? Next time I'll ask for a trim. Mauser laughed outright, and Gwen rolled over. Steele put an index finger to his lips. Don't wake the beast. You remember what it was like when we all lived together, Steele whispered. You'll probably get blamed for it either way, Mauser said, surprisingly quiet. He knew better than to mess with Gwen while she slept. Mauser's head sank down to his chest as he held in his laughter. We're not in too bad a shape, are we? Mauser said. No, we could be lying face down in a ditch somewhere. And the gang is back together, Mauser said. Everyone except Jarl, Wheeler, and Andrea. My entire team is dead. When I woke up... The thought of being out there alone was pretty scary. No, nope, you're stuck with us. Not that it matters now, but I was thinking of moving out in the fall. Let you and Gwen live alone. You were going to move out on us? Steele joked. None of that mattered now, but it was nice to pretend those things were still important in life. It didn't matter that Steele had contemplated taking his and Gwen's relationship to the next level. 
living by themselves, almost as if they were married. Plenty of younger folk were doing it nowadays. Trial marriages before the real deal. The prospect of marriage had loomed across the horizon in a world where a killer mutating virus hadn't enveloped the globe. Now, you could never be sure if he would make it another day. Yep, sure was. I was going to move in with Harding. Wow. Gwen and I had talked about living alone. She's the one, isn't she? Mauser asked. It was something Steele had known since the day he had met her. Yeah, she is, Steele said. They sat in silence for a moment, each embracing his own thoughts. You know, if something happens to me, you'll make sure she's all right. It was every man's greatest fear from the beginning of time, dying and leaving his loved ones undefended and unprotected from the savage world. By passing on, he deserted them and exposed them to the whims of the wicked. Mauser's eyes darkened at his prophetic words, his brow furrowed in anger. You can't say shit like that. It's bad luck. I'm not superstitious, Steele said. Just saying. When you say evil shit like that, you are bringing it down upon yourself. You know what happened to Jimmy Wilson. Jimmy got stabbed to death in the back streets of Istanbul. Wrong place, wrong time. You know, Jimmy had been telling everyone for weeks about how he knew this was his last deployment. He had a bad feeling about the mission, and sure enough, he ended up dead. Steele had seen it in movies before. Don't give your final letter to your loved ones because of some sort of premonition that this was to be your last battle. Mauser, I've been shot in the head. Hundreds of thousands of undead cannibals are trying to eat us alive. If I go down, you gotta assure me she will be taken care of, Steele said. He ground his hands together in front of him. They locked eyes, Steele's hard blue with Mauser's thunderstorm gray. I'll make sure she stays safe, I swear it to you. But just so you know, I think it was more of her watching out for me back at the Moonshiner camp. Steele nodded. The matter was settled. If he needed to die, she would be taken care of. We gotta find you a chick real quick. The dating pool is rapidly declining. Mauser rose his eyebrows. Who knows? At some point I might be their only option. Steele's eyes drifted to Ashley for only a moment. As much as he despised her, she wasn't terrible to look at. She lay on a bench back to them, her waist rounding down into her hips and backside. No way, man, that bitch, Mauser said. I promised Kevin she would be safe. What better way? I am not babysitting both her and Gwen. It would probably kill me just trying to kill each other. Good point. Maybe it's not such a good idea, Steele said and shrugged his shoulders. I'm surprised you didn't kill her. Cold blood like that? I hope that's not what this is coming to. In the moment, I might have, but we owe Kevin a debt. I never would have found you without him. They tried to kill us. We killed a bunch of them. What's one more? Mauser held vengeance in his eyes like a small flame. The roles are reversed. I don't like having her here any more than you do, but we can't do that to Kevin. Think about the positives. She's probably single now. Mauser sighed. <sighs> I'm not dating her. You sure you don't want to give it a shot? Come on, man. Mauser looked down, smiling. You can't rule it out. What if she's all that's left? Steele chided. And I'll fucking date you, you ugly SOB. Joseph, Quarantine Base Rattlesnake, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. As the sun cracked the Earth's horizon, the artillery slept, having ceased its pummeling of Pittsburgh. The camp was left in relative peace. The lack of explosions in the distance made Joseph almost feel calm. He sat near the bronze statues of George Washington and the Seneca chief Gaiasuta that had been enveloped inside the protective military base. The statues of the two colonial warriors were larger than life, standing over eight feet tall. The two allies were positioned kneeling down and facing each other in a tense standoff, a meeting of two worlds old and new. 
The historical marker read that the two men fought the French during the major power war over North American colonial possessions. Joseph's feet dangled off the side of the platform overlooking the city. He looked out at the battered Pittsburgh downtown, bleeding to death across the river. Smoldering ruins of burnt-out office buildings, expired colossuses, no life left inside them. Large craters dug down deep into the streets, points where explosive ordnance had annihilated the infected with 23.8 pounds of TNT. He tried to ignore the white objects that floated in the river, bobbing up and down like marshmallows in the hot chocolate-colored water of the Monongahela. Cars lay vacant on Pittsburgh's numerous bridges, sleeping vessels abandoned by their owners. Joseph wondered if the shelling of the city had been the reason for the assault on the convoy. The black and gold-clad Pittsburghers loved their city. He assumed that some would die to save it, even from fellow Americans. If the people loved the city as much as they loved their sports teams, they would fight for it, especially from fellow Americans or Baltimore fans. Two patients died in the night due to wounds sustained in the ambush. He didn't have the capabilities to perform the necessary surgical interventions, and his medical tent looked like a military hospital from a different era. Blood-soaked floors, missing limbs, and the dead. The infantry unit within quarantine base Rattlesnake had taken the attack hard. Joseph remembered the look on Sergeant Yates's ruddy face when the unit returned. It was the haunted look of a deeply troubled man. The soldiers who had died under his care did not rise again to torment their brothers in arms. They stayed lifeless, white hospital sheet-covered bodily husks. He strapped the men to the table just in case. He speculated that not everyone carried the virus in a dormant state. Otherwise, when they died, they would have woken hungry. Joseph rolled a cigarette in his hands, placed one end in his mouth. As he inhaled, he shook his head. He never thought he would be a smoker, but times had changed. He had changed, or maybe he didn't expect to be around much longer in this world. The crack of a rifle penetrated the peace of the morning. I should never expect more than a few moments of peace. We will all die by fifty at this rate just from stress. A clamor of voices near the base entrance drew his attention away from the picturesque scenery of the collapsing Pittsburgh skyline. The voices were accompanied by the familiar rumble of a diesel engine. Escorted on either end by a Humvee, an airport mobile lounge rolled slowly into camp, its giant tires turning through the gate. God damn, Joseph cursed. He threw his cigarette down and started to run. Lunchbox. As Joseph drew close, a soldier put a hand on Joseph's shoulder. No further, Doc. We don't know if these people are safe, a bareheaded soldier said to him. Joseph brushed his hand off. Nonsense. They're my friends. Mauser, Gwen, over here. He pushed past the bewildered soldier and approached the mover, slapping the sides in excitement. Thud, thud. He made his way around the lounge to the back door of the mover. The mover door folded open in accordion fashion. A lanky man in a WVU sweatshirt looked down at him. Joseph stared up in confusion. Who are you? Where's Gwen and Mauser? The man stared back and rubbed a patchwork five o'clock shadow. I'm Kevin, he said. A disheveled blonde peered around Kevin. Joseph, oh my God, you're alive. His heart shook. They are alive. Gwen hopped down into his arms, gripping him tight. Joseph could hardly believe it. He brushed her hair out of her face. You survived. This was the closest he'd been to a woman since he left for Africa almost nine months ago. Mauser, is he? He said. Gwen sniffed and nodded. He's alive, she said. Kevin climbed down, joining them. This is Kevin, Mark's friend, she said. Joseph didn't understand. But Mark is dead, he said, letting the words come out piece by piece. No, she said, pushing back from him. He's alive. A smile lit her face as if she glowed. A man stood in the doorway of the mover. Light shined around him as if God were sending him back to earth. Joseph didn't recognize the ghost peering down at him, but he knew it was Steele. Steele's eyes had darkened and his beard covered a much thinner man's face, making him appear almost homeless. A nasty scar was in the initial stages of healing. It had begun to pucker along the edges, running from his forehead to the back of his scalp like a hair part given by a butcher's apprentice. 
Joseph clasped hands with him. Steel, you're alive. I, I thought the worst, he said. Steel grimaced. Me too, Doc. Me too, he said. Sergeant Yates marched up to them, rifle to his shoulder, and aimed at the newcomers. These men must undergo interrogation before they are admitted into the base. Step away from them, Sergeant Yates commanded. Joseph threw up a hand. I can vouch for these men, he said, and woman. Sergeant Yates scowled. His rifle stayed aimed on steel. We have strict orders to investigate any insurgent activity in the area. They may have a lead to the ambushers. Joseph stepped up to Yates. This man is a United States counterterrorism agent. I can assure you he is no insurgent. Sergeant Yates's eyes narrowed at steel. This washed-up mangy dog? Ha! Show me some proof, he said with a sneer. Steele took off his badge and tossed it over to the big sergeant, who snagged it out of the air. He looked back and forth from the badge to Steele. Could have gotten this off anyone. I'm going to need something more. Sergeant, take my word on the lives of your men in that tent over there, Joseph entreated. The sergeant's face softened. I know you did your best to save them. Please, Sergeant, these are my friends. Sergeant Yates snorted. <clears throat> I am not unreasonable. They can come in, but they can't have their weapons while they are in the base. Steele nodded. The tension de-escalated. Yates handed Steele's badge back to him. Steele took it, replacing the badge with his weapons. If you think you can keep the deadheads from getting in here, be my guest, Kimosave, Mauser said. He handed over his weapons one by one. We do a fine enough job, Yates said. He ejected Mauser's magazine and racked the slide back to make the weapon safe. Mauser eyed the man, judging his competency, or was it his general care for the weapon? Joseph pulled Steele away from the volatile sergeant. Follow me. We have a lot to catch up on, he said. Then he saw her, the woman from the ambush, standing in the back, steps away from everyone. Her thin, dirty blonde hair hung tangled around her shoulders, her clothes muddied and stained. He pointed up at her. Why is she here? He stammered. He would never forget the joyous look in her eyes as she harmed others. She looked down, guilt shadowing her features. This was her fault, he spat. She'd brought all this pain and suffering down on them, and it spoiled his reunion with his friends. Steele put a hand on his shoulder. Ashley is with us now, he said. She lured us into an ambush, Joseph sputtered. Let's give her another chance. Do you think you could take a look at my head? Steele leaned in, pointing at his grisly scalp. Joseph scowled at Ashley. Of course, of course, bring Mauser too. They walked from the medical tent. Joseph pointed at some tents nearby. There are some empty tents you can stay in, he said to the rest of them. Steele nodded and spoke with Gwen privately, and then he and Mauser followed Joseph to the medical tent. Joseph hurried through the tent, leading them to the back. Steele, why don't you take a seat? Steele sat down on a cot, weariness slumping his shoulders a bit, as if he wore a heavy backpack all the time. Joseph pulled on some latex gloves over his hands. I see Mauser has a limp. There's only one of me. You'll have to go second. He probed a finger into Steele's wound, exploring the depths of the wound to exclude subjacent skull fracture. Firm skull met his finger. Ow, oh, Doc. You are lucky you have such a thick skull. This should have killed you. If not the shot, then the infection for sure. Steele stifled his pain with a laugh. Gwen will be happy to hear that. I see some signs of infection, but it is subsiding. Joseph squeezed his skull with his thumbs and inched back along the wound that permanently lined Steele's skull. Does it hurt here? Uh, yeah. You're poking my head where I got shot. Aside from general swelling, there was no squishiness along his cranial bones. Joseph released Steele's head. One more test here. Are you having any trouble hearing? What? Steele asked. Huh, Doc? Mauser replied. 
Never mind, you two. Turn to the side, Joseph said. Heathens. He conducted a routine otoscopy to ensure Steele didn't have a tympanic membrane rupture of his middle ear. He looked inside with his otoscope, a standard doctor instrument with a small flashlight and a magnifying lens to see in the ear canal. Everything appeared normal. I don't feel any fractures. Your ears look fine, so you aren't in terrible shape. The infection is subsiding, but we are going to need to stitch you up and keep this clean. He looks better off than this lot, Mauser said. He threw a thumb over his shoulder at the tent of bandaged men. What happened? Accident? Ambushed by civilians, Joseph said. He only looked up briefly as Mauser shook his head. What the hell is happening out there? Joseph said. It's getting worse. Those moonshiners held everyone hostage, Steele said. He gritted his teeth as Joseph cleaned the head wound, wiping it with antiseptic. Joseph pulled out a needle and a bottle. He prepped a local anesthetic, flicking the tube of liquid with his finger and inserting the needle directly into the wound. Steele tensed beneath him. You might feel some numbness above your eyes. He injected steel in multiple spots to ensure he wouldn't feel much of the operation. You may get a two-faced thing going on. Not to mention the pain of you sticking me with that needle, Steele said with a grimace. Just wake me up when you're done. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes. Oh, dang, Doc. Should have told me to look away, Mauser said. He shielded his eyes from the surgery. Not helping, Steele said, his eyes still closed. Joseph carefully cut hair matted together with clotted blood and dead skin away from the wound to let it heal as cleanly as it could at that point. This will be a lot better than it could be. Joseph snipped a flap of skin away from the wound. Blood emerged in its place, and he wiped it away with gauze. Without cosmetic surgery, you are going to bear a nasty scar for the rest of your life. Even with impressive stitching on my part, which I promise you I am attempting, it still isn't going to be pretty, he said. Gripping the needle with his forceps, he pierced the lacerated skin at a ninety-degree angle, attempting not to scratch the bone of Steele's skull. Why is that? Steele said. Joseph looped the stitch across his skull, pulling it tight as if he were making a quilt patchwork atop of his head. He stuck his tongue out as he concentrated. Well, you are the seventh person I've done this on since residency, so you could say I am a bit out of practice. Joseph sutured up and down the ugly bullet wound parting Steele's flesh, finishing each rung with a surgeon's knot. Henderson, can you grab me some more antiseptics from the supply cache? he said, wiping blood from Steele's head with a strip of gauze. Steele had the audacity to smile like he was enjoying it. How's it looking? he said. Well, you couldn't get uglier, Mauser said. He sat back on a cot, propping his leg up. Steele rose a single functioning eyebrow. You look better than you did. Joseph's eyes darted to the entrance of the tent. To his relief, Henderson had left the tent as he had asked. He hoped Henderson wouldn't catch on that he was sending him on a menial task so he could talk to Steele and Mauser alone. He whispered, The colonel here won't help me leave. He's holding me against my will. The longer I am stuck here, the less likely I will be to find patient zero. Steele closed his eyes and exhaled loudly. Joseph, we finally get to a safe place and you want us to leave and go out into a countryside filled with people that want to kill us, living and dead? He opened his eyes, hard sapphires that eroded Joseph's will. I don't know if you've been outside lately, but it's utter chaos. The world is coming to an end, Mauser said, black raccoon eye glaring at Joseph. I can't think of a better place for us to be than a military base surrounded by hundreds of professional American soldiers, Steele added. Joseph crouched down in front of Steele and adjusted his glasses. This base is like a stone in a biblical flood. How long before the supplies stop? How long before the infected break through? The other quarantine bases have been overrun, he said. Steele's eyes fogged over. I don't think you understand. If only half of the intelligence we have on this virus is correct, 85% of the eastern seaboard is dead, dying, infected, and coming this way, Joseph said. 
Mauser's mouth hung slightly open. When we ran the analytics on the casualty data in Mount Eden, the information was staggering. If we don't find patient zero, projected casualty and infection rates in less than three months are 100%, Joseph said. Steele closed his eyes, taking in the information. He understood. Mauser scowled. What do you mean, 100%? I mean, Joseph paused, extinction of the human race. Mauser brought a hand to his forehead. That's some heavy stuff, man. This is heavy, Mauser, the heaviest thing mankind has ever faced. And that fate rests upon you getting me to patient zero. Even then, I don't know. Wrapping gauze around Steele's head, he covered his wound. You have to keep this clean. You are lucky the infection wasn't worse, he said. Steele nodded, eye drooping a bit from the anesthetic. He looked like he belonged in a mental institute. He glanced at Mauser. We have to, Mauser. He looked back at Joseph, his face drooping like a bloodhound. I don't know how we are going to do it, but we will get you to Michigan. I will talk to the commander, Steele said. I thought I was crazy, but this is ridiculous. How do you expect us to make it all the way there by ourselves? Mauser looked away in anger. No offense, Joseph, but my vote is to stay. We will find a way, Steele said, firm in his conviction. Did your brains fall out when they shot you? This is crazy, Mauser said. He stood up, wobbling on his bad leg. Joseph gestured to his leg. We haven't had a look at your leg. Don't worry about it. Mauser waved Joseph off, hobbling out of the tent. Steele's eyes followed his friend until he was gone. The colonel won't be reasoned with, Joseph said. Steele continued to stare after Mauser. Joseph's heart sank into the pit of his gut. No one could really grasp the urgency when the only thing they could imagine was survival until tomorrow. Steele looked back at Joseph as if he had only just noticed him for the first time. His eyes were the only thing that made him appear upset. Let me talk to the colonel first. After all, he is providing free room and board. Someone has to be thinking further out than tomorrow. Get me to patient zero, today. Give me a few days. Let me feel everything out before we run. How are you two gentlemen? A voice came from inside the tent. They both turned toward Colonel Jackson, who stood nearby, hands behind his back. How long has he been there? Joseph, I see you are providing some medical assistance to this civilian. Joseph wiped a nervous palm down his pants. He gestured with an open hand to Steele. This is counterterrorism agent Mark Steele. He rescued me in Africa. A division, huh? Heard about you guys. Where's your unit now, agent? The colonel stepped closer to Steele. The only one left is Agent Ben Mauser outside. And what exactly were you and Agent Mauser planning on doing here? I was thinking about taking you up on some hot meals, Steele said with a small smile. Colonel Jackson's lips spread thinly over his high-browed, skin-tight face. I bet you were. The colonel leapt for Steele, grabbing him by the shirt and pulling him closer. Steele latched onto his wrists, stalemating the colonel. Jackson bore down on Steele from above. I know you two wouldn't be planning on running away from our base, would you? Colonel Jackson turned his eyes to Joseph. It would be a shame to have to execute the both of you for treason. Joseph found himself putting his hands up. No, no, we were only discussing Steele's journey here. Joseph eked out. His words sounded small and insignificant. Colonel Jackson sneered. That's not what I heard. I heard you whining to be rescued like a fucking baby. Jackson released Steele's shirt, letting him fall back onto the cot. He paced. Drawing his sidearm, he held it near his side. To think you would go behind my back after I specifically told you about your responsibility to these American fighting men. Woe to our society when its people no longer support its troops. Are you not patriots? Colonel Jackson raised his arms outward and back down to his sides, disgusted with them both. 
Sir, I think we can talk this out, Steele said. Can we? You can't even answer the fucking question. Are you a patriot? Spit flew from Colonel Jackson's mouth. Men leaned upright on their cots, watching the scene unfold. Steele's eyes lambasted the colonel. Rage seethed from Jackson, as if Steele's very existence angered him. I am a patriot. I too live to serve this country. But listen to what Joseph is telling you. See the big picture, Steele pleaded. Right, right. So a cop is lecturing me about big picture strategy. Foam formed at the corner of Colonel Jackson's lips. He ran his tongue along them. Who the fuck do you think you are? Steele was silent. I am an officer of the United States Army! Jackson yelled in Steele's face. Joseph looked down at his hand. He didn't know how it got there, but his fingers were wrapped around a thin scalpel. A short jab into the vital area of Colonel Jackson's neck should bring the man down quickly. It wasn't so much different than medicine. Instead, it would make the blows to kill rather than heal. A thick vein bulged in Jackson's neck, pulsing with the beating of his heart. Joseph's eyes were drawn to it. Puncture through the vein, pressed the scalpel into the tissue until it severed the man's spinal column. Joseph was so intent on the man's vein, he failed to notice the loud pitch of gunfire outside the tent. Colonel Jackson and Steele both looked outwards, sixth senses spiking. Joseph raised the scalpel back behind his ear. His hand wavered. Can I take this man's life? How do Mauser and Steele do it with such crude efficiency? Maybe they commit the act as an instinct and think about their actions later. He always overthought things too much. Jackson's red face sobered a bit. Whatever anger clouds had accumulated over the colonel had dissipated. Agent Steele, can you handle a firearm? Yes, sir. It's the only reason I am here, Steele said. Time to prove to me your loyalty. In two long strides, Colonel Jackson was out of Joseph's reach and outside the tent. Steele followed him and caught the long gun the colonel threw to him. Colonel Jackson went to a knee and with rapid, controlled bursts, slugged rounds at the threat. Steele stepped up behind the colonel. Wounded soldiers were awake and yelling at Joseph for help. Joseph dropped the scalpel. Help me! screamed a soldier. The soldier held his hands over his ears as he sobbed, tears rolling down his cheeks. It was as if he was being shot himself. Gunfire rattled the entrance of the tent.